Hello everyone, my name is Anya Kubo and I'm a professional software developer, YouTuber and your host for this 12 hour plus YouTube coding bootcamp. Now, what exactly makes this a YouTube coding bootcamp, you may ask? And why the 12 hours plus? Well, this course has been specifically built out making the most of YouTube's functionality in order to help you on your coding journey. What I mean by this is, this is a video bootcamp which will very much take the form of a part one, being you coding along with me in the video, part two being me presenting you with some exercises and challenges that you should attempt by yourself before we go through the answer together. And three, at the end of each major section, I will be directing you to a project I think would be suitable for you to try with the knowledge you have gained so far. This is gonna be an external video on my channel. So I will be directing you to the video I suggest via a YouTube card at the right moment in time. This is also why we are calling a 12 hour plus video as the learning content that you will be exposed to on your bootcamp journey will amount to the bootcamp itself and six suggested external projects to put in your developer portfolio. Now I am not gonna sugarcoat it. Coding can be hard. To get your mind thinking like a developer takes practice and a lot of repetition. To help us do this, I have incorporated that repetition into each section by providing you with questions and tasks to complete. This is why I cannot stress that the best way for you to learn is to get on your laptop and code along with me and not just take notes. I find that learning code is always better done by doing. Okay, so what exactly are we gonna learn on this coding bootcamp? Let's break it down. In the first section, we are gonna start off with HTML. So the language that describes the structure of a web page. We will then move on to CSS or cascading style sheets. This describes how HTML elements are to be displayed and finally move on to JavaScript. Most of our time will be focused on JavaScript as there really is a lot to learn with this language. This is where I will be focusing most of my energy by providing you with some fun lessons accompanied by some exercises and projects. I like to make the lessons very visual to break away from the generic teaching patterns we so often see in software development. Here are just a few examples of what you will see on this course. This, of course, is a free course and I will be providing you all the necessary documentation and links in the description below, as well as a breakdown of all our lessons and where you can find them in this video thanks to YouTube timestamps. You can see a full list of what we're going to learn if you click on the expand button below. So go ahead and do that. This course has been a while in the making and is available to everyone and anyone right here on my channel. I really do believe that anyone should have the opportunity to learn how to code, which is why this course is free and will always be free. So what are we waiting for? Let's do it. Don't forget to click and subscribe if you enjoyed this course and I look forward to having you on board. Okay, so let's jump right to it. First off, I wanna have a quick discussion about how we're actually gonna be writing our code. To write our code, we are going to be using a code editor. Now, there are many choices for you to choose from. I have chosen four that I have used in the past. In no particular order, we've got Play Code, Code Pen, JS Fiddle, and Code Sandbox. These are all online editors for us to get started straight away. For no other reason than for me having to choose one, I'm going to be using Code Sandbox for this course. This means that the editor that you will be seeing in this video will be code sandbox. However, you are absolutely free to use any of the other three or find your own because what is important is the file structure. It is also important to note that you can have a code editor directly on your laptop. This is something that we're going to be doing towards the end of the course. Two options that come to mind are Visual Studio and Atom. Okay, so here is a recap of all the code editors available to you. Please have a go at using all of them, see which one fits you best, or otherwise, let's get going with Code Sandbox. Okay, so let's get started. Now, 
in whatever code editor you have chosen, please go ahead and make an index HTML file in the root of your project. This would literally involve you creating a file and calling it index with the extension HTML. So your code editor knows to make this an HTML file. If this has worked, you will see an icon pop up to the left. It might be that your code editor has some other files as well. For example, code sandbox has this package JSON. This is because it's an online code editor, so it needs a couple of extra files to get us started. If you are struggling getting to this point, don't worry, go to the description below where I've provided you with a link in order to get started. That link will provide you with this setup that you see right here. Okay, so once you are comfortable and have your code editor of choice set up with an index HTML file in the root of your project, let's carry on. But before we get right into any code at all, what exactly is HTML? Hypertext markup language or HTML is regarded to be a comparatively simple language, which is great. HTML is the standard markup language for documents designed to be displayed in a browser. But what do I mean by markup language? In computer text processing, a markup language is a system of annotating a document in a way that is syntactically distinguishable from text. Meaning when the document is processed for display, the markup language is not shown and is only used to format the text. So for example, here we have used the bold tags to make the text in between the two tags appear to be bold when viewed in the browser. The idea and the terminology evolved from the markup of paper manuscripts, for example, the revision instructions by editors, which is traditionally written with a red pen or blue pencil on author's manuscripts. Such markup typically includes both content corrections, such as spelling, punctuation, or movement of content, and also typographic instructions, such as to make a heading larger or boldface. Web browsers receive HTML documents from a web server or from local storage and render the documents into multimedia web pages. HTML describes the structure of a web page semantically and originally includes cues for the appearance of the document. HTML elements are the building blocks of HTML pages with HTML constructs, images, and other objects such as interactive forms may be embedded into the render page. HTML provides a means to create structured documents by denoting structural semantics for text such as headings, paragraphs, lists, links, quotes, and other items. HTML elements are delined by tags written using angle brackets such as this. This is an opening tag. Most opening tags have to be accompanied by a closing tag in order for this to become an element. So for example, here we have the tags to make text bold. Browsers do not, however, display the HTML tags, but use them to interpret the content of the page. But enough chat, let's get to seeing some code. It is important to note that for this course, we're going to be using the latest version of HTML, and that is HTML5 standard. Here is the basic file structure for when working with an HTML file. As you can see here, I've gone ahead and created an index HTML file. So I've called the file index and by giving it the HTML extension, my code editor knows to treat this as an HTML file. The first tag I want to show you is right here. So that's the tag. It is a tag that tells the browser that this is an HTML5 document. As mentioned, there are previous older versions of HTML, so just be aware of that on your journey as a web developer. The browser needs to know what version of HTML the document is in order to render it correctly. Next, we tell the browser where our HTML is starting. We do this as even though we only have HTML in here for now, we can actually write CSS and JavaScript in this document too something that I will show you later down the line in this course. We are going to be using this HTML opening tag and closing tag as the root of our document. Everything else that we want to get picked up by the browser has to live inside it. Next, we have the head tag and closing tag. This is where we store information mainly. 
This is not to be confused with a header. The head will store information that is not visible in the browser. It's for storing and not displaying. Next, we have our title tag. This is for naming our project. We do this so we can store what we want to call the project that we are working on and store this in the head. So make sure it is in between the opening tag and the closing tag of the head. Once again, this is not a title that we will see in our browser. However, if you look at the tab of the browser your project is in, you should be able to see it. It will also show up in search results. So for example, in Google. Next, we have the body itself. Now, this is where the visible stuff will be. This is essentially where we are going to start coding out our web page. So let's get to it. First up, I'm going to talk to you about text first. We have loads of different headers in HTML. We can start with an H1 header, so that being our largest header, hello, and this can go all the way down to H6. So if I just go ahead and change these like so, go on H2, H3, H4, H5, and an H6. Okay, we'll save that and open up our browser. So you will see here now all the headers in chronological order. There is nothing past H6, so I can even put an H7 tag like so. Hi. And you will see here that it just doesn't get applied. This is just standard non-formatted text. So that covers the headers. We can also do paragraphs. So this is what a paragraph tag would look like. I am a paragraph. And there we go. Unlike headers, paragraphs do not have a hierarchy. It is simply just this. Next up, let's make some text show up in bold. So we have two ways of doing this. I can do this either with a B tag. So similar to here, I'm just going to do it on the paragraph, put in a tag and a closing tag of the parts that I want to make bold. So for example, here I made the whole paragraph bold, or I can simply make one part of it bold. So in this example, I've chosen the I, or I can use the strong tag. Now there is one major difference in this. What is interesting about the strong tag is that it also has semantic meaning to the browser, meaning that the browser will read this text as more important than the rest. Now we also have the EM tag. So I'm just going to use it here so you can see what it does first. And then closing tag. This tag has what you call it stress emphasis. In the browser, it will make your text appear italic. And once again, it will tell the browser that we should be stressing this word also. So it has semantic meaning. So to recap, both of these, the strong and the EM tag have semantic meaning, and they are also inline elements. What this means is that an inline element does not start on a new line and only takes up as much width as necessary. This is opposed to a block element, which we will cover in a bit. Before we move on, however, I just want to cover two more tags that are relevant for text. The first is the A tag. This A tag, so this one right here, which I'll do it up here, right in A tag. This A tag is short for anchor, and we can use it to link a location within the file or link the tag to a completely different web page. So here I have written an A tag. I'm just going to put the words GitHub, then my GitHub page. Now, what I want to happen is that when someone clicks this word right here, so GitHub, or to be precise, the word in the anchor tag, I want them to be taken to my GitHub page which is online. At the moment, nothing is happening. This is because we haven't finished our anchor tag yet. We need to give it an attribute. Many elements can take attributes. 
Attributes are stored in the opening tag, so right in here, and give extra information to the browser. In the case of the anchor tag, I want to give it the location of where I want the user to be taken if they click on the element. This is how the href, which is the attribute that I need to give my a tag, will look. I would simply write href equals and the full or absolute path to my GitHub page. This will look like so. I'm just going to move that out a little bit for us to see. Now, what I mean by absolute path is that it is the full path to what you are linking to. So for example, I would have to include the HTTP or HTTPS part of the URL. Just putting www will not do. At the moment, this might seem obvious. However, when you start linking to pages in your projects, you will start dealing with relative paths too. So here we have an example. In the first example, you will see me linking the A tag to a relative path. So a file called about HTML in the same directory as the file we are in. And then below, you will see me linking the A tag to an external website by providing the absolute path to the web page. Let me show you this with an example. I'm going to create a page. So I'm going to just go here and call this about HTML. So we have that page here. There's nothing in it yet. Now, in my index HTML, let's say that instead of linking to my GitHub page, I want to link to my about page. Let's do this here in the H3 tag. And I'm just going to change this from an H3 to an A tag and give it an href attribute in which I'm going to give the relative path to my about page. So simply put that. If I now click on here, it will take me to my about page. Page. If, however, I want to link to a file that is in a folder, so let's go ahead and create a folder. I'm going to call it details. I am going to put my about file into that folder. Now I'm going to have to go into that folder and then get the about page. So that is the syntax for doing that. I'm going into the folder called details and then I'm getting the about page. Great. Okay, it is now time to use everything we have learned so far in the HTML section in order to build our first project. This project is going to be an online portfolio. The portfolio itself will be built out in HTML and CSS. We will be implementing a little bit of JavaScript towards the end of our course as well. So make sure to save this project as you go. Okay, let's do it online portfolio project coming up next. I'm going to delete the text in here. So we are ready for the next section. So we have just learned about inline elements in HTML. If you are curious as to how many inline elements that are out there, here is a complete list for you. We have only gone over a few. However, there are a lot more to go. I don't feel we need to go into each and every single one of them. I have used the most popular ones and I'm going to teach you a few more as this course goes on. Now, let's have a look at the block level elements. Here is a full list of all the block level elements that are available to you. You might already be familiar with some as we've already discussed H1, H2, H3, 4, 5 and 6 tags as well as the paragraph tag. However, the one that I think is the most important for the next part of this course is going to be the div tag. The HTML content division element, or the div, is the generic container for flow content. It has no effect on the content or layout until styled in some way using CSS. As a pure container, the div element does not inherently represent anything. Instead, it's used to group content so it can be easily styled using the class or ID attributes. Let's go through this in an example. So in here, I'm going to create my first div element. I'm going to give it an opening tag and a closing tag. As mentioned in the slide, we would usually use a class attribute. So similar to something like this and then call it container. So we can style it up in the CSS or similarly, we can use an ID too. 
To get to grips with these two concepts of IDs and classes, we need to start talking about CSS. Let's do that in the next lesson. Okay, so we have made it to the end of the HTML section. As mentioned, there really are a lot of HTML elements that exist in HTML. And while we did not cover all of them, we did cover the most popular ones. As we move on in the course, I will be introducing new HTML elements to you, as well as showing you how to style them. We will be doing this with the help of CSS. So saying that the CSS section is up next. Once again, as a reminder, please do code along with me in your IDE of choice. I have provided some templates for you below in the description if you need help on the setup or if you get stuck through the next section. So please refer to the description below to grab that template now. It will have a timestamp next to it to make it clearer as to which one you should use at this point in time. Now, let's get to it. Cascading style sheets, or CSS, is a style sheet language used for describing the presentation of a document written in a markup language such as HTML. CSS is a cornerstone technology of the World Wide Web alongside HTML and JavaScript. CSS is designed to enable the separation of presentation and content, including layout, colors, and fonts. This separation of presentation characteristics enable multiple web pages to share formatting by specifying the relevant CSS in a separate .css file, which reduces complexity and repetition in the structural content, as well as enabling the CSS file to be cached to improve the page load speed between the pages that share the file and its formatting. Separation of formatting and content also makes it feasible to present the same markup page in different styles for different rendering methods, such as on screen, in print, by voice, and on braille. The name cascading comes from the specified priority scheme to determine which style rule applies if more than one rule matches a particular element. Don't worry if all of that went over your head. We're going to be going through this with examples now. One way of adding CSS to your div would be to add the style attribute to your opening tag. So to do this, I would simply add the style attribute like so, and equals, and then in quotation marks, I would set the property of width. So I'm not making this up. This is a CSS property. And then I would put the width in pixels. So PX for pixels, and then end it with a semi. Colon. When we get inside these quotation marks, we are no longer writing HTML, we are writing CSS. So we've got our width, let's also set a height. So I'm going to say height 200 pixels, semicolon, and a background color of green. Save. And there we have it. We have successfully styled our first div. Now, this is great. However, as you can imagine, you don't really want to be writing all of your CSS in the HTML file. It can be very unmanageable and get very messy. To solve this problem, we're going to store all our CSS in one file. Let's do that in the next section. So the first thing that I'm going to do is, as mentioned, separate my style from my HTML page and create a new file, which I'm going to choose to call styles CSS. So I am telling my code editor that this is now a cascading style sheet by this extension like so. The next thing we actually need to do is link up our style sheet to our index HTML file. I'm going to do this with the link tag. So this is a HTML tag that will allow us to link our style sheet to our HTML file. I'm going to do this above the header up here. So link and then pass through style sheet. And add the href. So I'm linking the styles CSS document that I've written here. 
make sure that it matches correctly, otherwise this will not work. Okay, now to separating it. So I'm essentially going to get all of this in here. So as we said, everything inside these quotation marks is considered to be CSS. So let's go ahead and cut that out. I also don't need the style attribute anymore. So I'm going to close that. Now, as we want to apply styling to the div, I'm going to have to somehow tell my style sheet that that's what I want to style. I could do this like so. I would grab the div, open up some curly braces, and paste everything that I had previously. And you will see our rectangle is back up. Our div is once again styled. Now, to make this look a little bit neater and more readable, it is common to have this layout when it comes to CSS. Let's save this file and let's carry on. So we have styled our first div. However, what if I want to create another div? So let's just go ahead and paste another div here and press save. You will see that another div has been made with the exact same styling that we have seen here. We have two divs with the exact same styling. This is great when it comes to not having to repeat ourselves and style something over and over again, like we would have had to in the HTML if it looked like this. So we would have had to have that, and once again, this, and so on and so on and so on. Thanks to our style sheet, we don't have to do that anymore. So I'm just going to get rid of that again. Great. Let's put in our second div and save. Now, as divs are considered to be the building blocks of HTML, perhaps I don't want all my divs to look like this. Now, one option will be to use another block element, such as a section, and give the section some styling that is similar, but not exactly the same as a div. So I'm just gonna change the color in this case for now. So there we go, we've got a div, a div, and a section. However, you will find that you'll soon run out of elements to use. This is why we have classes and IDs. I'm gonna show you this now. In this next section, we're gonna have a close look at classes and IDs and use cases for both. Let's get to it. So here we have two divs. Let's say I want the second div to have styling that is different from this div. I could easily give it a class and let's call this one the about me class. And let's go in here. Now, to get this class right here, I would have to use a different type of syntax. To denote a class, I would have to use a dot in my style sheet. Okay, so by writing dot, I am telling this file that I need to look for the class of about me. Now, I can give this a background color of blue. And there we go. The div with the class of about me is now blue. What you might notice, however, is how the about me div still has the styling from this div right here. So it is still 300 pixels wide and 200 pixels, even though we didn't tell it to be those dimensions right here. That is because we are essentially adding on top of the styling that it already has. So we are overriding the background color green with the background color blue. If you wanted this div to be completely separate from the styling that it has here, we would have to remove the styling from the div element itself. So we could do so like this by giving this a class that is separate. So I'm gonna call this class header. This is not correct, we will change this, but it's just to show you for now. So in here, I would go dot header, 
And there we go. The About Me has now disappeared because we have not given it a width and a height. Let's fix that. Width, 300 pixels, height, 100 pixels. And there we go. Now let's go back to here. You will notice that I used a div with the class of header. This is not really correct. We should not be doing this as we already have an element that is specifically a header. So let's go ahead and use that. There we go. And now we don't want this to be a class anymore. We just want this to be the element. So let's delete that too. We can also do the same for a footer as there is already a pre-existing element for us. So there we go. Okay, now it's time for a quick pop quiz. Let's do it. Here you have your index HTML file. All it has in it is a body with a background color of light coral. So I've applied styling in the HTML file to give the body a background color of light coral. Now, based on everything you have learned so far, how do you think that you would add a circle element to the body? Okay. Have a go at this yourself. All I want is a circle. I want the circle to be any color you want and any size. Please put that in to the browser here so it's visible for us. Please style it up as you wish. I'm gonna pause here while you have a go at doing this. Please have fun. If you don't get it, that's absolutely fine because we're gonna be going through the answer together. See you in a bit. Okay, so I would do it like this. I would open up our body because the div has to be a child of the body. I would then go ahead and put a div. I would style it to give it a background color. And let's make it light sea green. We won't be able to see anything if we refresh our page because we haven't given this a width or a size or a height. So I'm gonna go ahead and it has to be in here. Give it a width of 100 pixels and a height of 100 pixels. I'm just gonna get rid of this for now so we can see everything. Okay, so we have a square. And the one last thing that I will need to do is I'm actually gonna give it something called a border radius. 50 pixels and there we go we have now created a circle in our body i hope that was fun don't worry if you didn't get it that's what i'm here for we're going to be going through the answers together and please feel free to uh, use the internet if you ever get stuck that is absolutely fine too now i want you to essentially add a style sheet to what you've done so far so that we can take out the style and put it into a separate file or our style sheet. So just like we did in the lessons, I'm gonna pause here. So I'm gonna open up this as well because you will be needing to add files and some structure. Please have a go and do this first. Feel free to use what you've learned before. As a hint, you'll have to link up your style sheet and add the styling into the style sheet. Have fun. I'll see you soon. Okay, so the way I would do this is this. First off, we actually need to link our style sheet to our index.html file. So let's go ahead and create it first. I'm just gonna write styles CSS. So I'm giving the file, the CSS file extension to tell our IDE that this is, that this is a CSS file. If I click enter, you will see a little icon show up to see that that has worked. Next up, I would actually need to link this file to my index.html file. So I'm going to do it in the head and I'm simply going to write a link. I'm going to make it a self-closing link. I'm going to add the href, go to the styles CSS file. And I'm also going to tell my 
IDE that this is a style sheet for good measure. Okay, so now we've linked our style sheet, we've created a file. I'm actually now going to take all of this styling, so I'm literally just going to cut it out. We don't need this style anymore because we're literally going to put it in here. Now, the next thing we need to do is actually add all of this to the div. So I'm going to pick out my div by giving a class of circle. And then I'm going to grab that class because it's a class name. We need a dot and the word class and just put all of this in here like so. I'm also going to get rid of this. Oops, we wrote class, I'm going to write circle and get the body. So this time I'm not telling it it's a class. I'm just grabbing the element of body itself. And once again, pasting what we had before, like so. And we have done it. We have recreated what we have written previously by taking out the styles from our index.html file. So all our styles are now in a separate file. Okay, so hopefully you see that there is no styling in here anymore. We just have a body and a div with a class of circle and in here we have the body element, which is styled, and the class of circle. So anything with the class of circle will have this styling. Okay, so I hope you've enjoyed this pop quiz. If you didn't get it, that's absolutely fine. If you had to rewind and look at a lesson again, or perhaps use the internet, that is totally fine. That is absolutely normal as a software developer. We'll be doing a lot of these quizzes and a lot of these challenges. So I hope you enjoyed this one. Let's carry on. Okay, so you've just seen me use a three CSS properties. That is the width, where we set the width with the pixels, the height, where we set the height with the pixels, background color, where we set it to blue, and I also like to use border and border radius. These are my five most used CSS properties, I would say. If you look at the border, you can see that it takes three values. If I want the border to be solid, then I put solid and then I choose a color and then I choose the border width and the border radius is something that allows me to soften the edges of a rectangle. It is also what I would use to create circles. We will be using all of these in our project. Before we move on, I just want to show you what I mean when I talk about border. In this next section, we're going to look at the box model. Here we have our div. I have named it here as content in purple. Our div also has a padding, so you can access the padding by the padding CSS property and then you will see the border. The border is just above the padding. And lastly, above the border, you will have a property called a margin. So all divs possess all of these three properties and we can use them to our advantage. Let's go back to our style sheet. So let's take the about me. So as a reminder, the about me is a div with the class of about me. If I add a margin to it, so I'm going to add margin 10 pixels. You'll see the about me now has a margin of 10 pixels here, 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 and here. If we change this to padding, our div now has a padding. So an inner padding of 10 pixels. From the actual div itself. I'm just gonna switch that back to margin. I'm also gonna add a border. So once again, I want a solid border. Let's make it black. And then it already has a default width, but I'm just gonna change that to 10 pixels and click save. One other thing that I did mention is the border radius. And I'm just going to choose 15 pixels. And now you'll see that our div has softened edges because we've applied a border radius. So that is just some of the properties that are available to me in CSS. There are quite a lot out there, but for the purpose of this course, I'm going to be using the most popular ones. 
Now the next thing I want to talk to you about is colours. In this next section, let's talk a little bit about colours. Hex colours are a way of representing colours from various colour models through hexadecimal values. A hexadecimal colour follows the format RR, GG, BB. This is where RR is red, GG is green and BB is blue. These hexadecimal integers can be in a range of 00, 0 to FF to specify the intensity of the colour. This hex colour, for example, represents black and this one represents white. A simple example of this is this one right here. This colour is pure red because the red component is at its max value of FF and the green and the blue components are at their lowest of OO. However, when you get into the design aspect of things and people really want to customise their colours, you're more likely to see something like this. Using hex colour codes to represent different colours is an easy way to differentiate between colours. Once you understand how they work, you can easily change the red, blue or green values to create a different shade. This is particularly convenient given that you have such a range of colour options with hex colour codes, which guarantees colour exactness. We also have the RGB colour model. The RGB colour model is an additive colour model in which red, green and blue light are added together in various ways to reproduce a broad array of colours. The name of the model comes from the initials of the three additive primary colours, red, green and blue. The main purpose of the RGB colour model is for the sensing, representation and display of images in electronic systems such as televisions and computers, though it has also been used in conventional photography. Before the electronic age, the RGB colour model already had a solid theory behind it, based on human perception of colours. RGB is a device-dependent colour model. Different devices detect or reproduce a given RGB value differently. This is because colour elements such as phosphors or dyes and their response to their individual RGB levels vary from manufacturer to manufacturer or even in the same device over time. What is great about the RGB model is that we can also add a level of transparency. So here by the 0.5 we are indicating that this colour we want it to be at 50% opacity. I'm going to show you this with an example. It is absolutely your choice what you'd rather use if you'd rather use the preset colours that we have already here, whether you'd rather use the RGB or the hex. For here, I'm just going to choose to change this. So I'm going to change it from background to RGB and then don't forget our semicolon. So we've just changed this to this sort of brownie red colour. And now if I want to make it transparent by 50%, I would simply add 0.5. I can change the level of transparency so I can make it super transparent or less transparent if I wish. Same for the hex. So with hex colours it is a little bit different. We don't write RGB in front or hex. We simply get the hash like so and then get our six numbers and letters to represent the colour that we want. With some code editor tools, it is possible to click on the actual colour itself and just choose from the selector right here also. So, for example, similarly to that. So that is three ways of adding colours in CSS. You could either choose the default colours, choose your own RGB colour or choose a hex colour. The choice is totally up to you. Now, let's go back to building our page. Just going to save this for now. So we have our header, which currently doesn't have anything in it. It is just a header that is purple. We have a div with the about me, which is here. And we have a section, which is blue. Lastly, we also have a footer, which currently doesn't have anything. As this is a portfolio page for myself, I want my footer to contain some information. I want to put this information in a list. Let's learn a little bit about lists now. Using just HTML, we can make two different types of list. An ordered list, so with numbers, and an unordered list, so just with bullet points or similar. 
I'm going to show you how to do this now. So in my footer, I've decided that I want a table of content. Let's do this first with an ordered list. So I would use the OL tag for this, OL for ordered list. I'd make an opening tag and then a closing tag. So you won't actually be able to see anything for now. It's not until we start adding list items as denoted by the LI tag. So once again, an opening tag and a closing tag until we can see things. So my first list item is going to have an about me section. So if I click save, you will see a list item that is ordered. By ordered, I mean it has the number one. I'm just going to make the height of the section here smaller so you can see it and make our header 50 pixels high as well. So let's have an about me, a contacts page where we're going to have a form and a link to my GitHub. If I wanted to change the starting number of my ordered list, I would simply add an attribute of start to it and pass through the number 50 like so. So now my ordered list starts from the number 50. However, I decided that I don't actually want an ordered list at all. I want an unordered list. That makes a lot more sense in regards to what I want to try achieve. The bullet is a default that gets given with the UL tag. If you want to style this up in a different way, we're going to have to use CSS. For example, I'm just going to put the styling in the HTML file just for this, just for now. And I could do something like this list style type and then pass through a square. So now we get little squares instead of bullet points. I can also have the type be a disk. And of course, a circle. Other things that I can do to style my list, I'm going to do it in the HTML file rather than the style sheet for now, just so I can show you quickly. And that is change the line height. So I'm just going to pass through a line height of 100 pixels. So that's what it would look like more spaced out, 10 pixels, and so on and so on. I can actually also use percentages for this. So I know we've been using pixels quite a lot. But if we want to use percentages, that is absolutely fine too. Similarly to here, instead of having the width be 300 pixels, I can actually use my browser width to decide on the height, to decide on the width of my elements. So here you will see my header width is now 50% of the browser. If I extend this, you will see that moves around with it. It is now responsive. I'm just going to get rid of this for now because I'm happy with the default height. And we'll start this out a little bit later. One thing that I'm also going to want to do that we have learned already is actually link these up with our anchor tags. So let's go ahead and do that now. We don't actually have an about page built out yet or a contact page but there's no harm in just leaving this like so so we don't forget to do it later so once again we need the href and i'm going to put the absolute path to my github page so you already see that that has created an anchor link which again we can style to our preference for example, if I don't want a line there, I can get rid of that. If I want to change the font, if I want to change the color, if I want to have it change, if I hover over it, that is something we can do. And once again here, I'm just going to leave it for now because we haven't written the page. So that is just a placeholder for us to remember to do that later. Okay, so we have our header, we have an about me div, we have a section and we now have a footer. Now that we have lists down, I want to show you how to embed images into your project. There are two ways of doing this. I'm going to show you how. For this, I'm going to use my About Me section. I'm going to open up our div. So what I am saying essentially is I want my image to be inside 
the div here. And I'm going to use an image tag like this. What is important about image tags is that they are self-closing. We don't need an opening and a closing tag. So you can use it like that or simply like this. It is up to you. The image tag needs two attributes. The source attribute in which we provide the path to the image we want to embed and the alt attribute. The alt attribute holds a text description of the image, which isn't mandatory, but is incredibly useful for accessibility. Screen readers read the description out to their users so they know what the image means. Alt text is also displayed on the page if the image can't be loaded for some reason. You know, for example, network errors, content blocking or link rot. I would always advise to have an alt text. So for this one, I'm going to put Anya Kubo headshot. Now for the image. One way of adding an image into the image tag is to simply go on the internet and find a absolute path for the image you want. So for example, if I go to the internet, I find a hedgehog, I then copy image address, paste it up here, you will see there is an image or a rather large image of a hedgehog, which then of course I can use CSS to change the sizing of. This is okay, however, it's probably not the best practice for projects such as this. I would advise to store any images you use in your project directory. So let's go ahead and do that now. So in my file structure, I'm going to create a new folder. I'm going to call it images where I'm going to store all my images for this project. Now inside here, I'm actually going to upload a file. And it's going to be my avatar. We can store PNG files, JPEG files. It's totally up to you. So now we need the relative path. So I'm going to go into my images folder. And I'm going to get the Anya. Make sure to type it out exactly as you see it. PNG file and click save. Great. Now I'm also going to style this image so I can either choose to use the image tag and style it up. However, I'm not confident this will be the only image tag that I use. So I'm going to use a class to do this. I'm going to call this avatar like that. I then choose a dot because we are working with the class name. I go avatar and set a width. 100 pixels for the image. Great. I'm also going to use border radius and give a border radius of 50 pixels to make my avatar look like a circle. Okay, so this is looking good. I have my first image. I'm just going to shut down that folder. Let's go back to our index.html file. You will see that this code editor has actually reformatted this for me to be more readable. So now my image tag consists of the class attribute, a source attribute with the relative path to my PNG file and an alternative text. So it's more accessible. The next thing that I want to talk to you about is IDs. So we've already styled something by elements. So when we were grabbing elements such as the header and section, we've also used classes such as denoted by this dot, but we can also use IDs. Now, before we move on, I'm just going to explain a little bit more about this first. So for example, we can grab things by elements such as the div. We can add classes to elements and grab them in our CSS thanks to a dot and we can add IDs to our elements and grab them in our CSS thanks to the hash. IDs and classes are essentially hooks. But what is the difference between them? Well, IDs are unique. Each element can have only one ID 
and each page can have only one element with that ID. Now, this isn't just a good rule of thumb. This is something that's quite important. If you are a purely HTML and CSS person, the difference might not be evident. But when we start working with JavaScript, this will really make a difference. For one, your code will not pass validation if you use the same ID on more than one element. Validation should be important to us all, so that alone is important and a big one. Classes, however, are not unique. You can use the same class on multiple elements, so similar like we did with the divs. You can also use multiple classes on the same element. Any styling information that needs to be applied to multiple objects on a page should be done with a class. And one last thing, elements can have both. So for example, my div here can have a class of about me and then also an ID as well. This is however optional, but sometimes a very good idea to have. So I'm gonna write a title here. So I'm gonna to choose to have an H2 tag, the closing tag, and I'm gonna give an ID of name. In it, I'm gonna have my name, so Anya Kuba, and hit save. This will not do anything for now. I can, however, style it. So I'm just gonna show you what that will look like if I did. I would use the hash to get the div with the ID of name. And then I'm just gonna choose color, not background color because we are working with text for this one. And I'm just gonna choose blue and save. You will also note that because H2 tags and image tags are not in line, they display as block, they actually stack over each other and don't fit in my section anymore. I would ideally want my image element to float to the right. I'm going to show you how to do this with something called Flexbox. Before we move on, I just want to talk to you a little bit more about other properties we can assign elements in HTML. So for example, we have the data ID. Let's have a look at a few more in code. Okay, so as we know, we can have elements. So I'm just gonna make a div here. So here's my first tag and my closing tag, and I can give it a class name. So for example, box and ID, for example, main. And then I can also have data set read only properties as well. A data set read-only property starts off like this. It is in fact a custom data attribute. What this means is that I can make up any word I want as long as it has data in front of it. So as a recap, the attribute will begin with data and forward slash and can have anything after it. I can have data ID such as this. I can have a data user, such as Joe. I can have a, let's get rid of this for now, data, data, date of birth. It is completely and totally up to you. So that is just something to keep in mind as we will be using data IDs for some of our projects and later on in our JavaScript course. So as long as you uh, make a note of this, you should be fine. Let's carry on with our lesson. In this next section, we are going to be looking at Flexbox. Let's do it. Flexbox or the Flexbox layout module aims at providing a more efficient way to lay out, align and distribute space among items in a container, even when their size is unknown. The main idea behind the flex layout is to give the container the ability to alter its items width or height to best fill the available space. A flex container expands items to fill available free space or shrinks them to prevent overflow. Most importantly, the Flexbox layout is direction agnostic. This is opposed to the regular layouts that we have. While those work well for pages, they lack flexibility to support large or complex applications. 
Let's go over some basics and terminology. So here we have three child elements in yellow in an orange container. So that is the parent div they are in. At the moment, the three child elements, which are divs, are displaying as they should, as a default, so stacked over each other. We're going to talk about the properties for the parent, so the orange flex container. Now let's initialize this to use display flex. I'm going to show you how to declare a flex direction. This establishes the main axis, thus defining the direction flex items are placed in the flex container. So in this example, the flex direction is row, and we are making all our elements in the parent container display as a row. Alternatively, we can also set the flex direction as column, and we will see our elements align like so. Next, we have flex wrap. By default, flex items will all try fit onto one line. You can change that and allow the items to wrap as needed with this property. So I'm just gonna show you now, flex wrap, wrap, I've also numbered them for you so you can see a little bit better. Now let's change that to row. So once again, one, two, three. And I've added a, another div in there, a fourth, so you can see how that is wrapping instead. We can also use something called justify content to essentially make our divs bunch up to the start, bunch up to the end using flex end, and then center as well. We also have a space around space between, so hopefully you're seeing these small changes in the divs, and space evenly, along with many others such as align items, align content, flex grow, and a few more. Okay, quick pop quiz. Let's do it. So, here we have my index.html file. All it has really is a link to my style sheet and a div with the class of child, which I have styled up to look like this. Now, how do you think using display flex that you would get the child to appear in the right hand side right here? No matter what or how big our screen is, it will always stick to the right end of our screen. Have a think about this based on what we have learned. Please do have a go at trying this out in your own code editor and I'll see you in a bit. Okay, that's right. Hopefully you've got it. If you haven't, don't worry. I'm going to show you the answer now. I would initiate the parent by writing display flex. So the body is the parent of the child because the child is in the body. That is the one up from it is the body. And then I just use justify content flex end. And there we go. No matter how big the screen is, the square or the rectangle will stay to the right. Now, how do you think I would make it stay in the middle? That's right. I would change this to center. And now, no matter how big or small our screen, the square will always stay in the middle. Okay, that was our quick pop quiz. Let's carry on. Okay, let's get to using what we have learned in our project so far. For this, I'm going to use my section as the parent div. So here we have the parent div itself. I'm going to go in here and in the section, I'm going to use display flex. So what we are doing here is defining a flex container. It's going to enable a flex context for all of its direct children. So what that means is anything that I put inside the section is going to be affected. I'm going to save that. And then in here, I'm just going to create some divs. So here's one div and it's closing div. I'm going to give it a class of test. I'm just going to put one, two, three, four, five. And then in here, I'm going to style it just so we can see it a little bit. This is just for test purposes. So you can see width, height, 30 pixels. 
and I'm going to give it a background color of red and a margin so we can see each one a little bit more of five pixels. So there we have our five divs inside my section. Perhaps let's actually make the about me a bit higher. A bit bigger, so there we go. Okay, so here we have our blue section with five child elements. Now, if I use flex direction row, they won't change because they're already in a row. However, if I choose column, you will see here that all of my divs are trying to squash into the section. And because the section height is 100 pixels, it doesn't matter that these test divs are 30 pixels, it's squashing inside. Okay, to fix this, we need to use flex wrap. Wrap. Now you will see that instead of squashing, our divs are essentially still lining up in one column. However, once it gets to the end of the section, they are wrapping over. They are wrapping over. So if you follow my mouse, it goes like this. One, two, three, four, five. We can also justify the content of the section. So justify content center. And you'll see that they are all aligning to the center. So if this was my axis, they're aligned to the center right here. If I change this to be flex direction row, they're all centering around this axis instead. Instead of center, I'm gonna put space between, and you will see all the divs are spacing out with equal spacing in between each one. I can also choose space around and now you'll see that each one has the same space around each div. So that is just some examples of what we can do with Flexbox. The most important thing is that it makes everything dynamic. So for example, I'm just going to get rid of this for now. And apply flexbox to the body so our body is the tag that accompanies all of our elements inside here so let's go get the body so again i'm going to use display flex to initialize flexbox they are as default displaying inline i then want to get the flex direction to be column Okay, so that's step one. The next thing I'm gonna do is actually get my section and instead of have a hard coded width, I'm, gonna just, I'm just gonna put 100%. Same for the header, 100%. And for the about me, I'm also gonna have 100%. I'm also gonna get rid of the margin like that. And instead, I'm gonna apply margin top, 10 pixels, and margin bottom, 10 pixels. Another way of writing this is to write margin 10 pixels, zero, 10 pixels, zero. Okay, so that's just uh, another way of writing essentially the same thing. I'm adding a margin to the top, to the bottom, keeping it zero here and keeping it zero there too. So now you will see this is much more responsive and no matter where we're viewing this on our mobile, on a browser, on a tablet, it will look much more professional. Commenting out code. So you might see me commenting out code 
Uh, this just means that the code is unreadable at times and really helps us when we develop code because we can write pseudocode. So anything that I don't want my ID to pick up, I'm going to comment out. And we comment out by simply selecting the code. We want to comment out and pressing command and then the forward slash on your keyboard. Okay, so have a go at doing that. I'm going to show you an example of what I mean by this. Here we have a style sheet. I would simply grab that and press command forward slash to comment it out. And then once again, command forward slash again to uncomment it so that we can use it. Please have a go at this yourself. You're going to be seeing me use this quite a lot in the course. So have a go, have fun, and let's continue. So I'm just going to comment this out, the about me. So. This is how you would comment out in CSS. You need to put a dash and a asterisk, as well as an ending asterisk and dash, and that code will then be ignored. Okay, so once again, press command and then the forward slash to bring it back, and command forward slash to comment it out. Or you can simply type out this here and here too. Both will essentially work. Just to recap what we've covered so far with Flexbox, I'm going to apply Flexbox once again to these five divs. So again, this is in the section. I'm going to apply display flex to the parent div as the section, the blue section is the parent of these five divs here. If you look here, the five divs are inside the section, making it their parent. So I'm going to use display flex, you will now see that by default, all the divs are displaying inline. I can then use justify content to center the divs. I can use justify content to space them evenly. I can use justify content to space between. I can also align items to flex end. I want them to be at the end. I can align items to center. So if I want to display them straight bang in the middle, I would align item center, but also justify content center. There we go. And now they will always be in the center of that div, no matter what. So I'm happy with my section. I like the fact that the divs are always going to be in the center, no matter what. And if I go small, they will even squash up like so, but always remain in one line. So that is looking good. If I wanted them to wrap, well, you guessed it, I would use flex wrap wrap. So now you will see them wrapping over each other to so whatever you want. Now I've decided that I actually want the section not to be a solid color. I want it to be a gradient. I could simply, I'm just going to comment this out for now. So once again, command and forward slash. And I'm going to use background image. I'm also going to use linear gradient and pass through two colors. So just for example, I'm going to pass through red and yellow. And then I don't forget a semicolon. And we have now created a linear gradient. I could also customize this even further. For example, if I write two to right and then a comma you will see that the gradient is moving in the other direction i could also have to bottom right and once again you will see the gradient is moving towards the bottom right hand corner 
You can, of course, customize this as much as you want. If you're really particular about a certain angle, you can even pass through the exact angle you want by degrees. And you'll see that happen. One thing I can also do is add in multiple colors, or as many as I want. So I'm going to pass through green. And if you're feeling really crazy, I'm just going to get rid of the degrees for now. You can have a repeating linear gradient. And really go wild on the customization of everything. So there really is a lot to play around with the CSS. I'm just opening a never ending Pandora's box for you to really go wild. Okay. I don't particularly like it though, however, so I'm going to just remove it and keep it like that just for now. Another thing that I want to show you that's quite retro is adding box shadows. So for example, this is probably a good place to put an ID. So say I just want to add a box shadow to the middle div. It already has a class, however, I'm going to add an ID too. So this is me using a class and an ID on one element. And I'm going to put main. Save that. Now in my styles, I'm going to use the ID of main and add a box shadow. I'm going to put 10 pixels, 0 pixels. 10 pixels. So now you'll see that my middle div has a box shadow that is quite solid. It is not very opaque. I can also make it a lot softer and change its color. Okay, so here we are defining the horizontal shadow. Here we are defining the vertical shadow. Here we are defining the softness, and here we are defining a color. If I want to move a little bit closer, I simply change the pixel direction. Okay, so I wouldn't say oh, our portfolio is looking good, but we are exploring all the options that we can use to make it great. One last thing I want to show you is buttons. So this is going to be a HTML tag right in the about me section under the image. I'm going to use a button tag. So if I click save, you will see a button. I can also add click me. Now the benefits of using the button tag is that it will come with a pre-made button already. If we hover on it, it will slightly change. You will see that we are slightly clicking it. If we click it, you will see a little animation happen. So that's stuff that's already built into the button tag itself. We can use it to take us to another page, an external link, submit forms, anything we really want. You might see that some developers choose to omit the styling of this button completely and just use a div instead. That is also an option. However, we're just going to style our button here. So once again, I'm just going to grab the element itself so that now when we use a button tag anywhere in our project, it will be standardized and look the same. So I could do something like give it a border of zero. That will get rid of the border of the button. I can give it padding 0, 20 pixels, and that will give it a 20 pixel padding from the left and right and a zero padding on the top and bottom. I can also change the font size to 20 pixels, a background color of RGBA. In case I want to change this to be slightly transparent further down the line, at the moment one, it means it's solid, there is no transparency. So we get our semicolon, RG, RGBA. Now I want to add some gradients, so I'm going to add a linear 
gradient to top left and then pass through some colors so I'm gonna pass So I'm going to pass through RGBA 0, 0, 0, 0 0.2. RGBA, RGBA 0, 0, 0, 0 0.2. 30%. Gonna fall back this a little bit better so we can read it. RGBA zero 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 ending colon. So you can already see it's not a solid color. It's just very slightly linear graded, perhaps less offensive than this. It is just a bit more stylized. Then a box shadow inset two pixels two. Pixels, three pixels, RGBA, two five five, two five five, two five five, zero point six. Inset minus two pixels, minus two pixels, three pixels, RGBA, zero 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 point six. Once again, at the ending colon. Box shadow. So already that's looking more like a button you might see online. It obviously is quite labor intensive. CSS is a skill that you have to practice at quite a lot. There's a lot of really amazing CSS artists out there. I really do recommend you check out CodePen to see them more. It really is amazing what people can do with this skill. I'm gonna make this white as well. Just gonna give it some text shadow before we move on. Pixel one, pixel one, pixel. Okay, so I think I'm happy with that for now. This is obviously a much more extensive way of styling using everything that I have taught you so far. It's just a lot more detailed and I really get to the nitty gritty of linear gradients and box shadows and everything. Now the reason that I have done this is because I want to show you how to add styling if we hover on a button. At the moment nothing is happening. I want the style of the button to change if our mouse hovers over it and if we click on it. So to do this, I'm going to actually get our button again. So I am literally grabbing the element and then using this syntax like this, hover, I'm simply going to give it a background color RGBA save. So now if we hover on the button, it ever so slightly goes that little bit lighter. And the same for if the button is active. So once again, we grab the button active. So I'm not making these up. This is already inbuilt. You could say if the button is active, I want to add a box shutter. We can add the on hover and active onto any element. It doesn't just have to be a button, which is quite handy. We can do it for divs. We can do it on the header itself. We can do it for just about anything. And so I'm just going to show you how this would look. And then if we click on it, you will see it's ever so slightly the box shadow is turning white around it like so. So there we go. Just to prove we can do this whenever we want, I'm going to go in here, get the button tag, 
If I command D, I can actually select both of these words right here and replace it with a div and instead give this a class of button. And then in my style sheet, instead of just grabbing the button element because that doesn't exist anymore, the class button does, however. So once again, I would simply place that and just fix this up a tiny little bit by giving it a width. And making sure that it fits in the about me section. So I'm just gonna change this to 250. And then let's do text align. Center. So there we go. You will now also see that there's no blue surrounding square around it. This is because there's no longer a button element. It's now simply a div that we styled as a button. And I would personally prefer to do it this way. And I do recommend it to you too. In this next section, we are going to be talking all about fonts. Let's do it. Now that we have covered buttons, I think it'll be a great time to talk about fonts mainly because I am not a fan of this font right here. So I'm going to go into my body and set a global font for anything in the body. So font family and choose, I'm going to choose this one right here. So just as a default. And what this is saying is that I am choosing Gil Sounds to be my first font. If for some reason our browser doesn't support it, Gil Sounds MT as a third backup Calibri, as a fourth Trebucha MS, and as a fifth Sans Serif. So it, I don't think it's always necessary to have so many. Sometimes you could just have three. So let's go ahead and just cut that down. If we really want to customize this further, we can import fonts to use too. So I'm just going to show you how to do that. I'm going to go to Google Fonts. Google Fonts provides loads of free fonts for us to use. So for example, say I want to use Roboto in my project, I would simply go here and select which styles of Roboto I want. I'm going to choose regular, so I'm just going to choose one for now. Now I'm going to choose to select the link tag rather than the import tag. So I'm going to choose to copy this right here and then in our HTML file where we link the style sheet, I'm also going to link to the Google Fonts API in order to get the Roboto font. So I'm just going to save that. And now, instead of the font families that I chose, I'm going to choose to have Roboto and as a backup, Sans Serif. Sans Serif is just one of the ones that are provided for us, whereas Roboto is a special font, you could say. So right in here, our font family, I'm going to choose Roboto, which is the one we have just taken from the Google API. And as a backup, I'm going to have the sans serif default font. So now you'll see that all the font in our entire body, so that means that in the section, the about me section and in the footer is going to have Roboto. This is because body is the parent to all of these elements inside of it. If for some reason I wanted to apply a different font to the footer, I can essentially override the font in the body. So I could get the footer and then use font family like so and the font will be overridden. So that's looking good. One last thing that I want to show you how to do before we go to town on making this look good rather than just learning is to remove the line under the links. So I would grab the A tag and then I would get text decoration. None. And there we go. We have now removed the lines on the hyperlinks while well, the hyperlinks still exist. Okay, so in this section, we are going to explore layouts a little bit further. Let's do it. 
Okay, now I want to talk to you a little bit about website or app layout. I'm going to break this down for you by div, as that's essentially the building blocks of any website or app. So let's get to it. So at the moment, we have built this site right here. If I was to break it down by div, our page layout would look similar to this. So we've got our header in purple, and then we have our hero section, which has our name, image, and button. And then below that, the about me section, and then below that, the footer. However, as we want our website to look more like this, we essentially want our website to look like this. So this is the finished product. You will see the layout is a lot more complicated in terms of split out areas. In regards to the layout, if I was to tell you what this looks like in terms of divs, you would see something like this. We have divs, next to divs, on top of divs. It is essentially our website layout. So let's go back to what we have built so far. Now in this specific code editor, when I can choose to view the browser in the editor itself, I can also view it as if we were viewing it on a browser. So I'm going to open up here. So as you can see here, it is really visible because we are now viewing this on a laptop browser and everything has been stretched. You will see, however, that we still have one div up here, an orange div, a yellow and red div and our footer. If I was to inspect this page, so we can inspect this page by essentially clicking control and then left clicking the page and then getting our inspect tool. And this should show up all our elements. So I can actually pull this down so we can see this a little bit further. And what you will see here is our header, our about me div, a section and our footer. What is great about this is I can also select elements to inspect on the page. So for example, if I want to select the About Me section, you will see here that I've selected the About Me section and in it I've got an H2 tag, an image and a div that is styled as a button. This is really useful for seeing div size. You will see even though I am essentially floating over the div with a class of button, you can also see the div actually on the browser and it takes up all this space right here. So once again, I'm just going to float on it and there we go. This is because we haven't assigned the div a max width or a width. So it literally stretches to our browser. Same for the H2 tag, not the same for the image, however, as we did assign it a width. I'm going to show you one more thing that is quite useful. If you are not sure about how a style can affect an element, so for example, if I go on the About Me div, which has all three of these elements inside, so I'm just going to click here, I can actually edit it from my console. So here we'll see, for example, background color. I can essentially change this to whatever I want. This will not change anything in the project. This is simply changing it for us in the browser and as a quick way to essentially change things for us to see what it would look like in the finished product. Let's try another one. So I'm going to inspect, let's inspect this one right here. And then let's change the height, 100 pixels. And there you go. Okay, so this is a cool way of inspecting and seeing what something potentially might look like. You can do this on any website. I can go on to any website I want. So for example, if I go to google.com, let's go on the main search page. Let's inspect it. I'm going to select an element. So let's just select this input right here. And it's already given me all the CSS for it. So I can go ahead and change the font size to 30 pixels and there we go. Once again, I am not changing this on the actual Google code repository. I'm just changing this in our browser. This is essentially private for us to view only on our laptop in this browser. Okay, so now that you hopefully understand a little bit more about divs and layouts and how to inspect them in browsers, let's carry on. Okay. In this section, we are going to focus on everything we have learned so far by building a navbar. 
Let's do it. I'm just going to move this back here. Make that a little bit smaller for us so we can see. Now let's get to using what we have learned in order to create our header or essentially our nav bar. So let's go back to our HTML. I'm just going to rename this to Anya Kubo Portfolio. Once again, that will not change anything for us. This is just sort of metadata. It is what our project will show in the browser. So as you can see in this one, you will see Anya Kubo Portfolio show up here as the title of the tab. And let's get to making the navbar. So I've called this header, but I'm actually going to change it to navbar as I think it makes more sense. And it is important to make things as readable for anyone that goes onto our project as possible. So here we have a navbar. This is again a element that is provided for me. I did not make this up. It exists. Now in our navbar, well, I want to have a logo. So I'm going to put in an image. I also want to have a list. So we've done this before. I'm going to make an unordered list as opposed to an ordered list. Make sure that is a closing tag. And in here, let's have some list items. So here's our first list item. And I'm just going to have three, two, three. Now my first list item, I want to be about me. My second, I want to actually connect to my GitHub page. And then my third, I want to say contact me. Now each of these, I actually want to make an A link, so an anchor link. So as a reminder, an anchor link, we can link to a specific place in this page, another page, or an external page such as GitHub. So let's just do that now. I'm going to leave some of these placeholders. So there's one, there's two, and there's three. Okay, now we're going to add a logo to our nav bar similarly to how we did it here. So let's not forget that we need to add a source, which at the moment I'm going to need blank because we don't have anything imported yet. Make sure the formatting of this is correct. And then we also need an alt for the visually impaired. And I'm going to have Anya Kubo logo. So with my logo, I'm just going to actually import it by dragging it in. So let's go to downloads. Now with my logo, I'm actually just going to drop it in. So here it is. I've searched for my logo on my computer and I'm just going to drag it into the images folder we have already made. So we will see it in our images folder right here. So once again, we need to navigate to this file. So I'm going to go into my images folder, going into it and getting the JavaScript games logo and it's a PNG file. So make sure that is correct. And there we go. We have our logo in. Now I can already see it's too big. I don't really like that. So I'm going to add a class to this element. So the opening tag of the element and I'm just going to put logo. Now let's go into our style sheet. I'm going to get rid of header because it doesn't exist anymore. Change it to the nav element. I'm going to get rid of the background color. Next, I'm going to the class of logo and make the height. Let's make it 30 pixels. And I'm also going to give it a margin so it's not so squished. Margin 15. 30 pixels. So once again, this is a shortcut. I could have essentially written margin top 15 pixels, margin right 30 pixels, margin bottom 15 pixels, margin left 30 pixels. Okay, 
but this is a shortcut I am essentially saying this is the top this is the right and then I'm repeating it so that is some useful knowledge for you I'm just going to get rid of that now and use the shortcut instead Okay, so we have our logo. However, everything is stacking on top of each other, okay? It's stacking block. We need to change this, and we're gonna do this with the responsive layout tool we used earlier, and that is Flexbox. So, on the nav bar, I'm gonna initiate it, so display flex, and then use justify content. I'm gonna to choose to use space between for this one as I want the space between each of them to be equal. Don't forget we've added a margin here. So I'm talking about the space between here and the whole div of, and this div, including the margin. So that looks evenly spaced to me. The next thing we want to do is sort this out because I don't want these stacked over each other either. I want them next to each other. So for this, I'm going to get the unordered list tag i'm going to add a class to it this is because we are already using another unordered list in here so i need to pick this out by class or id but i think it makes more sense to use class in case we want to use this again and i'm going to call it nav bar so now i'm going to get the class of nav bar once again, I'm going to use display flex, so I'm initiating it. I'm going to use justify content flex end. So make sure it's always at the end of the page. And I'm going to use something called list style type none. This is because I don't want the little dots nav bar so don't forget it's a class so we need the dot we are telling this we need to find a div with a class of nav bar let's initiate flexbox justify let's initiate flexbox display flex okay and now let's justify content i'm going to use flex end this time because i want everything to go to the right of the page so there we go, that's happening. And then I also wanna get rid of these dots right here. I don't really want them. So we can do that with something called list style type none. So we did see this before, but we saw the circle and disc. This time I just want none. Okay, this is looking good. However, I do want some space around each individual list element. So, I would get the list element itself and go margin. I'm just going to use the shorthand again, so 15 pixels and 5 pixels. Okay, so that is now affecting this list item, this list item, this list item, but also these down here. Once again, this is a shorthand, so I'm affecting the top margin, the right margin, the bottom margin, and the left margin. I'm going to show you one more cool thing that you can do. I can actually manipulate the text itself. So if I want the text to always be uppercase, I can do that from my CSS. I don't have to go back into my HTML and write everything out again. So that is quite cool. And I'm just going to make the font size smaller too. I'm going to get 12 pixels. Okay, my navbar is looking good one more thing and that is actually we need to decide where these are going to go so let's go back to talking about hrefs so i've already shown you how to link to an external page and that is using an absolute path so like we did here so we are literally going to a web page that is my github page we have also discussed how to link to other pages in your project and we've briefly talked about how to link to elements in your actual page. So I'm going to show you how to do all three of them now. So we already know that to connect to a GitHub page or an external page, you need the absolute path similar to this. Now let's create a contact me page. So in here, I'm just going to save this file. 
I'm going to create a directory called pages and in it, I'm going to create a contact HTML page. Don't forget to make sure that this file is actually in the pages directory. Now I'm just going to put some boilerplate HTML in here, change the title to contact page and remind you that this is now not the relative path to our style sheet. Why is that? That's because our style sheet is not in the same folder as our contact HTML file. Okay, this would be implying that it's in the same folder. We need to go out of this folder and into the root of our project. So I'm going to show you how to do that. If I indeed want to use the same styles for my contact page, I would have to go out this project. So this is how you go out a folder going out of the folder with these two dots and then I would need to get the style CSS file. So I'm just going to put something like an h1 tag here so we can see what is happening. Contact. And go back in here. So now in here, I once again need to put the relative path so I'm going into the pages directory and I'm getting the contact file. Click save. Now, if I click the contact me, I will be taken to the contact page. I'm just going to show you what this looks like in an actual browser. Contact me, the contact page. In our actual browser, you will see that the URL has changed. This URL will be whatever location you are in. Obviously, I am using an online IDE, so this is a specific URL link for that IDE. And then we are going into the pages folder and then getting the contact page, okay? This is opposed to being on the home page. There is nothing extra after it. The index HTML is our root, okay? So back to the home page. So we have linked up an external site. We have also linked up a page in our project. The last thing I wanna show you is how to link to an element in our page. So I can do this with an anchor link. All I need to do is actually use an ID and I'm just gonna write about me. Okay, so now that is essentially linked to something, but we need to tell it where to go. I'm gonna choose to link it to this section right here. So I'm just going to write an h2 tag. The h2 tag is going to say about me. And then using open up our a tag name. And I'm literally copying this ID close that tag and then I'm gonna close that tag here save I'm also gonna just make this hero section a little bit larger so we can see this more visibly uh, so this is the about me section I should probably rename this so we make it 500 pixels so now if we click about me you will be taken to the About Me section. Once again, let's view this in an actual browser. About Me. And it is coming more into view. We can change exactly how much we want this to scroll into view in our CSS, but just know that it is coming more into our view as the user. Okay, I'm just going to change this back. So we have our links. However, I don't really like these default colors. They're not really doing much for me. I don't like this purple. I'm going to show you how to change the color of the links based on certain actions that happen. So if we click it, if we hover over it and so on. Let's go to our style sheet. Now I already have an A tag already done here. This is when we decide to remove the line. So as a reminder, this is what an A tag will look like without any interference. However, I've decided to get rid of the text decoration. 
Now I also want to change the links to the black. So there we go, that's happened. But there's a lot more that we can do with these. I can get the A tag and by writing this kind of syntax like this, I can change the color to be any color I want. So now if I hover over a link, the color changes. So this is a great thing to remember when you really start to get to the nitty gritty of design and UX and UI. You can even go really wild and change the font size if you wish. It is totally up to you. The world is your oyster. I'm just going to get rid of that for now as I'm not really a fan of that type of look. And there we go. Okay, I think we are now ready to move on to the hero section. So I'm going to call this part my hero section. If I just show you the final product of what I want this to look like, here we go. My hero section is going to have my name, a little bit about me, a button so I can get hired, and an image. So let's get to doing that now. I'm also going to make it responsive. In responsive design, page elements reshuffle as the viewpoint grows or shrinks. A three column desktop design may reshuffle to two columns for a tablet and a single column for a smartphone. Responsive design relies on proportion based grids to arrange content and design elements. While responsive design emerged as a way to provide equal access to information regardless of device, it is also possible to hide certain items such as background images and so on. Decisions about hiding content or functionality or altering appearance for different device types should be based on knowledge about your users and their needs. So let's get to it. Let's make our first responsive section. So back to the HTML file. So I've named this section about me. However, I want to change that. I don't want to make this about me anymore. I'm going to change this to be called a hero section. So in our style sheet, let's find the about me and change it to hero. Now for this to work, I essentially need to split this section into two sections. Okay, so if you remember back to here, I want two purple sections so that each can hold different information and can essentially stack over each other if we go into mobile view. Okay, so that's what we want. So let's build that out now. Let's make one div. Let's make one div here. And then another div here. Just so we can see what is going on, I'm going to call this class hero info. And then the second one, class second for now. I'm not going to keep this class, it's just so we can see what is happening. So now, if I go hero info, make sure it's a class, and second, let's make it width 300 pixels, height 300 pixels, back, background, color red, and then the same for this one. You will see that they are stacking over each other. Let's also get rid of the height of this hero image so we can see. So they are stacking over each other. I'm just going to perhaps get a margin so you can see that a bit better too. Margin 5 pixels. Margin 5 pixels. We don't want this. We want them to essentially be next to each other but only stack if they go into mobile view. So in the hero... I'm going to use display flex to initiate flex box. Okay, they are stacking. However, we do have all this extra information here too. So let's go back in here and take the button and the image. So make sure to take all of them and the H2 tag. Okay, I'm just going to put that in to hero info. So now they're in here. And then we have a second square here. So that's looking great if it's a larger browser. However, they're still sort of collecting to the left. 
I'm also going to use justify content space between. Okay, I think that's looking a lot better for what we need. Please bear in mind, I am building this site, so it's maximum to these proportions. This is just for the tutorial. If you are building this out to use on the browser, please be conscious of the fact that this in the browser will look like that. But yeah, for this tutorial, this is going to be the max that we're going to view this website in. Okay, the next thing we need to fix is that I actually want these to not squash in like so. I want them to actually stack over each other. So you might remember a little something called flex wrap and wrap. So now, as soon as the two squares don't fit on the same line, they will wrap over each other like so. Okay, so that's one option and that's the second. We can also even get to the nitty gritty of what happens when we are at this stage because obviously there's a lot of blank space here. But that is something I'm going to leave to a later on lesson. Let's get comfortable with this part first. So there we go. Our hero image is coming along nicely. We've got our hero information and then our second square here too. I'm just going to give the hero information a larger margin. I'm going to stick it to 30. And I'm actually going to get rid of this second styling for now. You can see what is happening, so I'm going to get rid of that. And I'm also going to get rid of this class. The only reason I added it so we can visually see it, but just be aware that if we put anything in here, the same styling and same logic will apply. And I'm also going to get rid of that. For the next part, let's actually add some text. So let's go back to our index HTML here. I'm going to get rid of the contact page too. I'll make this a little bit smaller so we can see everything. So we have our name. I'm just going to style this to look better because we already have an ID for it here. So I've said blue, but I don't actually want that. Let's just make it a bit larger. So I think 45 pixels would be good enough. Great. And then make it black. I'm also going to make this an H1 tag rather than H2 as we want to prioritize this. And then I'm going to also put a paragraph. Okay. And in the paragraph, I'm going to put, I am a professional software developer and YouTuber. I love to teach anyone and everyone how to code. Okay, so that is looking good. However, you will see because there's no div here at the moment, the text is stretching. I don't really like this. Let's fix it. In the, so let's check what this is in, the P tag, the parent of it is hero info. So let's go to hero info and give it a max width of 300 pixels. That's not a width, that's a max width, okay? So it will mean that this will change if I go any smaller. However, the max width will always be 300. Great. Now I'm actually gonna get rid of this image here. I've decided I don't want it here anymore. I'm gonna have an about me section and I think that will fit much better into it. So I'm just gonna put it here and make sure that it's formatted correctly. The next thing I want to show you how to do is create custom thematic breaks. So a thematic break, I'm going to show you what this looks like as a default under the paragraph here. So I can put in a thematic break similar to this. It's just a simple line. It's essentially a break. However, I don't like it. I don't really like how it looks. I'm going to create my own. So I'm actually just going to use a div for this. And I'm going to give a class of styled break. So let's go into our CSS styled break. I'm going to give it a width. So I'm essentially just going to make a rectangle and round off the edges. Width give it a height of 
five pixels so that we can see it a little bit and then give it a background color. I'm going to go with the purple that I'm really into at the moment. So there we can see it right here. And then I'm going to give it a border radius. We're going to round it off of 2.5 pixels. So that is half the height. And then let's give it some margin. So once again, top margin, side margin, bottom margin, side margin. And there we go. And finally, I just want to change this button. It's not really the style that I'm going for. Of course, this was a great button to show you all the different things that we can do to a button, but let's change it for the sake of this design. So I'm just gonna get rid of the majority of this now. Save that. I'm gonna give it padding and pixels instead. Give it a background color. I'm going to use the orange that is in my logo, the EF866C. I'm going to give it a width, 80 pixels. Of course, a border radius because I'm partial to border radiuses. I'm going to say 20 pixels. I'm going to say the font should be white. That is white. And I also want the text to be uppercase. So whenever there's a button, we're going to transform the text to be uppercase and font size 12 pixels. Let's also align the text so it's center. So text align center. There we go. So I've changed the button. However, I'm not going to change much about the hover. Actually, maybe let's change the hover to a slightly, because at the moment it just goes red. Let's change it to a slightly more orange orange so i'm going to use seven four four b this is one i found on the internet earlier okay i think that's looking good and if the button's active well we still have the box shadow inset and i'm quite happy with that i'm going to keep it let's go back to here now and instead of click me i'm going to put higher me and we'll link that up to something soon Okay, so we have this here. The one last thing I want to add is an image. So once again, I'm going to drop in an image that I have previously made. It's an image called Working Illustration. I'm just going to drop it in here. So let's just make sure that I don't want that one in there. I'm just gonna change it. Working illustration, illustration PNG. Great. And inside this div, I'm gonna get the image tag. I'm gonna open it up. I'm going to use the source of the relative parts. I'm going to go into my images folder and I'm going to get the working illustration PNG. Great. So there it is. It's very large. Don't worry. Don't forget to give it some alternate text for the visually impaired working illustration. Awesome. Let's also give this a class. We can style it. I don't like the size, so class hero image. And let's go into here and right under the... I like to keep everything roughly together. So under the hero info, I'm just going to have hero image. And let's make sure to give it a size that is, makes sense so it fits. I'm just going to give it that size right here. And once again, I'm going to give it a margin.
margin because I don't like it being so close to here. I'm going to say margin 30 pixels. Okay, so if we go into the larger size like this, we can see both. And if we start moving into the tablet, so ideally this looks good and this looks good. However, I don't really like it when it's like here. We'll have to fix that, as I said, when we start doing more responsive work. So this is talking about breakpoints. But for now, let's carry on. So I'm liking how this looks here. Let's get rid of this now. We don't need this now. We don't need to see how the div is looking. And there we go. I'm also going to get rid of this hero background. I don't want it to be this color anymore. I just want it to take on the color of whatever is the body. So in the body here, I'm going to say background color. And this is a sort of off gray. And perfect. Next up, the About Me section. I'm just going to move this over for now like this so we can work on the About Me section. So let's go back in here. So once again, I'm going to have to split out the About Me section into two divs. So as you can see here in the purple under the Hero div, and then each of the two purple divs is going to have a different amount of divs in it stacked on top of each other. So let's do it. Hopefully this is becoming more clear to you. We're going to do exactly what we did for the hero section, but to the about me section. So in this section right here, I'm going to make a div. I'm going to call it. I'm going to give it a class of about me. So there's our one div and there's our second div. Once again, I'm just going to give it a class so we can see what is happening. So second, into here, under our section, about me, and then second. So width, 300 pixels, height, 300 pixels, background, color, blue and margin pixels. and then same for the second once again you will see the two divs now what is quite good about this is that they are in the section their parent is section so we are already adding the flex wrap to it meaning that they will stack however it's got a lot of other stuff in here too so let's sort that out First off, in the About Me section, well, it is confined to a height, so let's get rid of that. Okay, so there we go, it's now stretched. It also has some other things in here which I don't want, so let's go back in here. I'm actually going to... So in the first box, I want to put in my image. So let's do that for the about me. Let's get the image. And then in here, put in the image. So that is looking good. And then in the second box, I'm going to put the H2 tag. Okay, and then we have some socials, which looks fine if we view our site in a browser of these proportions. However, if we get any larger, the socials go to the right. I don't want this happening. I want them to stack over each other. So I'm going to take all of these. I'm going to remove them from this section. So that's looking better. And I'm just going to create another section. So it's got its own separate section now. And let's just post them. Yeah. Okay. 
So this is the great thing about classes. I've essentially reused the styling for sections. So now each of my sections has this red and yellow gradient. I could just repeat section, section over again. And there we go. I don't actually like the colors of the section. So let's just make it white. You know, background color. White. And there we go. So even though this is technically two sections, you can't really see the difference. But they are staying in the correct layout that I want at all times. Great. Now let's get to some styling. Okay, now I'm just going to get rid of the blue boxes for now. And we also don't need this second box right here. So I'm going to get rid of that second. And I'm actually going to call this info instead. Because that makes more sense. And once again, just get rid of the height and the background color for the about me. Let's make sure that the image always stays in the center. So let's do justify content space evenly. Okay. And let's add some text for the about me section. So once again, I'm just going to use a paragraph tag. I'm just going to put some text. This can be just a little bit about yourself. It's totally up to you. I'm just putting some placeholder text here for you. Okay, so we have our text. It is quite long. Once again, we get this problem. So we can easily fix this with, you guessed it, applying a max width. So we gave it the class of info. I'm going to say max width 300 pixels. Okay, it's looking better. And I'm also going to give it a margin. Everything in here, I'm basically giving a margin of 30 pixels. I just think it looks quite nice. Let's do the same for the image here. Margin 30 pixels. Actually, no, let's get rid of it from there. Okay, so this looks good. However, it doesn't look so great when we suddenly switch it out. So I'm going to apply some styling to the section. Of course, please be aware that it will apply to this, but I'm absolutely fine with that. I don't mind. I think it'll look quite good. So let's find a section and give it a margin. We just want the top. So I'm going to put 40 pixels and then the size we want zero. Padding. There we go. Actually, we might want to give it zero and zero. Okay, I think that's already looking better. We're slowly getting there, slowly but surely. So there we have it. You can of course feel free to edit this as you wish. I'm sure some of you have uh, different ideas when it comes to styling. This is only a tutorial for you to take and use as you want. Let's check the about me is linking correctly and boom, there we go. About me, boom is taking us directly to that section. I'm really pleased with that. And it's just checked for mobile. That is also looking good too. Okay, now I wanna put some social links here. However, first, before we move on, let's actually create a contact me form. So that's what I'm gonna do. Forms up next. Okay, so next up, we are going to learn all about forms. So let's start creating our form using HTML and CSS first. For a form, we will need some type of script in order to actually submit the form. So it's going to be a great segue into learning a little bit of JavaScript. But before we get onto that point, let's get it working visually first. So 
let's decide where we're going to do this. Well, I'm actually going to create a new section for this. So once again, I am creating a section. There we go. And in this section, I'm going to use a form tag. So once again, this is not something I'm making up. This is pre-made for us and opening up our form. You won't see anything in it now. This is because we actually have to start putting stuff into our form first. Now, I'm going to put an H2 tag in here. That is absolutely fine. You don't just need to put inputs uh, into a form. So here is my first thing that I'm going to put into the contact form, and that is just an H2 tag. You will see that showing up right here. Now, the form element can contain one or more of the following form elements. An input tag, a text area tag, a button, a select option, an option itself, a field set, a label, and an output. So I'm going to show you some of these now. Let's create our first part of this form, and that is a way for someone to input their first name and last name. So I'm going to create a label. This is so we can actually see what the form options are for. So label for first name. Make sure that it's an equal sign. And I'm just going to put first name like so, so we can see it. And the next thing we need to do is create an input. So here we have an input tag. I want to specify that the type of input we take is text. I'm also going to give an ID so we can work with it later. So this is just the correct things that you need to put with an input field. First name. And I'm also going to give it a name of first name. This is also that we can use it with our JavaScript later on. And in here, I can also put in a placeholder. We can do this by simply adding another attribute. And I'm just going to put John. So there we go. That's how you put a placeholder in. Of course, this will disappear if I start writing on it. It's just a placeholder. As mentioned, at the moment, this isn't connected to anything. That's what our JavaScript is going to do. I'm just going to really push that out for now so we can see everything in full. So there we have our first label. Let's do the same for a second name. Second name. Second name. Or maybe we could put last name. That probably makes more sense. Last name. And then again, I'm going to put a placeholder name of Doug. So that is one example of an input. It is a text input. I'm going to show you another now. So another input that we can have is a radio button option. If you don't know what a radio button option is, I'm going to show you here. So once again, we use the input tag. I'm going to put type radio. And you will see we get a little dot that you can select, show up like that. So that's pretty cool. Once again, it has no functionality. And once again, we need to give it an ID and a name. So I'm going to go with ID and I'm going to use this for displaying office work, name, office work. And it actually does need a value, even though you can't see it for now. I'm going to put it in anyway. It's for later on in our JavaScript. And once again, let's not forget to give it a label. So label, this is for the button itself. For office. And then I'm just going to put office. So what I'm getting here, so I'm going to put that label below. That looks more sense. That looks better. So you can select office like so just gonna do a few more so i'm just gonna do maybe three so we've got office and change this one to remote work and once again make the label say remote work so we can see it visually in our browser and then this one i'm just gonna put other other 
Okay, so now I have three options, three little buttons. That is looking cool. So we've got a text input, we've got a radio button. What else can I show you? Well, there's also another type of button, and that is a checkbox. So why don't we go ahead and create that? It is also an input tag. Type, we're gonna put checkbox. So once again, you can see it's already a checkbox. And once again, I need to give it an ID. And this time I want my checkbox to tell me if it's contract work. So I'm just going to put ID contract name contract and value contract. This might seem like overkill, but it will make sense when we start doing the JavaScript. So we've got input, let's give it a label. Label for contract. And then just so we can see the text, contract, work. Okay, and once again, I'm just going to create two more. Make sure they are formatted correctly too. And that label is spelled correctly. Label. So we've got contract work. Let's make the second one full time. So once again, full time. And this one, we'll put response. So ship. Great, so we have all our fields that we want. We now need an on submit button. And this again is gonna to have to be an input. So there we go. Submit. So we've got a button here. Type submit value submit. And then I'm going to add the class that I use for this button here because I want all my buttons to look the same class button. Ta -da! So I don't actually need this here because it's picking up from the value. And there we go. Okay, this is looking good. Let's just make sure to make it look nice. So this is where some of our layout work is going to come into. At the moment, if I pull this out, it's just all appearing on one line. I want it to be a stack over each other and then on one line for some occasions. So let's do it like so. I'm going to make a div. I'm going to give it a class of input section. So at the moment, you'll see that that has split out this first one here. Let's do the same for the second batch of inputs. Once again, closing div. Make sure to format correctly so it's more readable. And then last one. And closing div and make sure to format it so it's more readable. So now, instead of them all being in one line, because I put them in three separate divs, the three divs are stacking over each other. So that's one step in the right direction. Let's go to our styling. And then towards the bottom, I'm gonna do it here. Input section. Put margin. I'm going to space them out the top, but not the sides. Okay, so that's looking much better. I mean, it would be nicer if this perhaps fit on one row instead. So let's do that up here too. I'm going to put the first name and surname in a separate div. one 
div. It's the second div. And then I'm going to give this a class so that the first name is over the input. I want to give it maybe input group. So they are grouped together. Same for this one. And then here, dot input group. Dot input group. Display flex. Flex direction column and then let's give it a max width too so just the width will be fine or actually perhaps we don't need this and then for the input section display flex okay and just give this a margin so it gets a margin just to be right that would be zero, five pixels, zero, zero. Okay, and this is looking a lot better. Nice. Let's perhaps give the form a bit of space down here. So I'm gonna put up here, form, margin. Nothing from the top, nothing from the side. 40 pixels at the bottom and nothing from the other side. Okay, great. You can, of course, play around with these as much as you like. It is totally up to you. It's obviously however you wish to display these things. Same for the footer. Perhaps you want it to appear in the middle. Once again, I'm just going to use display of legs and just content center to do that great this is all looking really good there's three more things that I want to do before moving on to JavaScript and that is learn how to use icons create a new page and talk about breakpoints so let's do it in this section I want to talk to you a little bit about how we can include pre-made icons into our project with the help of something called Font Awesome. Let's do it. Font Awesome is the most popular way to add font icons to your website. Font icons are created using scalable vectors so you can use high quality icons that work well on any screen size. I'm going to show you how to do this now. So I'm just going to minimize this. You can already see all the cool icons that we can use. All we need to do is get started. So start get started for free. I'm gonna put in my email address and then get sent the start kit code. So you will see that I've already got it sent to me, but you should receive some code that looks a little bit like this. Okay, so click to confirm your email. Select a password. So I'm just gonna select a strong password. Ania Kubo gonna leave this to 2020 and also let's go okay so you first need to add your kits code to a project so I'm gonna copy this script and head over to my index HTML file where I will put it in the header so just under the link here I'm gonna put in my special link to font awesome now I'm gonna pick a free icon so let's just go ahead and for the sake of this, use this one. Make sure to be in free. You can of course choose a paid one too, but for this, I'm just gonna use a free version. And then you can choose the color. You can essentially edit this as much as you like. I'm gonna click start using this icon. And then I'm simply gonna copy this, go back to our code and then the index HTML file, where you can see these divs here, I'm just going to replace it like so. And there you go. You will see my user circle show up. Now, I can, of course, edit these more and more if I want. However, you might have to upgrade for this. There is so many and so many you can choose from. 
for example, if I want to start using this icon, I'm just going to copy that. And once again, put that in my project. And you will see that I can go ahead and replace all of them. Okay? So that is how you would use Font Awesome icons. There are plenty of free ones. There are paid ones too. And you can, of course, edit them, the colors and how large they are based on your preference. If I want to pick one out, I can simply pick out one of these words. So I'm going to choose far as it's the class name that is appropriate for all of them. So I know that we mentioned that elements can have more than one class name. This is a great example of that. I'm going to go in here. I'm going to pick out far and I'm going to give each one a margin of three pixels. OK, so that immediately spaces them all out. At the moment, these are not linked to anything, but please feel free to link them up using the href, similar to how we did with the list items. That is also an option, too. Now let's move on to creating new pages. So as you can see, I have my contact me section right here. Let's go ahead and move it to the contact page because I think it will make a lot more sense there. So I'm going to essentially take this entire section. So I'm taking the entire section here. You will see now that the form is gone. And I'm going to actually put it into my contacts HTML page and save. So now if I click on my contact page, you will see that the form shows up. Once again, I'm going to put this in my browser, click on the contact, and there we go. As a reminder, you will see that the URL has also changed. So the URL is taking us to the pages directory and then our contact page. At the moment, this page is not really built out. We cannot even go back to our home page from this page. We will need to essentially delete the URL in order to do that. So that is something that you might want to consider working on if you do want to have more than one page in your project. Let's go back. Okay, so even though this is looking great, I am also going to keep a copy of this in my index.html file. There's no one telling me that it can't be in both places, so I'm going to keep it like that. Okay, so I think we are now ready to move on to talk a little bit about breakpoints. So, so far in this tutorial, we made a web page with rows and columns. It was responsive, but it did not look great when we changed the size of the screen to just about here. We were left with a lot of white space. To fix this, we need to talk about breakpoints, and media queries can help us with that. We can add a breakpoint where a certain part of the design will behave differently on each side of the breakpoint. Media query is a CSS technique introduced in CSS3. It uses the at media rule to include a block of CSS properties only if a certain condition is true. For example, here, if the browser window is 600 pixels or smaller, the background color will be yellow. Let's check it out. OK, now let's see this with an example. So here we have our page. Once again, I am happy with it when it's in mobile. I'm happy with it. It's in browser. I'm not happy with it when it's around here. OK, so let's change that. I'm going to guess that the width of my page is about 600 pixels. So if anything is under 600 pixels, I want the text to stretch and I want to make the image disappear. So we can do this like this. I'm going to get at media only screen and max width. 600 pixels. I'm just going to make this a little bit smaller so we can see. So now, if our browser is under 600 pixels, I want the hero info to have a width of 600 pixels. So you will see 
600, over 600, over 600, over 600, and under 600. And you will see that text is now spread. So once again, over 600, under 600. So perhaps we can even make it larger. Let's make it max width. 800, 700. You could just fiddle around with this, whatever feels good to you. So there we go, and that's when the switch happens. You can even see it in slow motion. There we go. And then make the max width 650, or 700 actually, just to make it fit the whole way. And there we go. Okay, now let's make the image disappear. So make sure you are in the curly braces and at the break point of 700 pixels. I want you to get the hero image and visibility hidden. Okay, so we can see the image and then can't see the image. It's disappeared. I'm also going to make the height zero pixels. So that looks a lot better. And there we go. So I'm pretty impressed with that. I think that looks a lot better. We are simply getting rid of the image once it gets the 700 pixel breakpoint. You can also have as many breakpoints as you like. So obviously there's ours and boom. And then it disappears. It is totally up to you. Try it again with a color just to get some practice with it. Let's do about the footer so the footer changes color. That should be quite simple for us to see. So let's scroll down to the footer and then right below it, add media only screen and, and then max width. So let's set the max width this time to 500 pixels. So as soon as our browser gets to 500 pixels, so if we're going this way, 500 over 500 pixels, over 500 pixels, over 500 pixels, under 500 pixels, the color will change. So let's grab our footer. So let's grab our footer and make the background color Fresh. Like once again, over 500 pixels, over 500 pixels, over 500 pixels, over 500 pixels, under 500 pixels, blue, over, under, over, under. So that is pretty cool. Now, of course, we can also have min width as well. So if I change that to min width and save, the opposite will happen. So a lot of developers actually design mobile first, which means they will make sure that the design looks perfect in a mobile form. You will find that most websites do get visited the most from mobile, so perhaps this is why the shift happened. It also means that if you design mobile first, you will need to use the min width on your media queries, because as you get larger, so then you start designing for tablet, then you will apply a style. And then if you want a different style for desktop, or you can add another min width. So that's it, max width and min width. It just depends what browser you are designing for first and what you feel most comfortable with. Okay, let's move on. I think it's now time to start writing some JavaScript. But before we do that, let's recap everything we have learned so far about HTML and CSS. Let's take a quick break to talk a little bit about the Z index. I'm going to do that now. The Z index property specifies the stack order of an element. An element with greater stack order is always in front of an element with a lower stack order. I'm going to show you what I mean by this and how we can use the Z index. So here we have my index HTML file. I'm just going to go ahead and put in two divs. So here is one div. Let's give it a class first block and then 
div second block. Now let's go into our style sheet, which is in the source folder. Let's grab the first block. So just like we did here, we need to get the class. So I'm going to use a dot for class and then open up our curly braces. So that is our first block. I'm going to style it up a bit. So I'm just going to give it 100 pixels width and a height of 50 pixels and a background color of coral. And I'm just going to copy this. We're going to have two blocks. So it's the first block and it was the second block. So once again, that is a class. So we need the dot and I'm just going to call it second block and let's give it another color so we can tell. So there we have it. Now I can actually move. So I'm just going to give this a position of absolute. By saying position absolute, I'm saying that I want the position of the first block to be absolute. What I mean by this is by giving the position property the value of absolute, we are making sure the element is positioned relative to its first positioned ancestor element. So I have given the body some styling. If I was to just comment that out and refresh, that is the absolute position, okay? It will always be there. That is absolute. And if I was to do the same for the second block, it will be in the same position. They're not uh, appearing in line or block. I would then move. I can then move the second block. So let's give it a left 50 pixels. So I've literally moved the second block, which is a light sea green, 50 pixels to the right by giving a left spacing. So I've given it left spacing of 50 pixels. I can go 150 pixels. I can go 80 pixels. Okay, that is just one example of how I would use position absolute and left. Now, say we had this styling, but I actually wanted the second block to appear below the first block. Okay, so what I mean by this is I want the orange block to be more visible and the green block to be below it. I could do this with the Z index. So I could either choose to give the first block a Z index of one, and that would move it above the green or second block, which has a default Z index of zero. I could also have chosen to give the second block a Z index of minus one. Okay, both things would do the same thing. That is how the Z index works. Sometimes when you have more than one or more than two elements apart from yours on your screen, you would have to increase the Z index from minus one to minus two, minus three, or minus 99 to be safe if you do really want it to be at the very, very bottom of the stack. Okay, so that is how the Z index works. I'm gonna ask you to do this by yourself with a little challenge. So I'm just gonna get rid of all these. So make sure in your style CSS, you just have a body with a background color. And then in your index HTML file, I'm just gonna refresh this. We're gonna have a first block, a second block, a third block and a fourth block. So third, fourth. So that is my index HTML file. That is my style sheet. I want you to essentially build out the four blocks as circles. I want you to create four circles and stack them on top of each other. So but visibly on top of each other like we just did to have the first block at the top and the fourth at the bottom. Okay. So four blocks, or let's just be more precise, four circles that are stacked on top of each other. As a clue, I've made this example. This is what I want you to recreate in your browser. You can make the colors different. You can make the spacing different. That part is up to you. Okay, 
I'm going to pause here while you have a go at doing this. So once again, this is what your index HTML file should look like. And this is what your style sheet should look like. Okay? Good luck. I'll see you in a bit. Okay, so if you've managed to do that, well done. If you haven't, don't worry. We're going to go through the solution together. So I'm just going to make sure that I've saved these files. We don't need the index.js file for now. So the first thing I would do is grab my first circle. I'm just going to grab the first circle. Let's open up our curly braces. Let's actually style it up so we can see it. I'm going to use 50 pixels and a height of 50 pixels. And then a border radius 25 pixels to make it a circle. Making sure to spell border radius correctly. And then background color, let's say salmon. And I am actually going to reinstate this because I do want it to be in the center. So that is my first circle. I'm actually going to make it a bit bigger. Why not? It's a bit small. So there we go. My first circle. I'm actually just going to copy this for the second circle. And let's give it another color this time. Let's make it a bit lighter. It's not lighter. Let's make it lighter. Okay. And then we need a third circle. Once again, I'm going to make it even lighter. And a fourth circle, which once again, you guessed it, I'm going to make even lighter. So we've got our four circles. Now I want them to stack over each other. So let's do that first. Well, I could do that in the body. So I can simply write flex direction column. And there we go. They are stacking over each other. I'm also going to give it a margin left so we can see it. 150 pixels. It's just for us. Get rid of that. And now let's do some positioning and Z indexing. So for this one, position absolute. So it might appear to be disappeared, but it's just because all the circles will now be in the same position roughly or exactly. So there we go. So that is our absolute positioning. Now the first circle, well that was the darkest, wasn't it? So let's give that a Z index of minus four. And I'm also going to give it a top of 400 pixels. So now let's move all the way down there. That is fine for now. We will be adjusting these. This one, I want to be the third last. So I'm going to give it a minus three index and top 300 pixels. Actually, maybe let's make it go down a bit more. So let's go 350 pixels. Okay, so you already see it is stacking. This one, we're going to give it a Z index of minus 2 and a top of 300 pixels. There we go. And then finally, the full circle, which is the top circle. I mean, I could just leave it as it is. In fact, so top 250 pixels. And there we go. We have now completed the challenge. It is absolutely fine if you chose to do the Zend indexes the other way. So use positive numbers or chose different colors or chose a different sort of styling. As long as you've got them stacking to look similar to this, you have passed the challenge. So well done. I hope you've enjoyed this little challenge with me. Let's carry on with our lessons. 
Congratulations, everyone. You have now finished the CSS section of our bootcamp. Next up, it is time to focus on JavaScript. Now, even though we have finished the CSS portion, there will be some extra lessons in the next section too, as CSS and JavaScript are often closely intertwined. For now, I would save the project we have been working on and put it away. While we will go back to it at one point in the course, that part of our learning is now over and we should start up a new project or window in our code editor. JavaScript is considered to have a different way of thinking than CSS and HTML. It can take a while to get used to it and for it to stick. This is why this section is going to have a lot more exercises and projects along the way. Don't worry though, when you understand the way of thinking in JavaScript, it will become second nature to you. Something will just click. Patience and persistence will be key in this section, so please do pause and go over a section again if something is not clear the first time round. Once again, I will be providing code playgrounds for each of the lessons, so if you do start a new section or for some reason your code editor is not working, please use the time-stamped code playgrounds in the descriptions below. Okay, so what are we waiting for? Let's do it, JavaScript. We will be starting off with some basics and moving on to the fun stuff once we get an understanding of the fundamentals first, such as what is a variable, a function, and so on. Okay, now it's time for the JavaScript portion of our course, but what exactly is JavaScript? JavaScript is a scripting or programming language that allows you to implement complex features on web pages. Every time a web page does more than just sit there and display static information for you to look at, you can bet JavaScript is probably involved. It is the third layer of the cake when it comes to standard web technologies, two of which we have already covered are HTML and CSS. JavaScript is not to be confused with Java, which is a completely different language in itself. So to recap, JavaScript is not Java. It is a completely different language. JavaScript is also one of the core technologies of the World Wide Web. This is alongside HTML and CSS. JavaScript essentially allows us to have interactive web pages. So as in the case of the form that we are currently working on, it will allow us to add functionality to that form and send off information for us. What is even more exciting is that we can actually add extra levels or superpowers to our JavaScript code with so-called application programming interfaces or APIs. APIs are ready-made sets of code building blocks that allow a developer to implement programs that would otherwise be hard or impossible to implement. Think of it in a way as Lego blocks. You're building something in Lego and then you suddenly see a whole other part that's already been pre-built for us. We can essentially take that part and put it into our project. That is what an API is in a nutshell. Don't worry, we'll be looking at some real examples of this later on. So in this part of the course, this is going to be the biggest part of the course, as there is a lot to learn. We've already covered the core concepts of JavaScript. Next up, we're going to have a look at variables and then control flow, which includes if statements, for loops, operators, then classes, functions, methods and HTTP. There's a lot to get through. I'm excited. Let's do it. In this section, I want to talk to you about file setup for when working with JavaScript. Let's do it. So up until now, we've only been working with HTML and CSS. This is some boilerplate for our HTML, which we discussed in the previous section. I also have a link to link our style sheet. So our style CSS file, which is here. We have told in our IDE that this is a CSS file by giving it a CSS extension, file extension, and hence we get this little logo right here. Now, how do we get to adding JavaScript? Well, first off, I'm actually just going to make a JavaScript file. I'm going to call it index.js. So JavaScript, JS is for the JavaScript. We are telling our IDE that this is a JavaScript file and enter. And you will see the JavaScript logo shows up, which means this is correct. This has worked. We've got our index.js file. 
Now, if we go back to our index HTML, I can use a script tag. So similarly to how do I did here, I can simply put a script tag like so, so an opening and closing script tag. And then the source of this is going to be my index.js file. Now it is best practice to put the index.js and style sheet in a file of its own or a folder of its own, sorry. So I'm going to make a new directory and call it source. In it, I'm going to put my index.js and style CSS. This might not make sense now, but when it comes to building projects and deploying them onto the internet, it makes sense to have the source folder different to the build folder. So that is how we would do it. This, however, means we get some error messages because before the index HTML file was in the same directory. So the same for the root of our project with the style CSS file, it can't find it anymore because we are telling our index HTML file that the style sheet is here with it in the root. It is not, nor is the index.js. So we need to fix this by going into our source folder and getting the style sheet. And once again, going into our source folder and getting the index.js file. And there we go. We have now fixed the errors. Now, if you do wish to keep your script file in the header, and this is important, so I'm just going to open this up yet, we would have to actually wait for all the HTML to be loaded before applying any JavaScript. So to do this, I would have to add this piece of code, which we will start talking about much later in this lesson. So I'm just going to show you for now, but keep it in mind because we will go back to it. I would have to use a add event listener to listen out for when the content is loaded. So like that. And then once all of our HTML has loaded, then, so DOM content loaded, and only then will we be able to execute any JavaScript. Okay, so that is one approach. It is totally up to you if you use it this way or you can get rid of that and simply move our script tag to be at the very bottom of our body. So in this case, you'd have to remember to write all your HTML above the script tag at all times. Each way is correct. The first one is considered to be maybe a little bit more foolproof, but both work for small projects. Each one is fine. I'm going to carry on by using this approach for this course. Okay, I think we now have the setup down. If you are using the code sandbox like I am, there is a preference that I like to use. If you go into the file and into the preference settings and choose sandbox settings in the prettier settings, I have chosen to essentially get rid of my semicolons. This is a personal preference as well. I don't want the semicolons uh, being added if I save a file. I've also chosen to use single quotes. So these are two of my preferences. This is what you're gonna be seeing in the course. So if you like the way I write it, then please feel free to change these. Or if you don't want to, that's absolutely fine too. The choice is up to you. So that is how you go into it. Once again, it's file preferences, code sandbox settings, and prettier settings. These settings, the prettier settings, will essentially be applied each time you save a file. Great, let's carry on. First lesson of JavaScript, let's go. First up, variables. Okay, so before we get started, I just wanna take a little moment to talk to you about the file structure here. So as previously, we have our index HTML file in the root of our project, meaning it's at the very base of our project. I have then created a directory called source in which I have stored my style sheet. So just like we were working with before when it was just CSS and HTML, however, I have put it in its own folder. And then we have an index.js file in here now too. So this is new. I have named it index and I have told my code editor to treat this as a JavaScript file 
based on the extension. I have put these in a source folder. It might not make sense now. You might think, why am I bothering to do this? However, when it comes to actually deploying what we've built, this is a very important step. I'm not gonna go into it too much now. However, just be aware of that. It is something that we're gonna cover when it comes to deploying our project, okay? So as a recap, make sure that index HTML files always in the root and store your style sheet and index.js files in a source folder. Okay. Let's get to our first lesson of JavaScript. So in JavaScript, you can store values in something called variables. They are legal identifiers. Quite simply, it is this. So the variable x here equals one. It is important to note when you declare a variable, its name must be unique. You can assign numeric value to your variable. So like this number one here. You can also assign a string value. So by string, I essentially mean a word or a number or a Boolean that is in between two quote marks. That makes it a string, an array. So an example of an array would be this. I am opening up my array. So I'm getting these two square brackets and then passing through a string and then another string. That is an array of two strings. We can also store booleans, so true or false. And finally, we can also leave our variables undefined so that we can assign it value later on. Now, by definition, variables means anything that can vary. So let's see this in action. I'm just gonna get rid of all these for now. We're stripping it back to just saying that var x equals the numeric value one. Now let's grab x. So I'm going to grab x and assign it the value 23. Note, we are not declaring it again. So we're not putting var here. X has already been declared up here. We are simply assigning it a new value. And that is the numeric value 23. I'm going to use something that is inbuilt essentially, and that is a console log. So I have not made this up. This is for our use. I'm going to console log the value of x. To view this, I'm going to get my console log up. So in here in our simulated browser, I can click on console in order us to see what is essentially going on in the back. So this is how we would view it. I am seeing that, yes, I'm console logging 23. I can also console log directly, so just hard code something like hello, and that will show up in our browser too. So I'm console logging a string, and I am console logging a numeric value. This is essentially the same as me inspecting the page in the browser. So once again, let's go to Google, similar to our example before, and I'm gonna inspect the page. So once again, control and left click, inspect and click console here. This is exactly the same as what we are simulating in this online IDE. So let's refresh that. Now I can also reassign this another value. So if I click save now, x is now five. You can imagine it as me just taking this value and sticking it on top of here and then on top of here. If I however get this and put it there, and refresh, the value of x is 23. This is because we read JavaScript from top to bottom. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about scope. When defining variables, it is important to know that they have scope. Variables have two types of scope, global scope and function scope. Global scope means that variables can be accessed in our whole JavaScript file right here. And function scope means that the variables can only be accessed inside a function. Let's have a look at this in code. So I'm just gonna get rid of this here. I'm gonna write a function. This function, so this is the first function that you're gonna see, print name, this is essentially the syntax for a function. You tell 
the file that you're writing a function. So once again, I did not make this up. This is how you tell the file that you want to write a function. This, however, I did make up. This is a name that I have chosen to call my function. I've chosen to call it print name. We then open up some parentheses. We do this so we can pass variables into our function and then we use some curly braces. And this is where all the magic happens. So this is where I'm gonna write my code. To invoke the function, we then do that. So just as an example, I'm just gonna put console log hi Anya. And there we go. You will see that because I'm calling my function, I get hi Anya. If I get rid of that, essentially nothing will happen. I need to call the function in order for this to work. Okay, now I'm going to declare a variable. So I'm actually going to say var name and declare this as Anya. Now instead of printing hi Anya here, I want it to print whatever name I want. So I'm just going to pass through the variable like so. So console log hi Anya. If I clear my console log, you will see that that is working. That is because our variable is stored globally. Okay, it can be accessed within this function. I can change this to Chris. I can change this to Rob. This is a great example of a variable having a global scope. However, what if I move this variable to be inside another function? So let's have it here, function print last name. And then let's call our print last name function. And in here, I'm just gonna put console log. Hi name, last name, don't forget a space, let's define last name, so var last name, Decker. Just going to move this over for now. So now we have two functions. This function prints out the first name and the last name. So maybe let's change it to print full name. And this one just prints out the first name. They both work as both of these variables are global. But what if I took this variable and put it only in here? So now just gonna make it more clear which one we are working with. Print name. And this one is print full name. So now print name will pick up hi Rob. This is because the variable is being declared here. However, we are not picking up the name here. You will see in the console log that print full name is simply printing out hi Decker. This is because this variable here now has function scope. We cannot access it in this function. It is scoped to this one only. So I'm just going to move this over for now so you can see everything. So let's recap that again. This variable, so var name, is out of reach for this piece of code. Okay, hopefully you now understand a little bit about global scope and function scope. Let's move on. Now, what is const and let? And how do they differ from var? So when ES6 came in, it introduced two new ways to create variables, let and const. So what is the difference between them and var? Let's focus on let and var first. 
let allows you to declare variables that are limited to a scope of a block statement, unlike var, which defines a variable globally or locally inside a function. I'm going to show you a great example of what I mean by this. I'm just going to move this over. So here we have a function, function find x. You will see that var x is here defined as 1, and then inside these squiggly braces, we declare var x again. We say var x is 2. Now, if I console log x here, it gives me 2. And if I console log x here, it also gives me 2. This is interesting, as I would have expected x here to be 1, as I would have thought that var x here is outside of its scope. However, with var, that is not the case. Let me show you the same thing, but with let. So I'm just going to change this and this to let and click save. You will now see that x in here is 2 and x in here is 1. That makes a lot more sense to me. This is because x here is outside of the scope of here, so x should be 1. So I've written the same function, simply replacing let with var. This is what I mean when let allows you to declare variables that are limited to a scope of a block statement, unlike var, which defines a variable globally or locally inside a function. Hopefully you can see how using var can be very confusing for writing code. This is just one of the reasons that let and const were invented and why var is very rarely used today in professional coding standards. However, it is useful to have this knowledge just in case you see it being used in projects. Now finally, there is const. Const works in the same way that let does in that you cannot access it if it's defined inside a function or block statement. However, it is also constant as the const would indicate. Once you have defined it, you cannot overwrite it later on. This is pretty useful when working with big projects and declaring what you do not want to be changed. Let's have a look at this in our code editor. So for example, here I have const count and I'm just going to put some integer values in here like so. Now, if I get count and try to override it, so I'm just going to put one, two, three, eight. You will see here, count is read only. We cannot override count. If I was to console log out count, you would see this original array, not this one. We cannot override const. Okay, so there we have it. Let's recap. Var declarations are globally scoped or function scoped, while let and cots are block scoped. Var variables can be updated and redeclared within its scope. Let variables can be updated but not redeclared, and const variables can be neither updated or redeclared. Let's have a look at some more examples together. So I'm just going to get rid of this for now. Okay, now time for a little practice question. I'm just going to move that over here and move that back. Here we have two functions, one here and one that has been commented at. Both of these functions will not work as count is not defined, so it hasn't been declared and nor has name. Using either const or let, how do you think we would solve these functions in order for them to work? As a clue, you just need to declare them using const or let here. So have a think about it. Which variable do you think would suit count here? Would it be let or const? Okay, so I'm going to show you now. This function increment essentially takes the count, which is currently zero, and then assigns it the value of whatever count is at that current moment in time plus one. So when we call this function, it should add one to whatever the current count value is. If I choose const, this function will not work. 
This worker's count has already been declared as a const and is read only, meaning we can't reassign it a new value. I would have to make this let. So now, if I console log increment and return the count, I will get the value of one. Great, let's move on. Here we have another function that currently does not work. This is because name is currently not declared. We need to tell our JavaScript whether to use let or const. So here we have a function that uses the name variable. We have written a function. We have called it send text. And then we are simply console logging. Hey, name, you left your bag at my house. And then we are calling that function. So as you can see here, we can't do it at the moment. It is not working. We need to decide whether name Doug is let or const. What do you think it should be? Okay, well, I can tell you that the name Doug, if I choose let, that technically will work. However, it's not the best practice. As the name is not going to change, we are not reassigning a new value. I should be using const because the name will not change. Hey, Doug, you left your bag at my house. OK, so hopefully that has enlightened you a little bit more into the uses of let and const. Once again, we will not be using var from now on. Var has essentially been replaced by let and const with ES6, and we will not be using it from now on. Next up, we're going to learn about control flow. OK, and now it is time to move on to control flow. JavaScript supports a complex set of statements, specifically control flow statements, that you can use to incorporate a great deal of interactivity in your application. This next section provides an overview of all of these statements, so if statements, for loops, and relational operators. Let's start off with if statements. The if statement executes a statement if a specified condition is truthy. If the condition is falsy, another statement can be executed. But what exactly does truthy and falsy mean? To explain this, let's look at falsy first. A falsy value is a value that is considered false when encountered in a Boolean context. JavaScript uses type conversion to coerce any value to a Boolean in contexts that require it, such as conditionals and loops. There are eight falsy values. This is the keyword false, the number zero, the number negative zero, big int when used as a Boolean. Just as a bit of insight, big int is a built-in object that provides a way to represent whole numbers larger than two to the power of 53. It's not really necessary for now, but just keep that in mind. An empty string value, null, so the absence of any value, undefined, and nan, or not a number. This makes it very easy for us to define what is truthy, as it is everything unless it's a falsy. So some typical examples of truthy values are the number two, five, six, basically any number that is not zero or negative zero, strings, the Boolean true, and that's just off the top of my head. As a rule, if it's not one of these eight, you can consider it to be truthy. OK, but enough chat. Let's actually get to learning this with examples of code first. So as mentioned, the if statement executes a statement if a specified condition is truthy. So the simplest example of what I can do to show you this is write an if statement. So if and then whatever I pass through here is truthy, execute this block of code. So I'm just going to put a console log here. It is truthy. Now, I can be very basic about this and simply pass through the Boolean of true. If I pass that through, I am indeed printing out it is truthy. This is because true is truthy. The same for the number three. 
because three as a number is truthy. As you can see here, the console log is printing out. It is truthy. And then I could pass through a string like this. Once again, it has printed out again because this is truthy. Now, I'm just going to delete that, clear our console log. If I pass through a zero and save, well, you've guessed it. Nothing is printing because this is falsy. So we are not executing this because if this is true or truthy, then we execute this line. If it is falsy, well, we do nothing. So once again, if I pass through false, nothing. And if I pass through an empty string, also nothing. I could also do things like this. So if a is bigger than two, console log truthy. And let's set a here. So const a equals the number one. Let's clear our console. Well, a, if a is one, one is bigger than two. That is false. So we do not get anything printed in our console log. However, if I change this to a five, it is truthy. Why? Because five is indeed bigger than two. So this statement is true, or in other words, truthy, and we can print out our console log. So this is great. It's very useful when it comes to programming. There's a lot of if else statements that are used on a daily basis. One other thing that I want to show you is the if else statement. Okay, so if this is true, print out console log. Otherwise, print out it is false. See, okay. So now if I go back to a is one, I am printing out it is falsy. So before nothing would happen, so when we think back to when we didn't have this, nothing would happen. However, we have now giving it an else statement. So if this is true, print out truthy. Otherwise, print out it as falsy. So once again, let's read that. If this is false, then skip that and print out this is falsy. So I'm just going to replace it with actual booleans. If false, it is falsy. And if true, it is truthy. If a is deeply equal to one. So if one deeply equals one, it is truthy. Or if a deeply equals five, well, it is falsy because one does not deeply equal five. This is something we'll go into in a little bit. It essentially means deeply equals because this is not a thing in JavaScript that will not work. We need to either have this or this, but don't worry, we'll leave that for another time. Now, we also have the else if statement. So I'm just going to get rid of this. Get rid of that. Let's have a variable. I'm going to call it const time and set the time as an integer to be 10. Now, if time, just to be clear, this is going to be in 24 hour time. So that's 10 a.m. Or actually, maybe let's make that more obvious. So let's make 14, 14 hours. So 2 p.m. For those of you who don't know 24 hour time, that is 2 p.m. If time is smaller than 12, console log, good morning. And then instead of just an else, I'm going to have a if, I'm going to have an else if time deeply equals 12 console log, oh, it's noon, it is noon, and then else. Now I could have time is larger than 12, or I could just leave it 
like that because we've exhausted all our options if it's not this and it's not that well then we know that it's afternoon okay so as you can see here if the time is currently 14 it is the afternoon and we get a message that says good afternoon now if i change the time to 12 oh it's noon and if i change the time to nine good morning so that is a great example of an if else statement we can really go to town on this so if i really wanted to i could get rid of this and write else if time is larger than 12 and time is smaller than 18 console log good afternoon else console log good evening save that and let's try so once again good morning 12 oh it's noon and then let's get a time between 12 and 18 so 14 good afternoon and then if we go 19 good evening so yes there's a lot of flexibility with this you can go on and on and on there's really no stopping you with an if statement now we have done two things that i haven't discussed yet and that is as mentioned this triple equal sign and the double and we will get onto this this is of course a mathematical operator this means that whatever is on this side is larger than whatever is on the right side and the opposite for here okay so before we carry on i just want to take a moment to talk to you about operators as we have actually seen some in action but you might not know what they were called or how they really work so I'm going to take the time to explain that for you. So there are a lot of different types of operators that we can use in JavaScript. The most basic is the arithmetic operators, then the assignment operators, comparison operators, logical operators, and ternary operators. There are a few more, but these are the main ones, so I'm just going to focus on these. Let's start off with the arithmetic operators first. So the arithmetic operators, well, there's six that you should know and that you can use in JavaScript in order to make your life a lot easier. If you did do maths at school, some of these will be really familiar to you or you might pick them up a little bit easier, but don't worry, I'm gonna go through all of them now. So first up, we have modulus. Well, modulus is simply something that will tell us what the remainder is after we use it. So for example, I could use it in this situation. So I'm just going to show you like a simple mathematical example. If I put through the number five and use modulus three, well, three goes into five exactly once and would we'll leave two as a remainder. So our console log will print out the number two. What do you think will happen if I put a four in? What do you think my console log will spit out? Well, it would spit out a 1. That is because 4 goes into 5 once and would leave one remainder. Let's do something a little bit more complicated. Let's try 20. And great. We would get a 0. This is because 4 fits into 20 exactly 5 times and leaves 0 as a remainder. The use of modulus might not be super clear to you now, but if you try one of my game tutorials, which I'm gonna suggest for you during this course, it should become super obvious as to why I love modulus. I use it in Pac-Man, I use it in Snake, I use it in pretty much all my grid-based games, so please do check them out when the time comes to it. Next up, we have the increment operator. Well, this is something that you might have seen in the for loop. It is simply incrementing a number by one. So in our for loop, you would have seen I plus plus being used. This is the increment operator. I'm going to show you how to use it. I can use it like this. So let's say let count equals four. And then if I got count and used plus plus, and the console logged count, well, 
You'd guessed it. I will get five. This is because we are getting count. So here we have assigned the value four to our variable of count. So here it is four, but then we use the plus plus or the increment operator in order to increment it by one. So when I console log it out here, I would get a five. The decrement operator is pretty much the same. So once again, let's go let count once more. I'm going to get rid of it here. Let count equal 20. Count negative negative. So that's the decrement operator. And if I console log count, I should get 19. Next up, we have unary negation. This simply means that if let x equals 4, and then I console log x, well, I would get a 4. But if I put a negative in front of it, well, I'm simply adding a minus 4 to it. So unary negation is essentially just adding a negative to make something negative, okay? It's, it's really that simple. Now the unary plus, we can use this to essentially turn strings into numbers. So let me show you what I mean by this. So I'm just going to get let y and I'm going to use four, but put it in a string. Now I'm going to console log. It's not liking that console log y. So I'm console logging y as a string. We can tell it's a string because it's a different color to these. It's a string here. We know it's a string because it's in these two quotation marks. But if I put a plus, well, that changes to a number. Okay, so that's a great example of using unary plus. And finally, the exponential operator. This will calculate the base to the exponent power. So once again, let's get Z this time and get a four console log Z. So let's make four to the power of two. I would write four to the power of two like so. And four to the power of two is indeed 16. So that's really it. I don't want to focus too much on this section because this is just, I guess, a math lesson something that you would have learned at school, perhaps, just a sort of recap into how you would use it in JavaScript. So that was pretty swift. If you want to make a note of these, please do. As mentioned, I will be using all of these in the course, so you will get plenty of practice. Let's carry on. Next up, we have assignment operators. An assignment operator assigns a value to its left operand based on the value of its right operand. The simplest assignment operator is essentially this. x equals 4. I have assigned the value of 4 to x. So let's clear that. And let's, I'm going to put a console log down here, console log x. You will see that x is 4. So that's it in its basic state. However, there are a few other assignment operators that I want to show you. Once again, there's a lot more, but these are the most popular ones. So I'm just going to go through them with you. So we've gone over what assignment is. What about addition assignment? Well, addition assignment is pretty cool. It can work like this. So I can get x and use plus equals five. Okay, so let x equal, let's start off with six. What I am saying here is that I am getting six and adding five to it. However, this is not to be confused with this x plus five. So this wouldn't work. We are not assigning anything back to x. If we console log x, x is back to thinking it's six. Right, so this won't work. If you want to essentially write what you would in mathematical sense in JavaScript, you would need to write this. This is essentially the same as writing x equals x plus y. So just keep that in mind. Next, we have subtraction assignment. So I'm just going to clear this for you. Well, it's essentially the same. So I'm just going to comment this out. 
at the moment x is 6 so we're getting 6 if I get 6 or x and use minus equals 5 well you guessed it x will be 1 this is because we are assigning x a new value after we minus 5 from it essentially we are doing that next up we have the multiplication assignment x multiply equals y or let's say 5 will mean that we get 30. once again this is the equivalent of getting x and whatever x is we are getting it and multiplying it by y division assignment is the same we are getting x we're using divide so that is divide and we are assigning the new value of x after we've divided it by 5. So once again, the meaning of this will look like so. Remainder, so this is one of my phase. We're going to use modulus equals 5. We get a 1 because if we put 5 into 6 and r is currently 6, has a value of 6, well, we get a remainder of 1. So once again, this is the same as writing that. This is simply the shorthand for it. And finally, the exponentiation assignment. This would be x equals, say, 5. I'm just going to comment these out so they don't interfere with anything. Let's clear that. And we will get the equivalent of if we wrote this. Okay, so 6 to the power of 5. Great. So those are some of the more popular assignment operators that you will see when you're working with JavaScript. Once again, we will have plenty of time to practice these. I just want to show you them for now. So make a note of them. Hopefully you've got it. I mean, the format is pretty much the same for all of these. So yeah, that's assignment operators for you. Let's move on. Now we're moving on to comparison operators, two of which you've already seen, that is greater than or equal than. I'm going to show you a few more and discuss them in a little bit more detail. So let's do it. A comparison operator operates its operands and returns a logical value based on whether the comparison is true. The operands can be numerical, string, logical, or object values. I'm going to show you what I mean by this exactly. So, each of these is essentially going to return a Boolean response or true or false. So, let's start off with the equal. So, let's go ahead and get our console log up again. I'm going to get x, so let x equal and why don't we go with 20? Sure, why not? The numerical value of 20 is now x for this session. Now, if I want to check if something, so this variable, is equal to something, I would do this. I would get x, and if x equals 20, well, we get true. Let's just clear that so we can see it better. So we're getting true because x, we have x here, does indeed equal 20. Now you may remember me from another lesson saying that this does not exist. If I wrote that, I would essentially be giving x the value 20, and we don't want to do that. This is an assignment operator now. This is how we are writing equals from now on. So if you want to check, this is why it's called comparison operators, if we are checking if x equals 20, does it? We get a true. Does x equal 21? We get a false. Okay, so we're getting Boolean responses. Now, what is also cool about this equal is that we'll pick it up if it's a string as well. So if I pass through a string and pass through a 20, I will get true. So that is pretty cool. Okay, let's move on. Not equal. So let's get our console log out again. I'm going to get x, which we know has the value 20. 
And then I'm going to use something called a bang and an equal sign. Okay, so this bang essentially means not equal. That says not equal. And let's just put a two. So I get the answer true, the boolean of true. This is because x, which we know has a value 20, does not equal 2. So that is true. So we get a true. However, if I put x does not equal 20, well, we'll get a false. Because x does equal 20. This is 20. This is 20. So saying x does not equal 20 would be false. This also works for a string. So it will pick that up as a string. It will know that's still a 20. Despite it being a string, it will recognize it either way. And that will also respond with a false. Deeply equal up next. So this is very similar to equal. Let's just get our console log up again and get x, which we know has the value of 20. Now I could use deeply equal to once again, let's put 20. So once again, our console log will let us know that it's true because this statement is true. X, which we know has the value of 20, does equal 20. However, if I put this as a string, we get a false. This is because unlike equal, deeply equal doesn't just need it to be the same value. It needs it to be the same type as well. So we need this to be a integer value or a number in order for us to get true on this statement okay similarly to straight not equal so let's get our console log up again get our x which has the value of 20 and i could put bang equal equal so that's a bang equal equal and then let's put through a two so again, we know that will be true. Now let's put a 20. Great, we were expecting that to be a false. So in this case, we would get a false, right? Because that is recognizing that it is 20, but it's a string. So it's saying, okay, fine, this is false. And then let's ask ourselves, does 20 as a numerical value not equal 20 as a string value? According to this, it would be false. According to this, however, so let's put this as a string, we would get true. This is because even though our x here is 20, this is 20 as a string. So this is not recognizing the two values to be the same. And we are getting a Boolean response of true. I appreciate this could be quite confusing the first time you see this, but don't worry, with some practice and me just repeating this to you, you will eventually get it. I really do advise you to be coding along with me and trying these out yourself. That is the best way to learn, learn by doing. I'm here to teach you, but you really should be doing this on your laptop as well. Okay, let's move on. Greater than. So this is one that you would have seen in your for loop. I'm going to get our console log. Now we know that the value of x is 20, but let's check what our console log thinks. So let's get x. Is x bigger than 5? True. It is bigger than 5. So that is how greater than works. We can use it to return a Boolean statement based on how we compare it to another integer. We can also do it for greater or equal than. So x is greater or equal than 20. Well, we will get a true because x does indeed equal 20. However, if I did x is bigger than 20, we'd get a false. Okay, because x is not bigger than 20. x is equal to 20. Once again, less than, so let's get our console log up. X is smaller than 20. False. That is because X equals 20. So if I less than or equal to 20, we will get a true. Great. Okay, I think we've covered all of these four 
Now, I think we're ready to carry on. I do understand how it can be confusing because we are dealing with a lot of true and falses and booleans and stuff that you've learned for the first time. So please do take your time with this. Experiment with the numbers. Pass different things through to your console logs. Change X. Go wild. I'll see you in the next lesson. Okay, now it's time to move on to logical operators. So let's do it. Now for this one, I thought I would show you with an example as it's quite a difficult one to get your head around. It is to do with the and, so this is the and, the or, and the not, so the bang. And for this illustration, I've chosen to create an array of fruit. So we know it's an array because we have these two square brackets here and it's assigned to a variable. And then in it, we have three items. We have one string of apple, one string of banana, and one string of grape. Now, I've written an if statement. If fruit, so we get our array, and we use the JavaScript method of includes. So this is a JavaScript method. I did not make this up. It works by us putting an item in its parenthesis. And if the item exists on the array, this statement is true. Okay, so this will come back as true as Apple does exist on our array. And then we are checking if our array also includes banana. And only if both are true. So if this statement is true, and if this statement is true, then we execute this line of code and we get both fruits exist, okay? So that's how AND works. If this code is true and this code is true, then we can execute this line of code. This is one example of how you would use AND in code. If I, however, change this statement to, let's find a fruit that doesn't exist on it, let's put a pear, Let's clear that out. So a pair. So now this statement is true, but this statement is false. Well, I'll just okay. So now this console log doesn't get shown. This code does not get executed. This is because we need both of these to be true. That's what the and does. It wants both of these to be true in order for us to execute this code. Same as, so let's clear this again. So say this one's true, so let's make this apple. And let's change this, so once again, it's now it's showing. But let's change this to, I don't know, coconut. Once again, this will not show. This is because we need both these statements to be true in order to show this code. And that is a great example of the AND operator in action. Now let's have a look at OR. So OR is essentially these two lines here. Let's talk through the code. So here we have the same piece of code. However, we are checking for coconut and we are checking if coconut exists in our fruit array. Well, it doesn't. So we know this is false. This is a false statement. However, this one is true. And we are seeing our code. That's how all works. If at least one of these is true, then we execute the code. If both were false, so let's put peach. And then let's put pear. So now you will see that this code does not execute. This is because this is false and this is false. So we don't execute the code. We need at least one of them to be true. We need one to be true. That's what the or is. So we need this one or this one to be true in order to execute the code. And finally, 
Let's move on to not. So not is like the bang that we saw previously. By putting a bang here, I'm essentially saying, so we know that cherry doesn't exist on our fruit array. We can't see it. So we know that this statement is false. If I got rid of this, this would be a false statement and we wouldn't see anything in the console log because this is false. So we don't get any message showing up. However, by putting a bang in front of it, it turns it to true and we see the code. So that is how not works. Please, once again, have a go at this yourself. It is a lot to get your head around. I hope this example has made it a little bit clearer because I know there's some very confusing explanations out there. I think doing it with an example is always best. If you want, try also maybe console logging out. So this is something that I would find useful. So I would console log out this. And then perhaps the second one too, just to see what exactly is happening behind the hood. So we've console like this one. This says false. We've console log this one. This one's true. So we're not going to get the code. We need both of them to be true in order to get this code. Okay? So there we go. Just to make it a bit clearer, perhaps let's put first statement. Let's clear this out a bit. And then put second statement. So yeah, you will see the first statement is false and the second statement is true. We need both to be true in order to see the code. So that is why it's not working. Okay, I hope that was clear. Like I said, please do practice these uh, to get your head around them. I do have plenty of tutorials on this. I will get around to sharing them as soon as I can. I just need to go through a few other things with you first. And lastly, we have the ternary operators. So let's check them out. The ternary operator is essentially another way of writing an if statement. It is a little bit more on the advanced side, but I do think that I should cover it now. However, feel free to make a note of it and perhaps use it when you're a little bit more comfortable with if statements. If statements are great. I just want to show you a shorthand that exists as I would hate to not show you. I think this knowledge is important, but just know that it exists. Don't worry too much about implementing it for now if you don't want to. So the ternary operator allows you to simplify your conditional logic into one nice, simple one-liner. What I mean by this is that I can take one, two, three, four, five lines of code and put it into one. First off, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about what is happening here. This is an if statement. I have set is game over. So let's just pretend we're playing a game here. Uh, the game is currently not over, so game over is false. I have set is game over to false. I have assigned it the value false. So if we go to our if statement, if is game over equals true, so the game is over, you know, you've lost, the console log will say, sorry, you lost. Otherwise, we console log carry on playing. So at the moment, game over is false, hence we're getting the message carry on playing. If I then change it to true, we get, sorry, you lost. Easy. Now let's get to writing this in one line of code thanks to ternary operators. I would do this like this. So, is game over? I'm just going to comment that out for now. Is game over? Question mark. If game is over, I want to console log. Sorry, you lost. Otherwise, console log. Carry on playing. Okay, so I'm just going to move this over so we can see it all. I'm essentially asking, so the question mark here, is game over? Okay, 
is game over. And if it's true, sorry you lost. Otherwise, carry on playing. I can also change it to false. So now we know that this is false. Is game over? Well, it's not. So carry on playing. Let's change this back to true. Sorry, you lost. I could essentially also just use true or false. But it's not really seen to be done this way. It's usually a variable that has a Boolean value that is used to determine the outcome, whether it's this one or this one. But I just think that's a pretty cool way. I really liked Henry operators. I'm just going to put it back there so you can see it. I think it's really readable for a developer as well. You're literally asking yourself, is the game over? Well, we know it's true. So return this. Otherwise, return that. Once again, is the game over? Question mark. Well, yes, it is true. So return this one. But if it wasn't, we would return that one right there. And there we go. That's ternary operators in a nutshell. Don't worry if you don't want to use them and you're more comfortable using if-else statements. Like I said, this is something that perhaps is a bit more advanced. So feel free to skip this lesson if you wish. The this bus challenge is one that is considered to be a favorite for software developers to be interviewed on in a tech interview situation. It is for this reason that we are going to go through it now together based on all we have learned so far in our JavaScript portion of the bootcamp. The FizzBuzz challenge will practice your knowledge of if statements, loops, and operators. It is no wonder why this is such a favorite on the tech scene. If you do not manage to finish the challenge, don't worry. That is what I'm here for, and we will go through the answer together. However, please do get your laptop out and definitely have a go with me. Now, I'm going to leave you with a quick exercise, and it's called the Fizz Buzz exercise. This is a popular one that you will see in a lot of coding interviews, so it's one to definitely be aware of. The rules of Fizz Buzz are as follows. Start with the number one and count upwards. If any number is divisible by three, it is replaced by the word fizz and any number divisible by five by the word buzz. Also, numbers divisible by 15 become fizz buzz. Using an if statement, I want you to have a go at writing this. So just to help you out, if I was to speak out what this if else statement should do, I would say something like this. If number divisible by three console log fizz else if number divisible by five console log buzz else if number divisible by 15 console log fizz buzz else console log number okay so hopefully that's helped i want you to have a go at doing this yourself don't worry if you don't get it we'll go through the answer together Okay, so hopefully you've had a go at that. If not, don't worry. Let's have a go at writing the solution together. So if number, now I'm gonna use something called modulus for this. Modulus is a mathematical operator that essentially will allow us to divide a number by any number. And if there is no remainder, then we know that the number is divisible purely by that number. This is something that we covered in the previous lesson, so please do go ahead and go back if you need that refresher. Let's go back into here. If number divisible by three and the remainder deeply equals zero, console log fizz. I'm gonna start all off with number zero, that number equals zero. Else if number modulus five deeply equals zero console log buzz else 
okay number modulus 15 deeply equals zero so there's no remainder it's divided by 15 and it leaves no remainder console log fizz buzz else console log number okay so there we go let's start counting one so one two three oops three fizz four so four five buzz and let's move on a little bit let's do a 15 15 we're getting a fizz okay so this is a problem as we are passing through 15 and it gets stopped here because 15 is divisible by five and leaves no remainder so we get a buzz so what we need to do is swap these out so i'm just going to put this one up here instead and then put this one at the bottom and then just put fizz buzz and have fizz so let's start again number 15 fizz buzz good number five buzz good number three fizz let's put 30 fizz buzz fantastic okay this is looking really good I'm really pleased with how this went. One thing that we can do is actually create a for loop to actually print out all the numbers for us, which is a great segue as for loops are up next. See you in a bit. So next up, we have for loops. For loops are a really neat part of JavaScript that allows us to execute a block of code as many times as we want. I'm going to show you how to do this now. So a super simple example and the syntax for a for loop goes like this. You start out writing the for and then you need to start with something. So we're going to declare i, let i equals zero because we want to start from zero. And then as long as i is smaller than, so here we essentially input a number I want to put in a number that will tell our code how many times we want to execute the block of code. So let's go ahead and put 10, semicolon, and then I++. So this is the syntax for a for loop. We will then put the code we want to execute right here. So I'm just going to console log I for now. And already, bam, in our console log, you will see Let's clear that so we can see it a little bit better. You will see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Now you might notice that I have put through 10 here. However, we are starting from 0. So this means that we are counting 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. But we have essentially executed something 10 times. Okay? Now, the great thing about a for loop is that I can essentially print out the same thing or I could customize it based on the count. So, for example, I can have something like and then the word beer on the wall. So, we would start from zero beers on the wall, one beer on the wall, and so on and so on. Or I could have I plus one, I'm just gonna clear that. One beer on the wall, two beer on the walls, three, four, five, all the way to 10 beers on the wall, beers on the wall. And there we go. That is essentially our for loop. Let's move on to talking a little bit about for loops with if statements. So you might notice here that one beers on the wall doesn't really make sense. Let's change that with what we learnt about if statements. So in here, I can essentially do something like this. If i equals one console log, and then I'm just gonna console log beer on the wall. However, we don't want one, we want zero because as you know, we are counting from the number zero. 
and then else console log beers on the wall. Let's save that, refresh, and now you will see that if I equals zero, so the first item, so the first time we are looping, console log one beer on the wall, else console log beers on the wall. So that is one example of how to use for loops with if statements. Now, I think you can already guess what I'm going to try and make you do. It involves the FizzBuzz challenge and this for loop. So, similarly to how we got our FizzBuzz game working, however, we had to manually type out the value for number, so replace it with one, two, three, four. I want you to write a for loop that will essentially go through all the numbers of FizzBuzz for us, printing out the correct words if a number that is divisible by 3, 5 or 15 is met. So I'm going to leave that for you here. Here is our FizzBuzz challenge again and its answer. I want you to write a for loop that will execute this code up to the number 100. Have a go at this. If you don't get it, don't worry. I'm going to go through the answer too. Okay, so let's go through the answer. Well, the first thing that I know is I don't want to declare this number right here. I'm going to write a for loop. So once again, let's get the syntax of the for loop. For let num equal zero. So we're starting out with the number zero. I could keep this as i. If you've kept it as i, that is fine. It just means that we need to replace all of these with i too. If i equals zero, and as long as i is smaller than 100, increment i by one. And essentially, I can now put all of this code in here. However, we don't want to start at zero. Let's actually start from one. So we can do that either by starting from one here and changing that to 101. So there we go. We have now done it. Let's start from the beginning. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's check for 15. Yep. And so on, all the way to 98, 99, 100. So that is one way that I would do it. Or if you wanted to, I'm just going to change this back. You could have done i plus 1, i plus 1, i plus 1. I plus one. And then don't forget to put these. So I'm just gonna make sure that that is read together. Let's refresh. And once again, one, two, fizz, four, buzz, fizz, fizz, buzz, 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 fizz, buzz, all the way to 98, 99, 100. Okay. Well, that was fun. As I mentioned, this is quite a popular question that pops up in coding interviews. So I really would take the time out to understand it, perhaps do it a few more times to really get to grips with for loops and if statements. Make a note of it. Otherwise, let's carry on. Now, before we move on, I want to take a moment to talk a little bit more about arrays as we are starting to see them in our for loops and functions. So, arrays. The JavaScript array class is a global object that is used in the construction of arrays, which are high-level list-like objects. What I mean by list-like is this. So, here we have an array. I'm going to call it books. And I'm going to open up my array. So, this is the syntax for an array. And in it, I'm going to have a list of books. So, Moby Dick, Life. Life of Pi and then Sapiens. So that is my array of books. That is it. That's as simple as it gets. We can also store numbers. So let count equals one, two, three, four. We can also store 
booleans. So results, pass results maybe, pass results. Even though I'm not sure you would see something like this, you can store booleans too. False, true, true, false. Okay, so that is three examples of arrays. Let's use the first one to continue. Now, with arrays, we can find out the length of an array by simply grabbing the array. So I've grabbed the array, I've grabbed the whole thing and using a JavaScript method of length. So I've not made this up, okay? This is a JavaScript method that will allow us to get the length of the array. So what do you think it's gonna come back with? It's console log. Three. This is because there are three items in my array. Now I can also do this, which is quite cool. I can go into my array. So I'm going into my array. And then if I pass through a zero, because as we know, arrays start from zero, I will get Moby Dick. If I pass through a one, I will get Life of Pi because in my books array it is zero, one. It's got a one index position. And then I can always pass through a two, and I'll get sapiens. If I pass through a three, however, I will get undefined, as there is no fourth item in my array. I can also add stuff, remove stuff to my array, but that is something that we'll do in a later lesson. For now, all you need to know is that an array looks like this, we can access items from our array by index, and we can also get the index length by using a JavaScript method of length. Cool. Now let's learn a little bit more about loops with arrays. So I'm gonna actually get my books back. Let's actually get the books back like so. Let's say we have a lot more books in here. So I'm just gonna add a few more. The Hungry Caterpillar New Earth and a Dictionary. So there's a few books in there now. Say we have a lot more in there and you're working at a shop and they want you to find if there is a certain book in your inventory. Well, we can use a for loop to do this. I would do so like this. So I would grab our for loop. Once again, let i equals zero. And then as long as i is smaller than the book's length, so this is where this comes in very handy indeed, because we don't know how long this is. Say it goes on forever and ever and ever and is always changing. It's quite nice to have something like this so that this updates no matter how long the book array is. And then we increment i. Now, if books, and then we can go into the array. So what I'm doing by passing an i is I am passing through a zero. So I'm going into the books array and getting this value. And then I'm going into the second item and getting this value and so on and so on. So I'm just looping over. If that value deeply equals, and let's say we are looking for the book Sapiens, we could just console log true. Okay, so yes, Sapiens does exist in our array of books. How about another book? Let's try James and the Giant Peach. And we don't get anything, so else console log false. So now we get a false, as that book does not exist. We could also do something like this. So for example, say sapiens existed not just once, but we had a few sapiens in our inventory. So now, if books equals sapiens,
count equals count plus one. And then let's store count up here. We're not actually going to assign it anything, or we could start with zero. It's up to us. Else, nothing. So we can actually get rid of that. So now, I'm just going to console log count. Actually, I'm going to console log count here, just so you can see what is happening. I'm also going to console log out each book. So you will see here we have three books. It's counting those going one. We're adding to the count. The count is then changed to one. Then it's changed to two. Then it's changed to three. And it's stopped because we have found three books and we have finished our loop. I'm also going to console log out book I. I'm going to do it up here. So before the if statement, books I. And you will see all the books being printed. Okay, so as it's checking, it's checking Moby Dick, that does not equal sapiens, so we don't add one to the count. It's checked Life of Pi, that does not equal sapiens, so we don't add to the count. It's checked sapiens, ah, oh, it matches, so we add one to the count, and so on and so on. So every time we hit sapiens, it adds one to the count. So that is a great example of a real life use case for a for loop with an if statement and working with arrays. I'm going to show you one last example before we move on. Okay, so I'm going to take a quick break before we carry on with array work to talk to you about objects. We're going to create our first object in JavaScript. So objects. Objects are essentially the main unit in object-oriented programming. In this section, I'm going to show you how to make your first object in order for us to work with it in the next section. So what I mean by object is this. I'm going to make a const user. Okay, so just like we did with any variable at all, I've got our user. I declared it as a const. Now, instead of just typing straight away here, I would open up our curly braces to start creating our first object. Now, objects work in a key value sort of way. So I would get a key, for example, a name. Some people like to call this a property. Some people like to call it a key. It is totally up to you. And then we get a value. So as you've guessed, this is going to be my user object. And the first property or key has the value of Ania. So this is the syntax for writing objects. You would have the key or property and then have the colon followed by the value and then a comma if you want to have another a key and value. So I'm just going to fill this out a little bit more. And what else can I have? I don't know, pets? dog. I don't really have a dog. I wish I had a dog. Okay, so that is my first object. If I didn't have a comma, I would get squiggly lines. So that is why the commas are important. This is the syntax for an object. So we've made our first object. Now I can store anything I want in this, okay? So I can store strings as values. I can store booleans as Value. So I can have pets, true, I do own pets, even though sadly it is false. Uh, last name is a string, integers, whatever we want. I can even have an object within an object, but let's not get into that for now. So that is my first object. Now, I can actually access values by grabbing properties with dot notation of my object. So if I console log my object, just going to console log the user because that is what I've stored my object as. And here we go. I get the user name, last name, and my pets. Okay. Now, what if I just want to access my name, my first name? I would do so by grabbing the property. So I'm going to grab that. I want the name. And then using dot name. 
And that's it. If I want the last name, I would get the property of last name to return the value. And once again, pets false. So that's quite cool. However, I can also have an array of objects, okay? That is where accessing things gets a little bit more complicated, but let's cover that in the next lesson. Okay, let's look at these objects, this time in arrays. Let's carry on. So here we have an array. This array is different to the ones you've seen before. It is still an array, however, it's an array of three objects. What I mean by objects is this. That is one object, that is a second object, and this is a third. In my object, which I'm going to think of as a user object, I have a username of the user with a string, the follower count with an integer, and then a Boolean value for if that user is followed or not. Okay, so once again, we know it's an array because we open up these square brackets and then we have three items in it. They're just a little bit more complicated. We have an array of three objects rather than three strings or three integers or three Boolean values. However, we're going to treat it exactly the same. So just a little bit of a heads up before we start working with this array. We can still access values in the array. So I'm just going to console log. I'm going to move up a bit. I'm going to console log our users because it's called users. And if I console log the first user, you get the full object. Okay. So if I open it out a bit, you get the username, the followers count, and the is followed. And it is mode 244. So that is looking correct. Now, if I then want to access, let's say, just the username, or just the follower count, or just the is followed, I would get the key. So the key of username. So now I get the string mo244. If I just get the key of followers, I will get the value of 34. And if I do is followed, I will get the value, which is a boolean of false. Great, let's carry on. Now, I want to write an if now, I want to write a for loop that will essentially loop over all my users and only send them a message if we follow them. So if is followed is true. How do you think we would do this? Pause here and have a think about it, and I'll see you in a bit. Okay, so this is how you would solve it. We would, of course, start off with writing the syntax for our for loop. So let i equals zero. And as long as i is smaller than the user's length, so once again, I am getting the user's array. I'm getting this, and I'm getting its length. So we know that this value will be the integer of three, as there are three users, and we increment i by one. Now, if users, and then I'm looping over each user, remember, so I'm looping over, I'm going to the first one, the second one and the third one. So I could just replace it with I. If that users is followed deeply equals true, well then we send them a message. What? Hi. Long time no speak. And then if it is false, well, we do nothing. So let's hit save and great. I'm just going to clear that. So we follow two users because is followed is true for Angela and is followed is true for sexy Rick. So we should see the console log message printed twice. And that is correct. Hi, long time no speak. If we really want to personalize this, we could do something like that. So hi users once again we go into the first object and get the username 
plus long time no speak. So there we go. Hi, Angela Boo. Long time no speak. Hi, Sexy Rick 21. Long time no speak. So this is quite an interesting example, as I'm pretty sure this is on the basis of what some of the LinkedIn scrapers do when they essentially take your first name and then send you a message or an ad request. So it's quite useful to show you this example. I hope that was helpful. I hope you're really learning more and more about, you know, for loops with arrays and if statements. I think we're now ready to carry on. Okay, so we've made it quite far into the introductory part of our JavaScript course. We've covered variables, if statements, objects, but we haven't really talked in depth about functions. We've seen a function, sure, but we really haven't gotten to grips with what exactly the best practices are, how to pass parameters, and what exactly a function is. So let's do that now. So as a reminder, we have seen a function already. We used it before. The syntax for a function looks a little bit like this. We will get the word function to let our IDE know that we want to write a function. We will then choose a name of our choice to call this function. So for example, I'm going to choose to say send text. So I've chosen to call my function send text. The function is doing something it's going to send a text, hence we have written it this way. Most functions usually start with uh, send, get, anywhere that indicates doing something. So send text is perfect. We will then open up our parenthesis and then get our curly braces and write our block of code that we want to execute when we call the function like so. Okay. So this is standard, this is your standard function. Now, when choosing a name that you wanna call your function, make sure that it is in camel case. What I mean by this is that the first word starts with a small letter and the second starts with a capital letter and so on and so on. This is for readability for your fellow developers so that they can read your code a lot better. It's considered best practice and I agree. I, I tend to quite like this, this kind of format. So make a note of that camel case for naming functions. And this is just a best practice. It won't break your code or anything, but you know, it's good to have. Okay, so we have our function here. Now, we want to essentially execute something. So I've been using console log a lot. That's because we haven't actually started working with the browser yet. I'm just going to use console log again here. I'm going to try not to use it from now on. But for now, I'm just going to write console log. And let's send a text saying, Hey, Bobby. Do you want to hang out? So now when we call our function or when we execute our function or invoke our function, whatever you want to say, we get the message at our console log that says, hey, Bobby, do you want to hang out? Without calling it, nothing happens. However, with calling it, we get the code to execute. We've already discussed global variables, so I can actually put a global variable up here that says Bobby or the string Bobby and take Bobby out here. So I'm going to close off the string, add the variable of name. And I've essentially replaced Bobby here in the sentence with a variable of name. So now I can easily change the name up here. So there you go, Danny, Amy, whatever you like. Great. Now you might be wondering what these parentheses are for. They are for passing through parameters into your function. So instead of declaring a global variable up here, 
I can essentially reuse my function and then pass through the parameter of name. So let's pass through Bobby. So I pass through Bobby into my function. I pass through the string of Bobby into my function. So I've essentially passed through a name that I then want to appear here. And there we go. So this approach is useful as it allows us to, check this out, reuse code. So now if I go like that, I can literally write Bobby, Danny, Amy, I don't know, Farouk. And I can essentially reuse this to message all these people just by passing through their name into the function. So that is pretty cool. I'm spamming people to find out if they want to hang out with me. And I could repeat this over and over again, reusing this code. So that is pretty awesome. That is a great example of why functions are so useful. They are reusable. So now I've shown you an example of how to reuse a function, but also how to pass parameters into a function too. I can pass not just one parameter, but two parameters. So I can pass through a time which means I can spam people and ask them to hang out with me at different times. So there we go. I'm just going to pass through different times. Hey, name, do you want to hang out at? And then let's put the time here and close that off again so it's correct. And there we go. I've sent messages to Bobby asking him to hang out at 10, Danny to hang out at 8, Amy to hang out at 5, and Farouk to hang out at 1, simply by reusing this function and passing through two parameters. Okay, I'm going to ask you to actually have a go at this again by yourself. So I'm just going to clear this. Let's write a function, and this function I want to send reminder. Okay, so once again, this is the syntax for a function, send reminder. I am writing the function, so I'm telling my IDE that this is a function. I've named it send reminder, and this is the syntax for a function, and then I am calling the function here. I want you to pause here and have a go at sending a reminder using the console log to four people that their meeting is at X time. So just like we did before, but just have a go at doing this yourself. I'm going to pause here while you have a go at doing this. Don't worry if you don't get it. I'm going to go through the answer with you soon. Okay, so hopefully you've had a go at that. If you haven't, don't worry. I'm going to go through the answer with you now. So what do we want our message to be? Well, we want our message to be dear name. So plus name. Your meeting is at, and then let's do time. Okay, so... Once again, let's actually pass through a name here. So Freddy, and then three. Let's also send a reminder to, so Danny, Olivia, Hannah, Freddy, Danny at four, Olivia at five, and Hannah at six. Okay, so we've done that. And the last thing we need to do is actually pass through the variable. So I can name this whatever I want. I can name this glob. It really doesn't matter. It's just saying that whatever the first thing that we pass through is, is what I want that to be in here. Okay, so there we go. That will work too. Obviously, if we put the time in, so if I put three here, well, it would read, dear three, you have a meeting, your meeting is at, your meeting is at Freddy. And that wouldn't make sense. So the order of which you pass these through at is super important. Let's just change that back for you. 
Okay, I'm also going to change this back because that doesn't make sense. And there we go. Feel free to make a note of this. Otherwise, if you're comfortable with functions, let's carry on with some more examples. Okay, so I'm just going to get rid of that. Let's clear this. I just want to show you one more thing about passing through parameters. So we can have global variables. So let's just write another function. Let's make it show alert. And then once again, let's call our function here. I'm going to write in console log name you, or let's just say wake up. Now we can have global variables, so let name equals Anya, in which case we don't need to pass through the name into here or here, okay? This is a global variable and no matter how many times I invoke or call the function, it will just use Anya as the name, okay? This is great as it allows us to store things in our file as well. So I'm just gonna invoke it once. I could do something like this. Anya, wake up. This is your count alarm. So this is very much like most of my mornings. I have multiple alarms. Now I'm going to put let count up here. I'm going to start off as zero. Or actually, let's start off as one. So the first time that I call this function, I get a message say, Anya, wake up. This is your one alarm, or maybe alarm number. That makes more sense. This is alarm number one. And I could actually put afterwards count plus equals one. So now if I call the function once, so let's get rid of that, I'll call the function, and you wake up, this is alarm number one. If I call the function again, and you wake up, this is alarm number two, again, and so on and so on and so on and so on. So this time we are not passing through a different variable into each function. However, I am using the function to essentially add to my count, which is a global variable. Okay, so each time I'm executing this function, I am adding to a global variable, which is the count. Okay, so I've executed this function three times, so our count is three. As you can see here, our count is three. So that is just another example of how you can use functions. So I am invoking the function in order to update a global variable. Okay, let's move on. Okay, now it's time for a little exercise. So I hope you're excited. It's gonna use everything that we learned so far about functions in order to move something on the browser. So as I promised, I'm finally gonna introduce some browser work. We're not just gonna be using the console log from now on. So let's do it. Okay, so here we have a function. Our function here is called move Bob. And instead of simply calling the function, I've attached our function to an element that we have taken from our HTML and I've added an event listener to it. Don't worry if this seems like a lot. I'm going to talk you through everything now. Our goal by the end of this exercise is to move Bob to the right. You can see that's where he's looking every time we click his face. Okay, so I'm just going to talk you through this a little bit now. Up here, I'm essentially using document and query selector. So I have not made these up. Okay, these are 
ways of essentially picking out. So I'm getting my HTML document and I'm using query selector. This is a JavaScript method that will allow me to look in my HTML and look for the class name indicated by this dot right here. I'm looking for the class name of face and I'm then storing that element as Bob for our JavaScript file. So if we go into here, if we look into our HTML, I'm essentially looking for this div with the class of face that has all these other divs inside of it. Okay, so if I select the div face, it's going to take the face, but it's also going to take both eyes and the pupils too. I have styled them up for you. It's nothing too crazy. It's just some simple circles, essentially, that make up my face. So that's how we do it. I am storing the element or the class of face as Bob. Next, I'm getting that element. So here's Bob. I'm getting that element and I'm using a JavaScript method of add event listener to listen out for any time we click. So once again, I've not made this up. This is a set thing that we pass into event listener. There's many, many more. Click is just one of them. I could do hover. I can do so many. So it's going to listen out to any time we click on the element with the class name of face, or in other words, Bob, as we have stored it for this file. And if we do click on the div or the class of face or Bob, then we execute or call the function move Bob. Okay. Don't worry if this is a lot. Essentially, all you need to do is write the function Bob in order for us to move Bob to the right. Okay, now what do you think you should do in order to move Bob to the right? It has something to do with storing a global variable. Okay. You will also have to get the style of Bob and move him to the left. So this is something that I would suggest you have a pause at here. Go do some research. I'm going to leave this up for you here. Okay, so have a look at that. If you want to have a look at the index HTML, all I've done is added that in. So I'm going to make this bigger for you so you can see in case you want to take it. I'm going to put all of these in the description below so you can have a go at them yourselves too. Okay, so that is in my index HTML. That's all I've done. I've put in the face with all these divs. Feel free to copy that. I have then linked to my style sheet and then styled it up. Okay, so here is the style sheet. Just in case you want to take it, please feel free. I am going to also include this code in the description, but if you just want to take it down now, here is what I have in my style sheet. So I've styled the body with a background color. I've also got the face. I've given it a position absolute. This is going to be important because we need to know exactly where the face is on our screen. We're going to have the background color and then I made it a circle. So the face is a circle thanks to the height, the width and the border radius. And I've also given it some margin left on top. Next, we have the eye container. So this is to hold the two eyes and make them display in line instead of stacked over each other, as is the default for divs. And then next up, I have the eye itself, which is a white circle with some margin and the pupils too. Okay, so that is the style sheet. Let's go back to our index.js. Okay, I'm just going to minimize that for now and give us plenty of room for Bob to move. So this is a great exercise for Googling because there will be some Googling involved in this. As a reminder for this exercise, we are going to be practice what we learned with functions. So you will be storing a global variable. However, there will be one aspect that you need to Google, and that is how to essentially style an element. So the div with the class of face using our JavaScript. Okay, so that is a clue. 
I'm gonna leave you here. Don't worry, this is quite a tough exercise considering you're new and you've never worked like this before. I really wanted to throw you in the deep end with this because don't worry, I'm obviously here. I'm gonna show you the solution in a bit. So let's pause here, have a go at doing this yourself. Hopefully find some interesting solutions online and I'll see you soon. Okay, so let's go through the solution. Well, first off, let's just start out by console logging. That's what I would do. Let's just go say hi. So now just check that everything's working correctly. If I click on the face, just open that up. Okay. Yeah, I get a console log that says hi. So let's go ahead and click that again. For some reason it's not working very well. I think you need to view it in the browser. So let's go ahead and inspect. Get our console log up. And great. So every time you click on the face, you will get a hi. So our function is working. This is looking great. Oh, it seems to be working in here now too. The next thing I want to do is actually just move Bob. So I'm going to move Bob, Bob, and then I would use something called style and then left. So by writing style, I'm essentially saying that I want to access the styling of Bob and I want to add something to the property of left. So if I just go ahead and write 100 pixels as a string, that is essentially the same as me going in here and writing left 100 pixels, okay? So that is the same, but I'm doing it from JavaScript. So now let's go ahead and save that. If I click on Bob, let's go ahead and do that in here. Click on Bob. What well, is moved 100 pixels to the right? See, there we go. That seems to be working. However, I do want Bob to keep moving 100 pixels each time we click him. For this, we're gonna have to use our global variable. So once again, I'm not sure why it's not working in here. Oh, there we go. So it's moved 100 pixels. There we go, 100 pixels. So now, let's actually declare a variable. So let's declare let count. I'm going to put zero. Now, each time we click Bob's face, I want to get the count. And I'm going to use our plus equals operator to add, let's say, 50. OK, so now instead of passing through 100, I'm going to pass through count plus pixels. So now if I console log count, let's refresh the page, here we go, 50. So I've got 50, my count is 50. So I'm adding 50 to the left. Click again, oh, 100. That means I'm adding 100 to Bob's left. 150, 200, and so on. All the way until Bob goes, bye Bob. Bob goes off our screen, okay? So that is a great example of how a global variable can let us accumulate a value in a function. There we go. Once again, we've done it. Okay, so I hope that was useful for you. I hope you enjoyed working with a browser a little bit more and not just using a console log. I'll see you in the next section. Okay, now before we move on, I just want to show you something extra about functions. I wouldn't worry about it too much for now. Just understand what we have learnt with functions. But I do think it's important to show you this example because you might hear about it while you're learning and I don't want you to get confused. Okay, so here we have a function. What I have done here is essentially use document and query selector. Query selector and documents are things that I did not make up. This is a JavaScript method that will look for the body, 
So I'm literally looking for the body element and saving it as body. Now I've written a function that is called speak. So I've chosen to call it speak. I have told our document this is a function and I have chosen for our console log to print greetings. Okay, so that's all our function is doing. Now down here, I have taken the body. So I've taken literally the body of our browser here and added another JavaScript method of add event listener. Now I've passed through click. Once again, I have not made this up. This is something that the event listener takes and then the function speak. So now this means that each time I click the body, just refresh that, I will get greetings pop up in our console log. This is because we clicked the body and because we clicked the body, our event listener is listening out for this and invokes or calls the function speak. Okay, so that is what is happening here. Don't worry too much about it for now. I've just explained this for you because I want to show you how you can write functions another way or how you might see functions written. So this is just the standard function that we're going to be working with for this course. However, it is important to know that I can also write a function as a function expression. What this means is I would store it as a const. So I would say const speak and then use function here. I'm not going to pass through anything because we're not passing through anything to work with. And then I would say console log greetings. Okay, I'm just showing you this in case you see it written this way. This way is fine too. It's just not the way that we're going to be using for this course. I don't really see many people write uh, functions this way, but hey, it's important for you to know. So let's check it out. Let's click the body. And yeah, everything is working fine. Now, a way that is more popular and one that I like to use uh, occasionally is using the function expression, but with an arrow function. What this means is that instead of writing function like so, I would get rid of the word function and then simply put an arrow function here. Okay, so that is just a, another way of writing function. It's just syntax. If you like it, go ahead and use it. But like I said, I would recommend sticking to this. That is what we're going to be using in this course. This is perhaps maybe you see it in a bit more advanced project, but it's still valid. OK, so this is a function expression using an arrow function. Now, the reason that this has changed is just simply because this is how functions have evolved with time. People like to, you know, make things shorter and shorter as we uh, can see in many of our daily situations. So this is just uh, an example of that. OK, that's all I wanted to tell you for this course. Like I said, please do keep using this. I just wanted to show you that for now. Now, I'm going to talk about the while loop, which is different to the for loop, and I'm going to tell you why. The while loop essentially loops through a block of code as long as the specified condition is true. What I mean by this is this. So while, this is the syntax, so it's similar to an if statement. While this in here is true, we execute this. So I'm just going to put beers on the wall again. And then I'm going to put I here. OK. Now I'm going to use some of the stuff that we discussed before. So I am going to get let i equal zero. Now, while i is smaller than 100, OK, so as long as i is smaller than 100, so we already know this is true. While that is true, print out I beers on the wall. So you already see some stuff happening here. It's going crazy. I mean, it's already counting a lot because it's not stopping. I is constantly zero and that's what it's executing. It's executing. We need to really stop this. Otherwise, okay, yeah, we've reached an infinite loop. So if I is smaller than 100, print out 
zero beers on the wall, but also get I an increment by one, okay? Which means that by the time this is run, I is no longer zero, it's now one. One is smaller than 100, true. Print out one beers on the wall and then increment again. So let's see this in action now. Let's refresh the page. So I just had to restart my IDE as that infinite loop broke everything. But there we go. Okay, so now as long as I is smaller than 100, print out beers on the wall and the number. And there we go. All the way to 99 beers on the wall. As you know, we start from zero. Oh, cool. Okay, so that is just a, another sort of cool way to loop using the while loop. So as long as this statement is true, execute this block of code over and over and over again until it is not true anymore. Okay, so say it with me. While it lets you execute a block of code as long as a statement is true and it will do it over and over and over until the statement is not true anymore. And there we have it, ladies and gentlemen, the while loop. Okay, now it's come to that time in the tutorial where I want to talk to you about built-in objects. JavaScript has built-in objects. Date, math, string, array, and object. Each of these, so each of these five, have special purpose properties and methods associated with it. This is the funnest part about JavaScript. I think it really allows us to be creative with our arrays, strings, and so on. So I can't wait to show you what I mean by what I've just said. Let's do this with some examples. Okay, so here we have a JavaScript property that we can use on a string or an array, and it is length. You would have seen it before when we were doing the for loop. We used it to figure out exactly how long our array is. But you can also use length on strings. So I'm just going to show you what I mean by this. Let's get a const word and let's make our word be banana. Now if I console log the word, well, of course, we'll get banana. But if I add the property of length to my variable, well, I will get six. This is because banana has one, two, three, four, five, six letters. Okay, so that is a very basic way in which you can use length to figure out the length of a string. A much more interesting way and a way that is used a lot more frequently in JavaScript is using it to find out the length of an array. So obviously I can do something like this, const fruit equals banana, apple. So I'm just putting strings in here, pair. And then if I console log fruit, just like we did with the string, you will get the array with three items or three strings in it. And if I use the property of length, well, you will get the number three because we have three items in our array. This is great for if you're not sure how long an array is, maybe it's got like thousands of thousands of things in it, or perhaps it's constantly changing, okay? So a great example of this is the for loop where you want them to iterate for each time there is something in an array. So before we move on, I just want to show you something that tripped me up when I was learning, when I started working with uh, the browser and perhaps picking out elements. This really tripped me up and it wasn't until a while later that I realized some JavaScript uh, inbuilt things already have length as a property. So I'm going to show you this example. I think it's pretty useful. So I've also gone ahead and created some UI for us to work with. So I'm just going to clear this out. Now, what I have done here in this example is created a UI that essentially has three balls or to be more precise, three divs 
with a class of bull. And then I have styled them up in order to look like this and use justify content and display flex to make them appear in line rather than stacked over each other as is the default for divs. So now say I want to get all my balls, so all the divs or the class of ball so I can work with them in my JavaScript. Well, once again, I would use document query selector, but this time all. Okay, so once again, I have not made this up. This is something that comes with JavaScript document. So we are looking into our index HTML and then we are looking and selecting all the divs with the class name. So we need to make sure that dot is there because we are looking for a class name. If we didn't have it there, well, that wouldn't work. We need to look for the class name of ball. And then I'm storing it as balls. Okay, so now if I console log balls. So when we console log balls, you'll see a node list show up. Okay, so here is our node list. I'm just going to expand that so we can see it a little bit better. And in our node list, we have the first div, second div, and third div. We also have a property of length. So node list may look like an array, but it's not, okay? Don't treat it as an array. I just want to show you this outlier example of how we can also access the length of a node list because it exists as a property. So that is just something that I want to draw your attention to. Even though length can be used on strings and arrays, there are many outliers such as the one I showed you. I'm showing you this as it really confused me when I first started, so I thought I'd get in there quickly and just explain that JavaScript is quite flexible. We've just used length on a node list, which is not an array or a string. We are able to do this because the node list has a length property. Okay, I think I've covered length enough for us to move on. Please do pause here and please have a go at creating your own examples. Perhaps have a go at, you know, recreating this. Have a pause here, have a go. Or if not, hey, let's carry on. Next up, we have concat. The concat method is used to merge two or more things. We're going to look at arrays and strings together. So let's go ahead and do that now. Let's look at a string for our first example. So I'm just going to get a string const word. And then I'm going to say cheese and then const name Hania. So we have two words here. Now what if I want to essentially put both of these words together? So I'm just going to put say cheese Ania. So it's not essentially one word now, it's a sentence, but we are still joining two strings together. Okay, so if there's any confusion, one string and then second string. If you want, let's actually just call this string and then string two. Just so we're super clear about what we're doing, we are joining together two strings. So now I'm gonna get my console log out, and then I'm gonna get the first string, and I'm gonna use concat. So once again, this is a JavaScript method. I am not making concat up. Let's open up our parentheses, and now I'm gonna pass through String two. So there we go. I have joined the two strings together to make one string that says say cheese Ania. So that is our example with strings. Let's have a look at how this works with arrays. Well, the arrays is pretty similar, but I'm just going to type it out for you so you can see. Now, the important thing to know when we use this method on arrays is that this method does not change the existing arrays, but instead returns a completely new array. OK, so just keep that in mind. I'll show you what I mean. Let's get array one and let's say array one is 
I don't know, to use integers this time. So our first array is an array of one, two, three values. And then our second array, so array two, it's going to be four, five, six. So we're essentially counting to six, but it's split in two arrays. So once again, let's get our console log out. I would get the first array, if I just spell it right, array one. And then I would use concat, the method of concat, which I am not making up. This is a JavaScript method. And I would pass through array two. And what does that return? Well, it returns a new array with all of our numbers in it. Okay, so I'm actually going to store this as something. Const new array. I'm just going to store it here. So you see what I mean by the fact that we are not changing any of the arrays at all. We've created a new array. Because if I console log out array one, well, you will see this array right here. If I console log out array two, once again, you will see that array still exists. We have not mutated these in any way. And if I console log out new array, well, you guessed it. We got our new array, which uses both of these arrays. Great. So that is another thing that you might want to make note of. This method does not change the existing arrays. It returns a new array. Cool. Now, we can also concat strings with integers, strings with booleans. That is completely up to us. Concat is not going to, you know, discriminate against any of that. So go ahead. We can also do something like this. So let's just make a third array, array three seven eight nine and then by passing through array three we are essentially joined together all three of the arrays okay so it is quite flexible I hope that was useful. Once again, please do have a go at writing these yourself. By building that muscle memory is the only way you really get to grips with learning these JavaScript methods. Okay, so I just want to talk to you about the join JavaScript method. Let's get to it. The join JavaScript method creates and returns a new string. So I'm just going to say returns a new string because I think that's important for you guys to remember by concatenating all of the elements in an array okay so not like concat it is going to literally take everything in an array and join it together so for this I've actually gone ahead and used document and query selector I did not make these up this is a javascript method that will allow us to search for the div or element with the class. So we've got a dot here, so we know we are searching for a class name of text. So essentially we are searching for this div with a class name of text. So we're gonna search for any element with a class name of text. And we're gonna store it as a const that I have chosen to call text display. Okay, so that is how we would get that div. And then I would grab the text display and use a JavaScript property of inner HTML. So once again, I'm not making this up to assign whatever we want. So let's just go ahead and write test. And there we go. You will see the string text show up in my div, which is in this orange body. Okay, now let's use join on an array to try test it out. I just want to show you how you can use the join JavaScript method. And for this, I'm just going to make another array. Let's go ahead and call it emotions. So I'm going to make an emotions array. So instead of saying the word text, I just want to use emotions there. So whatever we type in here should show up in our text display. Make sure that this is at the bottom because obviously we will read this first and then whatever is in our emotions 
we assign to the inner HTML of the text display, which is an element with a class name of text. So I'm just going to put happy. There we go, happy. Let's put sad. And let's put confident. I think that's an emotion. So at the moment, we have these three elements in our array. They are strings. We've got three strings in our array. Now, I can use join to literally just bunch them all up together and make them appear as one word. So I could do this easily. Let's get our emotions. Once again, make sure to put it above here. Emotions and then use join like so. So you might not be able to tell, but if we actually console log emotions, you will see that is just one long string. Okay, that is opposed to what we were getting before. So if I just get the emotions, that is an array with three elements that are strings inside it. And once again, let's use join. And there we go, one string. So we can join up all of our strings like that. If I want to get rid of the commas, I could do that too. So there we go. By passing through an empty string, I'm essentially getting rid of the commas in between. So that is also quite cool. Essentially, what I am passing through here, if I do pass through anything at all, will replace the comma. So because I pass through an empty string, it's been a comma has been replaced by nothing. I can also replace it with that, or the number two, or three, or blah, blah, blah. it doesn't matter. Okay, so by leaving an empty string, you're essentially replacing a comma with nothing to get one word that says happy, sad, confident. Okay, now I did say this returns a new string, so it won't work if I just got emotions and use join on it. Okay, that will not work. You will see that has not worked. I am not getting all three words as one. I would need to store this because this returns something, okay? It like gives something back, so we need to catch it and store it as something else. So const new word equals, and then I just replace this with new word. We've called it back and we have assigned it to the inner HTML. So once again, I can just put that here too. All numbers. It is up to me. So that is how I would use the JavaScript method of join. I hope you can see how it's different from concat. It is totally up to you when you would like to use each one. I think it just depends on the problem you're currently trying to solve. I hope this has helped. So I hope by showing you both, you will be able to make that choice eventually. Okay, let's move on. In this next section, I want to focus on the JavaScript method of pop. The pop JavaScript method essentially removes the last element from any array and returns that element. For this, I have already pre-made a cinema board for us. So we can see some cinema names in our browser and so that I can show you the pop JavaScript method in action. Before we get going, I'm just going to explain a little bit about what is happening here. So essentially, I have made this using HTML and CSS to look like a cinema board, similar to what you would see if you're going to watch a movie at the cinema. I have then picked out this lighter red square using document query selector. So I am not making this up. Document and query selector. Query selector is a JavaScript method that will essentially look into our HTML document and look for a element with the class name. We know it's a class because of the dot of display. So let's go in here and you will see a div with the class name of display that is styled to be like coral. So we know this is the element that we mean. So I am finding that using query selector and I'm storing it as display for us to use in our JavaScript file. 
Okay, so let's think of some movies. Cons movies equal, and then let's open up an array because we're going to use pop on that array. And the movies I want to put in are Argo, Aliens, and Fear. So there we have our three movies in an array. We know it's an array because we open up these square brackets and we have three elements, which are three strings in our array, which we have stored as movies. If I console log out movies, and get our console log up, you will see we get them back here. We don't want the console log for now, so I'm just going to put it down. Okay, now let's actually get to putting the movies into our display. So I'm going to use display. So I'm literally grabbing this. So we're grabbing the light coral square. This is actually a JavaScript property. So using inner HTML, I'm going to set the inner HTML of my div to be the movies. Okay. So we can now see the movies in our browser. So it's going to be easier for us to put pop into action. Now, say I want to just remove the last movie from our list. Well, I could do this super easily. I need to do it above the inner HTML so before we assign the movies to our display. So I'm going to do it up here. I'm going to grab my movies. I'm going to use pop like so. And there you go. You will see I have now taken this array and essentially removed the last item from our array. Now, it is important to know that the pop method changes the length of the array, okay? We're not creating a new one. We have changed this array. At the moment, this might not mean much to you, but as soon as we start looking at other JavaScript methods for arrays, this will make a lot more sense. For now, just remember or make note in your notepad that pop changes the length of the array. It does not create a new one. We can essentially do this on whatever we like. So I'm just going to delete that for now. So we've got all three of them back. Now say I instead of had three strings, I had three objects. So I'm just going to create three objects. There's one object, second object, third object. So you can see one object, two object, three object. And in my object, I have the name Argo. It's the name of the movie. And then length. Let's just say, I don't know how long it is, but let's just say it's 136 minutes. Same for this one. So name aliens and let's say the length of the film is 201 minutes and name fear and this one can be one two four minutes so now i have an array of three objects movie objects if i console log that out you will see my three objects Let's click into the first one. There's our first object, second object, third object. Now, if I console log at movies, there's three objects. So as we can see here, I'm just going to select that and shut it down. And if I take the movies and go pop, and then I console log movies again, you will see I only have two objects. So once again, pop works on an array, no matter what is in the array, it can be a string, it can be an object, it can be a number, it will simply get rid of the last element in your array. So yep, as you can see, we have this object and this object. This one has been removed, so the last one has been removed thanks to pop. Great. Okay, I'm just going to delete this for now. Now I want to show you the opposite of pop and that is shift. 
Let's do that in the next section. In this section, we're going to talk about the shift JavaScript method that removes the first element from an array. Let's do it now. In this section, we're going to look at the shift JavaScript method and how to use it to remove the first element from an array. Using this method, we'll remove that item and return the removed element as well. It is also important to know, so make a note of this, that this method changes the length of an array. This might not mean much to you now, but when we start looking at other JavaScript methods, this will make a lot more sense. Okay, so just remember that shift will change the length of the original array. Let's get up some movies again. So this time, let's get the movies. Good fellas. Wolf and Juman. G. Now, just like we did in the lesson before, I'm going to take the display. So I'm grabbing the display, which is essentially this light coral square. So I'm grabbing it using the document and query selector. These I did not make up and I am searching for the div with the class name. So dot for class name of display. So I'm grabbing that here and using a JavaScript property in a HTML, I'm just going to whack in my movies array. And that's a bit too long. Let's change the first one to be another film. So I'm just going to go with clue. There we go. Now they fit. Okay, so this time I don't want to remove the last item from my array. So I don't want to move Jumanji. I want to remove clue. I could do so. So once again, make sure to do it above here because whatever we have above here will be put in the displays in a HTML. We'll grab the movies array and just use shift on it like this. Okay, so now you will see that clue has been removed from our array. So that's all we can see in our display. I could also do this with numbers. So for example, I'm just going to make another array const count equal and then one, two, three, four, five. So now if I got the count and used shift on it, what do you expect would happen if I spelled shift correctly? Well, I would expect that the one would disappear. Let's check that out. Let's assign it to the inner HTML of our display. And there we go. So our array has been taken here and we have taken off the first item from our array and then we have put it in the display. We have changed the array. We have changed its length. Next up, I want to talk to you about another JavaScript method on arrays, and that is unshift. I'll see you in the next section. In this next section, we're going to be talking about unshift, the JavaScript method that adds one or more elements to the beginning of an array and returns a new array. So let's do it. Okay, so as mentioned, the unshift method adds one or more element to the beginning of an array. It is also worth noting that this will change. So this will change the array. It will change the original array that we are working on. This might not mean much to you now, but once you start looking at other JavaScript methods on arrays, this will make a lot more sense. We are going to be changing the original array. So once again, let's get a const up. This time, let's pretend we aren't in a movie theater, maybe a play theater. So const plays. And let's think of some plays. So I'm just going to put one for now. I'm going to put Hamilton. And then I'm going to get the display. So here we have selected the cor light coral square so we can use it in our JavaScript. And I'm going to use a JavaScript property of inner HTML. And to it, I'm going to assign the place. 
So at the moment, we just see Hamilton. Hamilton is the only play that is playing at our theatre. I want to add some more, but I want to add them to the beginning of the story. Okay, I want to add them here. I could do this with the unshift method. So for example, to do this, I would grab the plays. So I'm grabbing this original plays array. I would then use unshift. So I'm not making this up. This is a JavaScript method. And in here, I would pass through, let's pass through another play, wicked. So now you will see that I have added a, another element to the beginning of my array. Okay, so that is how you would use unshift in a very basic form. I can also add more than one element to the beginning. So let's add another one. What's another player that we can add? Let's add in cats. And there we have it. We have now added two new elements to the beginning of our original array. And if I was to console log out plays, well, I guess we can see here that we have three. This is not the same as our original array. We have changed the original array. So if I console log out plays, it should show me exactly what we see up here. And that is Wicked, Cats, and Hamilton. We have three items in our array. Fantastic. Let's get rid of the console log. Next up, I want to talk to you a little bit more about the JavaScript method of push on arrays. I'll see you in the next lesson. In this section, I'm going to talk to you about the push JavaScript method and how it adds one or more elements to the end of an array. Let's do it. So the push JavaScript method adds one or more elements to the end of an array and returns the new length of the array. So this is similar to the unshift method, but we are going to be adding elements to the end of an array rather than to the beginning. So once again, we are grabbing the display. So I'm essentially grabbing the div with the class name. So dot for class name, class name of display from our HTML. And that is this coral box right here. Let's make a const. So this time let's do actors names. Const actors. And once again, I'm just going to have a simple array of strings. So let's have Brad Pitt. Now I'm going to get my display. So I'm going to get this element here and using a JavaScript property of inner HTML, I'm going to just assign the array of actors to it so we can see it. Okay. So at the moment, we only have one actor being displayed in our display in our HTML. We only have one actor in our actors array. I want to change this array to essentially add two more actors to the end of it. So I will do this by grabbing the original actors array and using push. Okay, I'm not making this up. This is a JavaScript method. And by just passing through another actor's name, so let's put Rihanna, even though she's more of a singer, but she's done a few films. I have now added another actor or another element into our original array. So now we have two items in our original array. We have changed. So this changes the original array. Please do remember that. Please make a note of it. Just like the others, this will become more apparent when you look at other JavaScript methods that work on arrays. Okay, and just with the unshift, we can add as many elements as we want. So I'm just going to add in, I don't know, who's got a short name that we can put in here. I'm going to put Sia, even though once again, not really, not really an actress. And let's just put Brad. And there we go. So now we have three actors slash singers in our array. We have changed the original array. So that is how push works. I hope you can see how it's similar to unshift. 
I have one last one that is similar in the way these work, which works with adding or taking away items from an array. And this one will deal with if we want to, you know, add or subtract anything from the middle of our array, because at the moment we've just looked at the beginning or end. Let's have a look at the middle. This up in the next lesson. Next up, we're going to look at slice. The slice JavaScript method essentially allows us to remove certain parts of an array. Now, it is important that it does not mutate the arrays. It produces new ones. So unlike the ones previously, this will not change the original array. OK, so it does not mutate arrays. It produces new ones that is important please make note of it this is not like pop shift unshift and push it will not change the array it will produce a new one so what i mean by this is this once again let's make an array so const artists and i'm going to make an array of artists so let's use shakira Snoop and Sia. Let's also say Beyonce. And then let's put one more in. Swift, so Taylor Swift. Okay, so that is my array of artists. Now, say I just want to take out snoop from my list okay because then it will be women so let's do that let's get the artist array now i'm going to use slice and to use slice you can pass through two things so you can pass through a start and an end right so a start index and an end index i'm going to show you what i mean by this the star index, if I wanted to take out snoop, would be 0, 1. So I'm just going to console log this to see what is happening here. And then I would pass through a 2. So now I have taken out just snoop. This is what I mean that it does not mutate the array. The array here is the same. I've essentially taken out just snoop. So now I can store just snoop or something. So male artists. And even though there's just one now in here, I don't know why it's so female heavy, but you know, that's just the way I did it. Male artists, artists, slice one, two. So now we've stored snoop as a male artist. I'm just going to const male artist. So now if I console log male artists, I will get snoop. And if I console log artists, well, the array will be the same. We have not changed the array. So what happens, for example, I'm just going to clear this out so we can start again. If I wanted to remove every artist that doesn't start with the letter S. Well, that would mean removing the last two artists. So const not s artists. Please do bear in mind that this is not how you would search for strings that start with the letter s. We are just using a static array for this example that doesn't change. OK, we are just giving examples of how to work with slice you would not literally search for, you know, strings starting with the letter S this way. If we, however, want to remove the last two items of any array, no matter what is in the array, it does not matter what is in the array, we are removing the last two, we would do it this way. And I would do so by grabbing the artist's array and then using slice. And I can actually just pass through one, zero, one, two, three. Oops, three. So now if I console log not s artists. 
I would get Beyonce and Swift. I don't need to pass through a end. So as we mentioned, we pass through a start and an end. I don't need to pass through an end because we just want to continue to the end of the array. So anything from index three onwards will get taken off and saved as not S artists. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Just for syntax purposes, the syntax for using slice would be array. So whatever array we want, the JavaScript method of slice. So I did not make this up and we would pass through a start and an end. That's pretty much it. Make sure these are indexes. So as if you're starting from zero, one, two, three, four. Great. So we have our artists now. Using what we learned, how do you think that I will put in the first three? So I just want to display the first three artists in my display. Have a think about it. Well, I'm going to store them con as const s artists. And then I would get the artists. I would use slice and pass through zero and zero, one, two, three three as we want to stop after the third so here zero one two three we don't want anything past that and then i would get the display I'd use inner html so the property of inner html oops inner html like that equals and then s artists and there we have it we have shakira snoop and sia playing at our very exclusive theater that only allows artists the start with us to play weird i know let's actually change it to a small s just to be on the side of best practice next up we have the javascript method of splice so the splice JavaScript method changes the content of an array by removing or replacing existing elements and or adding new elements in its place. Okay, don't worry if you didn't understand any of that. I'm going to show you what I mean now. Now let's make a array. I'm going to call it movies. So what kind of movies should we have? Let's have elf. Annie, and let's have Hero 6. Okay, I'm just going to put these movies in our display. So I would do this by grabbing the display. Okay, I'm grabbing this. I'm going to use inner HTML to essentially assign the content of this array to the inner HTML of the display. So I would do so by just grabbing the array, like so. And there we go. We get Elf, Annie, and Hero 6. So our array is essentially showing up in the inner HTML of our display. Now, what if I want to remove Annie? I could do so with Splice. What I would do is essentially grab the movies array, use the Splice method, so I'm not making this up. I'm using it on my array. And because I want to remove Annie, well, I would pass through a one. This is because Annie is in the zero one first position or index one in my array. So if I pass through a one, well, you'll see that Annie and Hero have been removed. But if I pass through a one again, you will see that Annie is the only one being removed. Okay. So that is how splice works. I've just removed the item in the array with index number one. I can actually also add a, another parameter to this. So I want to replace Annie with something else. I'm going to replace Annie with Mulan. And I can do that like so. Okay, let's try a different example, okay? Let's do something else just so you get used to using Splice. So back at our normal array, that's the one we are starting with. Now, I'm going to get rid of Hero and replace it with something else. 
So I would do this by finding out where hero six is in our array. It is the zero, one, two, it's the second index. So two, that would remove hero. So I could just essentially pass through a two if I wanted. And then add. But then if I try to add hook, so I'm just gonna add hook, you will see that will not work, okay? This is because we need to pass through a second parameter. This is essentially a third parameter, but we're reading it as a second. We can replace things by the third parameter. So for this to work, I would have to put in a two, just like that. Now, what if I didn't want to replace hero six with hook? I simply just wanted to add hook into my array here. So let's do that again. Well, if I wanted to add hook here, it would be in the second index. And then I just want to add hook. So I would actually just use a zero. So there we go. Obviously, it's not fitting on one line. I'm just going to delete that for it to work. I would just pass through a zero into my splice method. This is because I want to remove zero elements before index two. Okay. So I'm removing zero elements before index two. So nothing's changing. I'm just simply inputting hook into my array. I think the best way to think about it is like this. So let spliced array equal, and then we get our array and we use splice. And then we pass through the first parameter, which is the start index. So just as we did before, if I wanted to replace Annie, I would go zero, one. So I'd pass through a one. That is the start index. So I'd go like that. And then our second parameter is the delete count. And it's the delete count from the start. So if I wanted to then delete Annie, I would go zero, one. And I would delete Annie. However, if I didn't want to delete anything at all, I just wanted to input a element like we did with hook, I would put through a zero. And then after that, we would put through the item that we want to replace. So for example, hook. So once again, that is the start index that we pass through, the delete count, and then the replacement. Okay, so I'm just going to move this out of the way so you can read it. If you ever need to think about it, that is the syntax for splicing an array. Start, delete count, replacement. Okay, let's carry on. Next up, we have the for each JavaScript method. Let's do it. The for each JavaScript method executes a provided function once for every array element. What I mean by this is that if I decide to change, for example, all of these pink flowers, yellow backgrounds to red, I could do this in a single line of code. I'm going to show you how now. So first off, let's actually get the yellow circles in an array so we can work with them. I'm going to do this by grabbing them first. So let's go to document and query selector all this time. So I am not making this up. Query selector all will essentially look for any class name. So dot means class name, class of circle in our index HTML document. Okay, so what we are doing is going in here and looking for any div with the class name of circle. So this one this one and this one, we need to use all because we are looking for more than one. And now let's save them as something. So I'm going to go const circles because we have three. So it makes sense to use the word circles. So now if I console log circles, you will see a node list. So you might remember that node lists aren't particularly arrays. Okay, it's a node list, but we can treat them similarly for, for each. So we have our first circle, our second circle, and our third circle. 
just gonna get rid of that so that is what is stored in our const circles okay so this is the syntax for for each we have the array and then we go for each and then we open up our parenthesis and in here we can call this whatever we want okay it's just the first item of the array so it's hypothetical it's made up i can call it x and for each item or x in our array i'm going to do something right so that is how it would look i'm going to show you this with our actual array so it makes more sense but just remember that's the syntax so Based on that syntax is what I would do. I would grab our array, or in this case, node list to be precise, and then I would use for each, open up our parentheses. Now for each item in our circles node list or whatever array we are working with, I can, I'm just gonna get call it circle instead of X, okay? So right, so for each circle in my circles, I want to change it to red. So I would use style. Once again, I'm not making this up. Style, background, color. This is something that we did in the previous lesson. So I'm essentially adding a background color to the style of circle. We have this color right here, but I want to change it in my JavaScript by writing that. And let's just change it to red. Amazing. So we have now done that. I'm just going to minimize this for you. So once again, for each, we get an array or a node list. We can do a node list too. And we use for each. And then for each item, so we can call, I can call this glob. It really won't make a difference. It will still work. It's literally whatever we want to call it. And for every item in our circles, I change it to red. Okay, so that is one example of how to use for each. Let's go back to bases and just do it for a normal array using a console log. So if you want to write that down, actually make a note of that. That is how you would change each of these to a different color. Please feel free to have a go at this yourself. Pause here if you need to pause longer. I'm going to carry on. Just going to get rid of this. So let's do another example. Let's make an array. So const names equals Ania Bob B and then Melanie. So that's an array of names. Now if I was to get the names and for each name, okay, so for each name, once again, I could call this, I don't know, dog if I wanted to. It really doesn't matter. It just means for every item in our array. Let's change it back to name though because it makes more sense than dog. And then if I just want to console log out each name, individually rather than there's an array i would do this so let's get our console log and there we go we've actually done a mistake here because it's saying that this is one element so one two well done for anyone that spotted that let's actually fix that and there we go ania bobby melanie we are printing out each item of an array so each name as we chose to call it in our console log i'm just going to do one more example and that's with numbers so const numbers let's say we have actually let's make it more realistic const scores so here we have an array of random scores there we go and then it turns out that the person counted the scores forgot to add two points to everyone at the beginning. So all of the scores in our array, no matter how long the array, I mean, it could literally be like really long. Let's 
we don't know how long it goes, let's just make it go over our vision so we can pretend that we don't know how long the array is. Using for each, I can add plus two to each of these numbers. So scores for each. So for each score, whatever we want to choose to call it, we can call it I, we can call it score. For each score, let's just use console log again so we can see it. I want to add two to each score as we print it out. So as you can see here, let's just look to the beginning. I'm going to clear that out so it's easier to read. We can also, if we want to do more things, we'll just have one line of code, use curly braces like this. So that would be the correct syntax with the for each. It will work the same. So you will see here, that we have added two to each of the scores. So 32, one to 34, five, four, three, one to five, four, five, and so on, and so on, and so on. Okay? Just format that a little bit better, and we have finished. Okay, so we've covered using for each four elements in our browser. We've covered it for strings, and we've covered it for working with integers and arrays too. The for each method is very powerful. It is considered to be a loop, just like the for loop. So it's very similar to that. It's just your preference as to when you'd like to use each one and if it's more suitable for a certain problem. Let's carry on. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the JavaScript method of sum. For this lesson, I'm going to start off with some simple examples of sum first and then end with a more complicated example just to show you the difference between a basic example and how you might use sum in an actual real life project. So let's get to the basic examples first. The sum JavaScript method tests whether at least one element in an array passes the test implemented by a provided function. So what I mean by this is, let's get an array and let's call it scores. And our score is going to be 23, 56, 76, and 59 out of 100. Now, I want to check whether some scores are above 50, okay? And if some scores are about 50, well then, let's just say we pass the test, okay? So these are our overall scores for the year. If at least one of them is 50 or above 50, I pass. That's the sort of score I go to. So let's do it now. I'm going to essentially console log it out so we can see. I'm going to get these scores. So scores, my array of scores. I'm going to use the JavaScript method of sum. So I have not made this up. This exists as a JavaScript method. And for each score, if that score is bigger than 50, okay, well, we get a true. This is because two of our scores are bigger than 50. So now if I change this to be lower than 50, we get a false. This is because none of the scores are above 50. So scores sum, some of the scores above 50, no, false. That's how we would read that line. Okay, so that is a very basic example of how we would use sum. So just remember with sum, we are checking if any of the elements in our array meet a certain rule. And if any, even one, even just one, meet that rule, we get the Boolean of true. Otherwise, we get a false. Let's try it again. So I'm going to write something else just so you get a better understanding of sum, const, countries. Let's get some countries up. So Afghanistan, Poland, South America. Okay, so we have an array of three countries. 
now countries some country so once again this is very similar to for each this is the syntax so i can call this whatever i want i can call this glob and i could call this glob essentially it doesn't matter we are just giving this a value so we can check for each item in our array and if glob I mean an arrow function for this as well so if glob so for each glob or country let's actually change it back country and if each country so we check each country and if any of the country deeply equal Poland then we want this to return true so we're just finding out if Poland exists on our array so console log that and we indeed do get a true so that is how sum works with strings for example so we are getting the array then we use sum to check if some of the elements in our array match our rule and if some do even one then we return a true however let's put another country that is not in our array russia then we get a false because Russia is not in our country's array. Great. So that is how sum works with a basic example. I'm now going to show you a more complicated example to show you how you might use sum in a actual real life project. Don't worry if this is a bit too much for you. I just want to show you in case it comes up. I do use this example in my Tetris tutorial. So if you want to have a go at that, please do make a note of this. It will definitely help you understand what I'm doing in that walkthrough. Okay, so here we have, I'm just going to clear this up for us. Here we have three hearts. I have a hole in one of the hearts. So if you see here, I have one div that has a heart, but it also has a child div in it that has a class of hole, which is this black thing right here and then another heart and another heart. So what I have done is essentially in my JavaScript picked out each div with a class of heart. So if I console log out hearts because we took them all, we searched for them in our document, we searched for them by class name and the word heart, so the class of heart. We use query selector all and document to do this. Once again, I did not make these up. This is a JavaScript method. And if I console log hearts, I get a node list of the three hearts. The first one, of course, having a child div inside. Now, unlike before, I'm actually going to create an array out of this. So I can use another JavaScript method called array from, which will essentially make an array of the divs for me. So now it's gone from being a node list to an array. See one HTML div element, another, another. We have an array, ladies and gentlemen. Great. So that is what I get back when I console log hearts. So now if I get my hearts array, I want to write something that says if there is a hole in any of my hearts, I am heartbroken. So hearts sum, I'm going to store this as const is heart broken equals heart sum and then for each heart so i am checking in my array of div elements for each heart for each div with a class of heart i'm checking if that div has child nodes so there's another thing that i'm not making up it is a javascript method that's going to help us check if the heart has any child nodes. So now if I console log is heartbroken, I get true. This is because there is indeed a hole in one of my hearts. Or precisely, if I was to talk about this in programming languages, one of my hearts does have a child element inside it. Okay? So that is how I would do it. If I was to then get rid of this hole, so I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of that here. Go back here. 
And once again, delete that and console log is heartbroken. I get false. This is because I now don't have any child nodes in any of my hearts. So that is just one uh, example of a slightly more complicated way that you could use sum or the JavaScript method of sum. Great. I hope that made sense. Please do write this down and have a go at this if you want. Um, once again, it is simply just checking if any of my heart divs have a child div. I could even just have it blank and it would pick it up as that is technically a child to the parent div. But you know, because we want to see it, I'm just going to give it a class of whole, which I previously made here. Okay, it's just a simple black hole. And there we go. Okay, I hope that made sense. I hope you've learned a little bit more about some. Uh, we will be using this in projects to really build your muscle memory. So don't worry if you didn't get it so much this time. Hopefully it should be a lot clearer by the end of this course. Now, I want to take a little bit of time to talk about the map JavaScript method. Okay, so the first thing you need to know about the map JavaScript method is that it is quite similar into the for each. However, it creates a new array. Okay, so what I mean by this is that it takes an array and for every item or element in the array, it will apply a function to it or some functionality and then create a new array from it. This is unlike for each in which if you remember, or if you want to have a look back, we were just printing out the result each time, sort of like a loop. This will literally create a new array for us. But enough chat, let me get to showing you with code. So the syntax for map looks a little bit like this. We have an array and then we use map. So once again, I am not making this up. This is a JavaScript method. And then we map to each item in our values array. So for each value, like so. And whatever we do here will affect the value. We then have to store it as a new array of values. Okay, so that is the syntax. Let's get to actually using it in a real life code example. So for this, I'm actually going to use integers for this. I think it will be the easiest to see this with integer values. I'm going to make an array of ages. So this is the ages of everyone in my house. I've got 21. I don't actually, I don't live with this many people, but you know, it's for the sake of the tutorial. So let's just assume I live, let's have a young person there too, uh, in a house with six people from the age ranges of 2 to 56. Now, this was the last time I counted everyone's ages. It's been three years on exactly from now and everyone's aged three years. So I need to add three years to everyone in my array but I don't just want to console log them out. I actually want to store this in a new array. Okay, so we can say ages three years ago from now, 2018, and const ages 2021. So this is what we want. We want const ages 2021. So I'll get the ages from 2018. I'd use map, and as we said, remember values array for each value in my array, so I'm going to go with age, for each age in my array, get our arrow function up, and for each age, I want to add three years. So now, if I console log ages 2021, 20, there we go. I get an array with all the ages updated by three years. So that is my household's ages in 20. 21. So that is a simple example of how to use map. Remember, it does differ from for each because it creates a new array. Have a go at doing map again if you want. Have a go at doing this one. Just make sure you know the difference. It's super, super important. Okay, let's try this out again. This time I'm going to use objects. 
So to do this, let's create an array of object. This time I'm going to say housemates. And then let's open up an array. So we know it's an array because we have these two square brackets. And in it, let's have our first housemate, our second housemate. Let's just have three housemates this time. So I'm just going to do the same that we did before, but this time working with objects. So I'm going to have the name of my first housemate. His name is Ahmed. And his age is going to be 24. So you will see I'm using a string for Ahmed and an integer for the age. Our next housemate is going to be Ellen. And she's going to be 35. And then we have Woody. And his age is going to be 30. So here's my three housemates, okay? Each housemate is essentially an object with a name and an age. Now, I'm going to do this again. So housemates 2018. I want us to essentially create a new array of just their ages and making sure these ages are up to date. So three years later in 2021. So we need to add plus three to each age. Now, based on what we did before, how do you think we would do this? Just have a pause here. Think about it. Remember the syntax that I told you. So map would work with values. We get our values array. And then we map out for each value. Use arrow function and value. So that is the syntax. And don't forget, this creates a new array. So I need to store this as values. Too. So that's just a separate thing. Okay, hopefully you've had a go at this or at least thinking about how we would do this. I'm going to show you the solution now. So once again, we would get our old array, housemate 2018, and use map. Okay, so for each housemate, this time we get the housemate because that is... The first item is a housemate, or the first object is a housemate. And for each housemate's age, we add two. So now, if I console log housemates2021, let's have a look. We have indeed added two to each age and return that as an array. Okay, so we have got the ages because for each age we added two and that's what we are storing in housemates 2021. Okay, great. That was a little bit more of a complicated example of how to do it with objects. I hope that made a lot of sense. I'm not gonna do anything with the DOM for this one as I don't really feel we need to. Um, but again, if you want to, please do practice this. Please do search online for more examples if you need. I will be using MAP in some of my tutorials. So once we get a hang of a few more things, we will be doing them as well. So don't worry, you'll have plenty of opportunity to practice the MAP JavaScript method. Okay, great. I'll see you in the next lesson. In this next section, we are going to be talking about the filter JavaScript method and how it's used. So first off, it is important to explain that the filter JavaScript method is used for, you guessed it, filtering. The method essentially creates a new array. So make a note of that, creates a new array with all the elements that pass the test implemented by the provided function. So what I mean by this is we're going to write some code and if our array passes the rules in the code, we're going to create a new array with those values. Okay, and then we're going to stick it in here. So for this example, I'm going to start off with an array of shows. I put in some shows that I'm already into. So Lupin, Cobra Kai, 24 and Mr. Robot. We're going to use filter on this array First off, to find out which of these show names is less than five characters, so we can put it in this box right here and it fits perfectly. 
And then we're going to do some more filter work, this time with objects and arrays. So I'm just going to show you the simplest way of using filter. And how I would do this is I would grab the shows array. And then we said that we want to only filter out any string that is less than five characters in length. OK, so let's do that. We can easily filter out every single show name that is less than five characters or equal to five characters by getting the shows array using filter. So I did not make this up. Filter is a JavaScript method. And then similarly to for each, we would grab the word. So I can call this whatever I want. OK, I can call this I. I can call this puppy. It's totally up to you. This is essentially a syntax that essentially means for every element in our array. I'm actually just going to change that back to word. And for every word, we're going to check the length of the word. And if the length of the word equals or so smaller than, that is smaller because this has to be smaller than five. And then we want to store this in something because as you remember, filter creates a new array. So let's go ahead and store that in display shows as we are going to be displaying them later on. So we have now stored this new array in something. Let's see if that has worked. So console log display shows. Let's get our console log out. And great. We now have a new array that has stored all the elements in our array that are either equal to five or less than five in length. By length, I just mean the character count. That is how you would use length on a single string, if you remember back to our previous lessons. So that is how you would use filter. That is a very basic example of how to use filter. For example, I could have equal to five, and then I would just get Lupin. I could have greater than five, and then I'd get Cobra Kai and Mr. Robot. And I can do a lot more other things. So that is just one example. Before we go on, I am just gonna show it in our display. So once again, how do we do this? Well, if we have a look at our index HTML, you will see that the display is what we need to get. So the class of display, because that is that element right here. You will see that it is styled to be pale violet red. So let's grab our display. I'm going to go into the document. We're going to go into the document, search for it using query selector. We did not make that up. That's a JavaScript method and search for the class of display. And let's store this as const display. Or if we want, we can save it as show display. It is up to us what we save this as. And then we will get the show display and use inner HTML. So the property of inner HTML, I did not make this up and just assign it the display shows. And there we go. There they are. If we want to style this up a little bit, let's just change the font size and let's make it 50 pixels. So there's our three shows. Okay, let's move on. Now say instead of an array, we had an array of objects. So I'm just gonna console log this out so you can keep it there in case you need it. And of course we don't have any shows for now, so I'm just gonna comment this out too. Say we had, so I'm gonna do shows again, However, this time it's going to be array of objects. So there's one object, there's another object, and each object is going to be a show object. So this is a more realistic way of how you might see this in uh, 
a working environment. So you'd have your object, it's going to have the name Lupin. We're going to have series. Well, I know it's got one series. I'm going to get one integer. Episodes, total five. Okay. And then I could do the same for all the others. So, Cobra, Kai, and it's third series. And let's say in total it has 20 episodes or 30 episodes. I'm not exactly sure, but we don't need to be accurate for this. And then let's put 24. Once again, I really can't remember how many series this has. So I'm just going to be making these up. And the last one is Mr. Robot. Three, and let's put 24. Okay. So now instead of just working with a simple array like that, I have a much more complicated piece of data to work with but we can definitely still use filter on it. So I want you to display the shows that have over two series in the making. How do you think you would do this? I want you to have a pause here and think about it before you move on. So feel free to get out your code editor, have a mess around. All you need for this is to get something like that and then use filter on this array in order to find all the objects or all the shows that have series of over two. So it would be these three that you need to store in a new array. Okay, I'll see you in a bit. Okay, so the way I would do it is this. Let's go here. I would grab the shows array. I would get the filter JavaScript method. Let's open up and we know that the syntax will be this show, show, because each of these is a show, one show, two shows. Once again, we can call it whatever we want, but for the sake of readability, I've called it show. Now for each show, well, I can't just do length. I need to get the shows series and check if it is larger than two. And if it is, we want to store it in a new array. So let's just call it display shows again. So now if we console log display shows, I would indeed only get three objects back. So Cobra Kai, 24, and Mr. Robot. Okay, great. That is how we would do it. That is the solution to using filter. I think we're ready to carry on. In this section, I want to talk to you about the reduce JavaScript method. Let's do it. The reduce JavaScript method executes a reducer function on each element of the array, resulting in a single output value. What I mean by this is we can use it to essentially add up loads of numbers together. Okay, so that is how the reducer works. We add up loads of numbers. For example, if I get an array of numbers, so const scores, and I want to figure out what my final score is, so I'm just going to put some numbers in here, like so. I would get the scores array, get the reduce JavaScript method, and this is the syntax for writing a reducer. Okay, so you have accumulator, you have an accumulator, And the current value, let's just put that in actual parentheses themselves, and then accumulator plus current value. So that is the syntax for writing a reducer. I'm just going to comma that out so we can keep it at all times. 
we have something that will accumulate and the current element being processed in the array. So if I show you this with actual code, I'm going to use reduce and then the accumulator. And then I'm just going to put through the exact code that we see above. And let's store it as total. Now, if we console log total, we can actually get rid of this because we don't need this. Actually, we do we need the console log. You will see 21. So this is just syntax. You can, of course, change these to whatever you want for more readability. For example, I might choose to have the accumulator be called total score. And then the current value, so whatever is being processed, is just a score. So I'm just going to put score. Either way, the total will be the same because 5 plus 3 is 8 plus 6 is 14, and then we add 7, which is 21. We can do this on whatever we want. So 1, 2, 3, 4, that will give us a 4. Essentially, if you use this syntax, so that here, you can get the total of any array of numbers. Okay? So make sure to write that down. It's just syntax. You just need to remember it. Make a note. Okay, now I'm going to actually delete this and I want you to try adding these numbers together. So, based on what you have learnt so far, you can, of course, oh, what's it not liking there? Come on. Um, you can, of course, refer back to the previous lesson or if you've made a note, I want you to have a go at writing this in your own code editor. Okay, I want you to add all the numbers together. Please have a go at doing this yourself. Once again, feel free to Google, feel free to go back on your previous lesson. Just, just have a go. Okay, I'll see you in a bit. Okay, so hopefully you've got that. Once again, we would grab the array and we'll use the reduce JavaScript method. So once again, we are not making this up and let's get our syntax. So we need one thing here and one thing there. I can call it X and Y, but I really would not recommend that. No one knows what X and Y is. It's not very readable. It doesn't help out other developers reading your code. And then I would simply put X plus Y and score this, let's store this as total, and it's console log total. And there we go. We get the total of these four numbers. If we want to check if this works, let's make something easier. So one, two, three, four. And indeed, we get a four. So as I mentioned, I really wouldn't call this X and Y. I've just done it this way so you can see that it really doesn't matter what we put at these two values and what we put here. But this is how I would name it. Total and score. So we're talking about each individual score and it's accumulating onto here each time. Okay, It's going bam, add, 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 add until we get a total. So there we go. That is the reduce JavaScript method. In this next section, I want to talk to you about the every JavaScript method. Let's do it. The every JavaScript method tests whether all elements in the array pass the tests implemented by the provided function. It returns a Boolean value. So what I mean by this, if everything in our array matches a rule or a statement, return true. Otherwise, return false. So I'm going to do it once again with the scores, const scores equal, and then let's have some scores. There we go. I think that's enough. We have an array of scores. Now, well, let's put something else. Let's put test results, sure. 
let's pretend we are a teacher in a classroom and we have some test results. Now, someone has asked us to check if all of our students have received over 30%. Okay, we just want to know if the students have got over 30%. Well, I could do this with every. I would do it like this. So let's get our array. So test results and then use every and then check. So I'm going to get the test results. I'm going to get results. Once again, I'm calling this whatever I want. And for each result, I need to check that it, it is larger than 30. Okay. So that's how we would do it. Once again, I can call this whatever I want. It really doesn't matter. I can call it I, I can call it X. It just means for every item in our array. So for the sake of readability, I'm gonna call it result. And let's console log this to see what we get. So we should get a Boolean of true because all our results are indeed over 30. So I know I've put this in a console log, but another option is to actually save this as something. So if I saw this as const um, class pass, has class passed, has class passed equal. So if I console log class, or maybe just class pass true, that makes more sense readability wise console or class passed true however if i put one of these to 26 we get a false this is because not every one of our items in the array matches this rule okay so that is how every works once again i'm going to ask you to do it yourself so make a note of this because this is going in a second this essentially is the syntax. So this bit right here on an array and boom, there it goes. Okay, so in this example, I'm gonna make a new array. I'm gonna say const array animals. And then I'm gonna have a cat, not cot, a cat, a rat a dog, a mouse, and that's it. So that is my array of animals. I want you to tell me if all the animals in our array, if all the animals length, so the length of the string is equal to three. So equal to three, right? So you need to write a line of code that will essentially give us a true or false value based on this rule. Okay, so write code that will return true or false if every string in the array is equal to three in length. Okay, so once again, I'm going to leave you to it. Please have a go at this yourself and I'll see you in a bit. Okay, so the way I would do it is this. I would grab my animals array. I would use every and then I'm going to pass through an animal for each animal and it now, for each animal, length, so this is a property that we used before, deeply equals three. And then let's store the answer, or let's just console log it for now. We get a false. This is because mouse is five characters long. If we, however, change this to ant, then we will get a true because of all our animals, so all these strings in our array would be three characters in length. So once again, I could also store this as something, so I'm just gonna cut this out, and let's store this as const three letter animals, or 
is a three letter animal because it's going to return a true or false is three letter animals is three letter animals true and if we change this to an eater we get a false okay so that is how every works i think we're ready to move on in this next section, I want to take a moment to talk to you about split and how it works. Let's do it. The split JavaScript method divides a string into an ordered list of substrings, and it puts these substrings into an array and returns the array. The division is done by searching for a pattern where the pattern is provided as the first parameter in the method's call. Okay, so what I mean by this is this. Let's get a string. I'm going to say sentence and let's put I will have what she is having. So there is our sentence. Now, I can use split. So I'm just going to console log this out. I can use split. So if I grab the sentence and just use split like that so hold on let's put a space in between let's get a console log out i have now split this string by the spaces so by this space by this space by this space by this space so now i have an array of strings one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven elements. I have an array of seven strings or seven elements, okay? Because we have split them out and put them into an array. So that is pretty cool, okay? So I'm just gonna get this and instead of console logging it out, I'm gonna save it as something. So const words that make up the sentence. So if I console log words now, I will indeed have an array of all the words that make up my sentence. And now if I go into that array, so this is how we go into an array. If you remember, we open up our square brackets. I can get the first word. So I, I can get the second word, which is will, third, fourth, fifth, and so on. So that is pretty cool. I can also, so I'm just gonna console log words, split out by individual letter. So now I have this sentence broken up by letter and spaces too. So if you see here, I space will space have and so on. So now if I go into, I shouldn't call this words anymore. I'm going to call it letters. I can go into the first that will give me an I letters and go into the second that will just give me an empty i can go into the second which will just give me an empty space i can go into the third or index number two and that'll give me a w and so on and so on and so on okay and finally I could just do that, which isn't really useful to us, but it will just put the sentence in its own array. Great. So just like always, I'm going to delete this now in order for you to have a go. So make a note of this and it's gone. Let's get a sentence up. So here we have a sentence and it's going to be Come on, baby, light my fire. I want you to get the third word out of this for me. How would you do that using code? So get the third word from the sentence using code. I'm going to pause here while you have a go at doing this. We did cover it in everything we just learned, so feel free to have a look back or Google, the choice is up to you. I'm going to pause here while you do this.
Okay, so the way we would do this is, I would get the sentence itself, use split in order to split out by space. So let's put in a space. Okay, let's save this as something. So const words. So now if I console log words, I would get the words. And we want the third, so index zero, one, two. So I would simply go two. And there we have it. We have the third word in our array. So once again, I could choose to store this as something or like word, store that here. So now our variable word is the third word. Amazing. I think we're now ready to carry on. Okay, it's now time for some array work. We have learned a lot about arrays in these past few lessons, and I really want to put it all together. So this next section is going to be quite difficult. So please don't be scared if you find yourself really struggling. It's meant to be hard. I really want to throw you in the deep end. The reason why I'm doing this is because I'm going to give you plenty of time to solve this by yourself. And if you don't get it, don't worry. That's what I'm here for. We're going to go through the answers together. Once you have completed this section, or once you have watched this section, I really would advise to make a note of this section and practice it by yourself. There's going to be a few ways to solve each of the challenges, so practice solving it in loads of different ways if you wish. Okay, let's do it. Okay, welcome to this section on array work. As mentioned, this is going to be quite a tough section, so please don't beat yourself up over it if you don't get it. That's what I'm here for. We're going to go through all the answers together. So what I need from you is get up your code editor and in your index.js file, I just want you to write this. OK, so go ahead and do that now. Pause if you need. We are going to be using everything we've learned in the previous sections about array work in order to write functions to help us solve these problems. We have a lot to get through. OK, so this is going to be a lot of fun. OK, so each of these is going to take the same format. I'm going to ask you to use a JavaScript method to write a function that does something. In this case, I want you to convert something into something else. So convert Fahrenheit values into Celsius values. You're going to use a function to do this and write your code here. This exercise or these exercises will involve some form of Googling. For example, you're going to have to Google how to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius if you don't know already, which I definitely don't. OK, so I am going to pause here while you do this. The first one will be hard. So have a go at doing it anyway. If you don't get it, I'll go through the answer with you. And hopefully that should give you a clue into how to solve the rest of these as well. So pause here, have fun, Google, go wild, and I'll see you in a bit. OK, so the way I would do this is, well, first off, I actually need to get an array. So I'm just going to use this array right here, const Fahrenheit, I'm going to call it. And I'm literally just going to copy that. So now we have an array of Fahrenheit and we need to convert it to Celsius. So. Well, you'd probably Google how to convert one to the other. So here we go, Fahrenheit in Celsius, or Fahrenheit to Celsius, should I say. And we know that we can use this formula. So I'm just going to copy that. I'm going to paste it here so we can see it at all times. So now we know to get something in Celsius that from Fahrenheit, I would have this number minus 32 multiplied by 5 over 9, and that will give me the Celsius value. 
So get Celsius. Well, Celsius, so const Celsius array, because we have to do this for every single item in our array. So I'll grab the Fahrenheit array and use map. So the JavaScript method that we learned earlier to map over each of these and apply this logic to change it into Celsius. So const Celsius array equals getting the Fahrenheit array. So I'm getting the Fahrenheit, I'm getting this, and I'm using the JavaScript method of map to essentially change each one of these. So in my array of Fahrenheit, I could put value. And for each value, I would take away 32 and multiply it by 5 over 9. I'm just going to put this in parentheses as well so it's easier to read. Now, I could do something like this. So I could say const or let Celsius array and then assign. So we're going to do our calculation. We're going to make a array, so a changed array of Celsius. And we're going to assign it here. And then that's going to get stored as a global variable. So now if I const, so first of all, we need to actually call the function get Celsius. And then it's console log Celsius array. We would get minus 5, 60, 105. So we've done it. Amazing. However, I'm just going to show you a quick trick. Well, it's not really a trick. Just It's just a way of returning things out of functions that will be useful for this section. So instead of me getting our new array, storing it here, and then storing it as a global so that we can console log it out here after calling the function, I could just do this. So now if I call my function, so console log get Celsius and call it, I'm returning this. Okay, I'm returning this array. So that is a neat way of doing it. And once again, you will see that indeed, if we use this array, then we're going to get this back. Okay. So that is looking good. Now, based on what we have done here, I want you to have a go at doing the next one. Are you ready for it? Let's do it. I should also say that there are many ways of solving this. Like you could have passed through the array into here. You could have done so many things. So this is just one example of solving it. If you have thought of a different way, please do share it with me on Twitter. I would absolutely love to see. Okay, next challenge. Let's clear this. And I'm just going to uncomment this out so we don't have to see it show up in our console log. Okay, so I want you to solve this in the exact same way that we did before. So make sure to have a go at this yourself. Please do use Google. These are quite hard. We are going to be using everything that we have learned so far. So also feel free to go back to the section about sum or anything that you think might help with this section about dealing with falsy values. Okay, so once again, I am going to pause here. Please do have a go at doing this yourself and I'll see you in a bit. Okay, so once again, I would start off by making an array so I can test this out. I'm gonna call it array one or array, because we already have an array here. Oh no, we don't, we didn't call it array. Let's just call this array. And then I'm simply just gonna take this array that's already pre-made for us. And we need to check, we need this to return a true because some of these are 
falsey, okay? Some of these are falsey, so we need a true to come back. This, for example, is a falsey. So, I would do this by grabbing the array and using sum, because we are told to use sum and the syntax for sum. So, we would need to pass something through, so an element in our array. I'm just going to call it element or item. And for each item, we are going to check if it is falsy. So if you remember back on our lesson about truthy or falsy, I'm going to check if the item is falsy. And I'm just going to return this. And then let's check for falsy and invoke the function. So I'm going to console log that too, so we can see the answer. And we get a true. Okay. This is because nan is falsy. If I change this to be a one, for example, we get a false because none of the items are now falsy. So let's change that back to not a number because we know that is falsy and we get a true. So that is how sum works. It checks if any, so if some of the items in our array match a certain rule, then we return a Boolean response. And in this case, we are checking if something is falsy. So that was what the bang is doing. Okay, it's checking for a false or falsy item. So once again, you could have done this in a few different ways. It's totally up to you. If you've managed to do this in a different way, then please do let me know. Please do share it with me on Twitter. I'd love to see your solution. I'm all about creative solutions. So yeah, hit me up. Okay, I think it's now time to move on to the next question. So once again, I'm just going to get rid of this and let's carry on. Using the reduce JavaScript method, write a function that will return the total number of characters in an array, so that should be of, of characters in an array of strings. So for example, this array of three strings, rabbit, football, and cracking, returns 22, as there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 characters in total okay so i want you to have a go at doing this please use the reduce javascript method to do it so we just recently covered that one and i'll see you in a bit once again as a reminder this is all you need to write out in your code editor and your code goes Okay, so hopefully you've had a go at doing that yourself. If you haven't quite got it, don't worry, that's what I'm here for. We're going to go through the answer together. So let's do it. Okay, so the first thing I would do is just create an array. So const words, let's call it. And I'm just going to get this array. And I need the, so when I console log get total, I need to get the 22 value. So well, first off, let's get the array itself and use reduce. Now, we know that reduce works with a total and a value, and it accumulates. Okay, so we're going to put that. This is the syntax. I'm just going to write the syntax for now. So that is it. We need an arrow function here, and we'll put total and value. So that is the syntax, if you remember. Oops, that should be a plus. That is the syntax, if you remember from our lessons. Let's get working on this. Okay, so we know that this is the total and this is the value. So this can be rabbit, football, cracking. So what we need to do here is get the total. Where each time we add to the total, we don't want to add the value to the string itself. We don't want to we don't want to add rabbit and then football and cracking that won't really do much it doesn't make sense instead of adding the word or the value itself 
So perhaps let's change this to word now because we know that's going to be a word. We want to get the word length. Okay. And then one more thing that I need to do is start from zero. So this is what I said about Googling. If you Googled this, uh, you Googled how to do this, you might have got this as a response. So let's see if that has worked. This is because we're going to be starting from zero. So console log get total. Let's invoke it. And of course, we need to return something from the function. So there we go. We get 22. If I got rid of the zero, well, that wouldn't really make much sense. Rabbit 88. This is because we are telling it to start from zero okay it's an initial value once again there are many ways to do this this is just one way that i would do it if you have your own and are really proud of it and would like to share it please do tweet me i'd love to see it and i'd love to share your solution with others too so go ahead and do that this is how i would choose to solve this problem hopefully your googling is getting a lot better Google is such an important tool of a software developer, and I hope you can see why this is a total Google exercise, and Google would have helped you with this. Okay, I think we're ready to carry on. So I'm just gonna get rid of that console log once again, so we don't have anything in our console, and let's get to it. Using the every JavaScript method, I want you to write a function that checks whether a number or every number in an array is a square number. So for example, this would come back as true as nine is a square number, three times three is nine, 16 is a square number as four times four is 16, and so on. This as well, nine times nine is 81. So they're all square numbers. Okay, how do you think you would use the every JavaScript method in order to check whether every number in an array is a square number. I'm going to give you a hint for this. This square number part is going to involve some googling as it is a very useful JavaScript method that we have not covered that exists that will help you with this. To give you a clue, it starts with math. Okay, it starts off with math, sort of like math random and math round and math seal. So there we go. Have a go at Googling this, have a go at doing this yourself. Once again, this is a Google exercise as well. So have fun, go for it, and we'll go through the answer together. Okay, so hopefully you've had a go at doing that. Let's go through the answer now. So once again, I'm gonna start off with making an array. So const square, or let's just say numbers because we don't know if they're square or not. That's what we're checking. We're checking if all of them are square numbers. So I'm just gonna get this array and we know that it's true. So we need this to return a Boolean of true. So, I will get the numbers and I'm going to use every so and get the syntax for every so it's going to include me getting an element from an array for each element we're going to be writing a rule so I've chosen to call this num just because these are numbers you can choose to call this i or you can literally choose to call it number so for each number in our numbers array so this one this one this one I need to check if this number is a square number. So I did say to have a go at finding another JavaScript method that can help us with this. And there is something called math square root. So here we go, math square root, as you can see on the MDN website, the math square root function returns the square root of a number. So this is gonna help us do this. So I'm simply gonna get this right here. So I'm going to get that and I'm going to put through the number. So I'm going to use this to get the square root of the number. Okay, so if I put through a nine here, 
I will get a 3. And now I use modulus 1. So let's get modulus 1 because all square numbers are made up of full integers. So I need to check if the, whatever the outcome of this. So I can actually console log that. Console log. I'm just going to put this in here. Let's refresh. Let's console log. I'm just going to call check squares. I'm going to invoke the function. It's a three. So that is a full number, okay? That is a full number. So if the full number modulus one gives no remainder, so we are literally going to check if it is uh, divisible by one and leaves no remainder, then we know that it is a square number. Okay, so I'm just going to return this, return. I'm just going to get rid of that too. So now I'm just going to put on one, one line. I'm going to tell you what this line of code means. I'm getting the numbers array, and for every number in my numbers array, when I'm getting the number, and I'm getting the square root of the number, so as we saw with 9, that was a 3, so that will return a 3, and 3 modulus 1 leaves no remainder, so it is a full number. We are essentially checking if the square root of this number is a full integer, and if it is a full integer, we know that number is a square number, and we can return true. As we know, all of these are square numbers. So now if I put through something that is not a square number, I will get false. This is because the square root of 80 is not a full number. So it does not pass this rule and we fail this returning a true. So let's put it back to all square numbers. Once again, this was quite math heavy and it did involve you Googling this. So I do hope you've got it. If not, don't worry, that's what I'm here for. That's why we went through the solution together. If you have thought of a different way of solving this, then please also do share it with me. I'd absolutely love to see your solution. Okay, great. Let's carry on. If you are thinking like, oh, how come you've put um, parentheses around this? We don't actually have to. So there we go, I've got rid of it there. And we can also get rid of it here too, and here as well. It is not it is not necessary, okay? It's just an option for us. Okay, next challenge. I'm just gonna get rid of this here and clear out our console log. Okay, next question. Using an array method, so this time I'm not going to tell you which one, I want you to write a function that returns the string elements of an array that have a given length or larger. So for example, if I was to pass through this array and the number 5, I should get the words Florida and phone back. Okay, so we're going to be using two things in order to do this. So as a clue, I'm going to have const words array. I'm going to get this here. And I have const number five. And then I would use that in my function in order to return something that will give me back Florida and phone based on these. If I was to pass through a three, well, I would expect everything to be returned. So have a go at doing this. I'm going to pause here while you do it. So make sure to take this down in your code editor and go ahead. Okay, so the way I would do this is like this. 
I would use, so I'd get the words array first, return the words array, and then I would use the filter method because we're essentially filtering out, we're trying to find which of the elements match a certain rule. And then this is the syntax for filter. So I'm going to get a word or as I've chosen to call word, this is the syntax. It just means that for every item in our array, we want to apply a certain rule, which we're going to write here. So if the word length equals or is larger than the number, so in this case it is three, well, return that. Let's see if that has worked. So console log get words. And let's call the function. And there we go. Florida dog phone. If I change this to five, you will get Florida and phone. Now, the reason it's written like this is that we are essentially writing this function to take parameters or arguments. So for example, if I was to console log out this and now use get words and pass through this array and the number five, and then have an array here and number. So once again, change this to array and number, we will get Florida and phone, okay? So now I can check this function works for many things. So once again, get words. I am recycling the function that we have written and I am checking it works with different arrays. So let's just have pen, astronaut, B. And then let's pass through the number, let's say, three. And we will get all three. And if I pass through a six, well, we'll just get astronaut because astronaut is the only one that has a length of six. Okay, so that is how we would check the function many, many times. We are passing through an array and then we're passing through a number. And then we're using that array or whatever array we pass through to filter and check against that number. So if you go here, I'm literally taking this array, I'm putting it here and I'm putting it here. And then I'm taking this number and I'm putting it here and I'm putting it here. Okay, and then running my function. Great. Okay, so hopefully you've got that. If you do have another way of solving this, I'd absolutely love to see. So please do share it with me. I'd absolutely love to see all your creative solutions. There's many, many ways to solve this. And let's carry on. So I'm just going to console all this out for now. Using an array method, so once again, I'm not going to tell you which one, Write a function that converts an array of centimeter values as strings into an array of numbers. So once again, this is going to be a fun one as you're going to have to Google. There is a really nifty JavaScript function that will allow you to convert strings into numbers. So I'm not going to tell you what it is, but as a clue, just Google strings to numbers in JavaScript and you should be able to find that JavaScript method. So. Have a go at doing this. Just simply copy this out in your code editor and let's get to it. Okay, so the way I would do this is I would essentially, let's get an array, so const array, and I'm just going to literally use this array right here. And I'm going to return, so array three, I think we have to call this, or let's just put centimeter values. And return 
return where I would get the centimeter values and then I'm going to use map as we are essentially going to be mapping onto each element and I'm going to use map so this is my map syntax I'm going to get a value and for each value I need to do something right I need to change it to a number so I don't know if you've managed to find it but there's something called pass float the pass float function pass an argument converting it to a string first if needed and then returns a floating point number so it's gonna change it to a number for us okay just like that so let's go back here and I'm just going to use pass float and surround my value in it. So now if I console log get values and call the function, there we go. I have now got 30, 23, 5.6 and 1000. Brilliant. Now we can, of course, go the extra mile in testing this just as we did before. So I'm going to comment this out for now. Let's put an array in. So I'm just going to put a different array this time. I'm going to put 34 centimeters as a string, 45 centimeters as a string, and 1.2 centimeters. And I want this to convert into integers so i would put the array so i'm just saying whatever this is i'm passing it through as an array and i'm going to return that so there we go that has worked too i've now converted this other array into integers let's do it again so console log essentially any strings or array of strings that i pass through into the get value function now should come back as integers. So three centimeters, four centimeters, oops, four centimeters, seven centimeters. Console log get values. And there we go. We've done it. We've written a function that will literally take any array of strings as values and turn it into integer values. Cool. Let's move on. Using split and filter, write a function that counts the number of vowels in a sentence. So for example, here we have a function and if you pass through in West Philadelphia, born and raised, it will come back with 12. This is because there are 12 vowels in the sentence. So I want you to have a go at doing this. It is a bit on the hard side, but it does use everything that we have learned so far. So I want you to have a go at doing it. I'm going to pause here while you do this and I'll see you in a bit. Okay, so hopefully you've managed to do that. If you haven't, don't worry. That's what I'm here for. We're gonna go through the answer together. So the first thing I would do is, let's get our const saying, I'm gonna call it a saying. Let's get this string. Okay, now what exactly are my vowels? So const, I'm gonna find out what my vowels are. My vowels are, a, E, I, O, U. But I also need the capitals as well. So A, E, I, O, U. Okay, because we also need to count the capital vowels 
in this saying. So those are all my vowels. It's an array of all the vowels as strings split out. Okay, so how would I do this? Well, I would of course grab my saying or my string essentially, and I'm gonna use split. And I'm gonna use split to split out all of this by individual letter. So if I console log this out, if I console log out saying and split it out like so, you will get, there we go. So we've split it out into array of individual letters. This is gonna help us now because now we can use filter to check if each one of these matches a certain rule. So we've done that, we split it out. Now I'm gonna use filter to essentially filter out letter by letter. So I'm gonna grab the letter and letter by letter, I am gonna check if that letter is included in the vowels. So if you remember back to the includes JavaScript method, I would grab the vowels array, use includes to check if that letter exists in my array. Okay. So once again, I am splitting up this to be an array of individual letters like so. And then I'm going to filter out and I want to save every single letter that is included in this array. So if it is included in this array, I want to save it as something. So I'm just going to save it or I can I'm going to save it. So const, just so you can see what's happening. Actually, I'm just going to console log this. And let's call the function. So I'm going to console log the function get val count. So there we go. I have now an array of just the vowels from this sentence returned to me. Okay, there we go. We filtered them out. We've collected all the vowels. The next thing we need to do is finally just get the length of this array now because that's all we wanted. We wanted the count of how many vowels exist in this sentence and it should be 12 and that's what we're getting. We're getting 12. Brilliant. So that is the solution. I've of course written it in one sentence and I also actually need to return this for this to work. So I'm going to return that like so. And now if we pass through any sentence into here, we should get the vowel count. Okay. Once again, I know there's many ways you could have solved this. This is my way that I've written, but of course, please share your solutions with me share them with you on Twitter. I love to see them and share them with everyone else because I'm sure they would really appreciate it too. So now if I pass through anything, I can pass through I am a dog. So that is a sentence and pass through a sentence and whatever the sentence is, I want you to check if it has vowels and how many. So I get four one, two, three, four, that looks right. Let's try something else. Console log. Hello there, everyone. And that has eight vowels. Amazing. We have now written a function that will literally return back the amount of vowels we have on any sentence. Let's carry on. Once again, I'm just gonna comment these out. And we have got to our final question in the array work section. In this one, I want you to use split, map, and join in order to write a function that capitalizes the first letter of each word in a sentence. So for example, here we have a string, the queen's gambit. I wanna change it to the queen's gambit, like so, not in an array that is not necessary. So once again, get to your code editor, write this out and try solve the solution by writing your code here. Okay, let's pause here. Feel free to Google, of course, or look back on our previous lessons. That is absolutely fine too. I'll see you in a bit.
Okay, so the way I would do this is, so let's return something. Let's get something, so const words equals, words identified, words two. And there we go. Now I wanna capitalize everything in here. So I'm gonna grab the words string and I'm gonna, let's maybe call this something else. Let's call it a title, because it's the title of a film. I just don't like using numbers in um, variables. And I'm gonna use split again this time. But this time I wanna split it by word. So I'm gonna literally split it out by word. If I console log this, so actually, so log capitalize and let's call the function I would get a array with the three words split out so just like that now I need to change each of these in order to have a capital letter so I would do this like this I would get map because we're changing each one and then for each word or element in my array so once again for each word I want to apply this whatever's written in here now this is something that we haven't used before that I'm going to use in order to solve this it's called char at and it just means the first character so if I pass through a zero I just mean the first character in my word so there we go you can already see I've got about t q and g if I just left it like this and I'm going to use something called to upper case. So once again, this was a great one for Google because I'm using a lot of stuff that we haven't discovered yet. But by Googling, we have found them. OK, so I've just taken the first letter of each word and changed it from small to capitals. OK, now I need to put it back in my word. So for this, I'm going to use plus words. So I'm getting my word again. I'm going to use something called substring to essentially add it to the beginning of my word. So word substring one and replace the first one with it. So that's what it looked like with just substring. You can see the capital T and the original word. But if I put one, I'm essentially substituting the first letter. Okay, so we've done that. And the final thing we need to do is use join. Oops, join. On the whole thing, however. So I'm just going to wrap all of this in like that. So I'm joining the whole array now. I've joined it, but I want to join it like so. So I want to join it without the commas. And ta-da, we get the Queen's Gambit as a string returned to us, just like we wanted. And once again, I can pass through anything into here. So, Life of Pi, I'm just going to comment that out and then pass through a title in here. So Life of Pi is now capitalized. Let's try something else. The Incredibles. And there we go. Okay, I hope this was useful. I think this exercise is really good. As I said, it was a bit on the hard side and it did involve a lot of Googling in order for us to get the solution. Just like with the last one, there was a lot of Googling that you should have done there as Charat is a new one for us and so is Substring. You would not have seen them in this course, but with the help of Google, you hopefully got the right answer or you've come up with your completely own version of how to solve this. As mentioned, if you have, I would absolutely love to see your solution. I'm all for creative thinking and I'd love to see how you solved this challenge. Okay, let's carry on. In this section, I want to talk to you about the add event listener. The event target method add event listener sets up a function that will be called whenever the specified element is delivered to the target. What I mean by target is an element itself, a document or a window. Don't worry if this doesn't make sense. I'm going to show you this in code. 
So for those of you who have been carrying along with my course, we would have used Advent Listener a few times by now. However, we haven't really delved into how it works. So let's do that now. The Ad Event Listener essentially can work on a target. And then we pass through a event such as a click. So I'm just going to put through event and the function that we want to invoke when the event is triggered. I'm just going to show you this with an example. For the target, I'm going to choose this green square right here. So let's go ahead and pick it out from our HTML file. So I want to choose this with the ID of hexagon. So I'm just going to copy that. And in here, I'm going to use document. I have not made up document or get element by ID. That is a JavaScript method that will allow us to look in our HTML document and find the ID of hexagon. Now let's store this as something. Well, I'm going to store it as hexagon so that we can use it in our JavaScript file. So now we have a target. So I'm going to get the hexagon and I'm going to use add event listener. So the JavaScript method of add event listener so that each time we click on the hexagon, but only the hexagon. So I'm going to pass through a click here. Once again, I'm not making this up. This comes from a long list of things that we can pass through. And once I click the hexagon, I'm just going to get a function. So let's write a function alert me. I just want to say console log clicked. So now we need to pass through a function and that function is alert me. So let's clear this and see if that has worked. Let's click on the hexagon. Let's get our console log out to refresh that. And there we go. Clicked, clicked, clicked. So everything is working here. Let's break this down a bit further. So my target is the hexagon itself. I'm using add event listener. I am passing through an event to invoke a function when the hexagon is clicked. We are listening out to any time someone interacts with a hexagon. And if that event is a click, we invoke the function here. So I mentioned that I did not make this up. Uh, there are plenty of things we can pass into add event listener. Here are just a few. So here we have click. We have double click, we have mouse down, we have so many, this one's depreciated. Let's choose another one. So perhaps we can work with mouse over. So I'm going to replace with this mouse over. Now let's refresh. And as soon as I just hover my mouse over, we invoke the function. So that's pretty cool. I'm not even doing anything. I'm just hovering my mouse over it and it's invoking that function. So that is how add event listener works. As mentioned, I could do it on the window or I can do it on the document itself as well. So this is probably a good time to show you, I'm just gonna comment this out for now. Now, I'm just gonna get rid of all this here. At the moment in our index.js file, we have our script to our JavaScript file at the bottom of our body. So we always keep it here. We make sure that all the HTML elements are above it because we need to load the HTML elements before reading the JavaScript. However, sometimes people like to put the script tag in the header with the CSS file. Okay, so if I move that here, none of my JavaScript would work. This is because we have not read any of the HTML, okay? So what I would do is essentially use and get the document and add event listener and make sure that the DOM content has loaded before, and this is an arrow function, and once everything has loaded, so once all the HTML has loaded, then and only then can I start to pick up my JavaScript. 
okay? So that is another way of uh, picking up JavaScript from our HTML file, and it is using the document ad event listener. A lot of people will tell you that this is the more secure way of doing it, so it's totally up to you how you'd prefer. I'm gonna get rid of this for now, but I do use this approach in some of my games, so just be aware of that. Both are completely correct. So I'm just gonna put this down to the end below all of my HTML elements. So that was a great example of using document with the add event listener. Once again, just to recap, the add event listener takes the target and then we use the add event listener. So the JavaScript method, add event listener, and we pass through an event and the function that we want to call if the event is triggered. So I'm going to ask you to have a go at this yourself. So I'm going to pick out uh, another element. So I'm going to get the body this time. So I'm going to use, I need to pick it out first. So I use document query selector to pick out the body. Let's store this as something, const body. Now, how would I make something show up in my console log, so just the word clicked, if I click anywhere on the body? So anywhere in here. Just use what we learned before. It's exactly the same. Have a think about it. I'm going to pause here. Okay, so I would get the body and I would use add event listener to pass through a click event and then invoke a function. So I can write the function up there or I can simply write function and then in curly braces console log clicked. So there we go. I've just written in one line, but it's exactly the same as what we did before. And now if I click the body, you will see I'm getting a message in our console log that says clicked. Okay, great. I just have one more thing to show you about this before we carry on. Next up, I want to talk about removing event listeners. Okay, so the remove event listener method removes an event handler that has been attached with the add event listener method. Don't worry though, I'm going to show you what I mean by writing this in code. So before we looked at add event listener, so I'm just going to use that once again. I want to add an event listener to my circle to essentially toggle it from being blue to another color. So I'm going to go into my document and use query selector to find the circle. So I'm looking for the class of circle. So the class of circle. And let's store this as circle so we can use it in our JavaScript file. Now let's write a function to do this toggle. So function toggle circle or toggle color maybe, the American eye color. And I'm simply going to grab my circle and then use a JavaScript property of class list. So I'm not making that up. I want to toggle. Toggle is a method. Once again, I'm not making that up. I want to toggle the class list of circle. And I want to toggle circle. So now let's grab the circle and use add event listener on click, let's say, to toggle color. So now if I click on the circle, well, the circle class will disappear. So let's change that to be something else. So I'm going to toggle it. I've got the circle and I want to say red circle. Simply let's just copy all of it. Red. So now if I toggle red circle, there we go. I'm adding and subtracting the red circle class from the div, which already has a class of circle. So that's our default. And then we are simply adding red circle, taking away red circle, adding red circle, taking away red circle from it. 
that is our function. At the moment, everything works. However, I wanted to stop working after 10 toggles. So when we click on this, nothing will happen. So I can do this like this. So we need a count. I'm going to have a count. Let count equals zero. Let's console log count to see what's happening too. It's nice to do that. And if count is suddenly larger than 10, I want to get the circle and I want to remove event listener. I'm just going to remove the same thing. So now let's try it out. Let's get our console log. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And suddenly, no matter how hard we click, we can't toggle the color anymore. And we can't add to the count. That is because our count suddenly got over 10. We got to 11. So that's over 10. So we have written that we want to remove the event listener from the circle that says that when we click, we toggle color. We have removed it. So that is a very basic example of how to use remove event listener. I hope you've enjoyed it because I'm going to make you write your own now. So I'm going to keep the circle here. This time, I want you to use what we've done in the previous lessons. And if our circle gets to here, so about, I don't know, 100 pixels below itself, I want you to remove the event listener so that we can't click it anymore and nothing else happens. Okay, so we did do this previously in these set intervals, so there'll be a little bit of a clue there. I want you to have a go at doing this yourself. Don't worry if you don't get it done. That's what I'm here for. I'm here to help. If you want to have a look at the style sheet, all I have done is simply got a circle that you are going to be working with, that we have picked out to work with, and that is my index.html file. And of course, my folder layout. Okay, I'm going to pause here while you have a go at doing this. I'll see you in a bit. Okay, so first thing I would do is write a function, let's say move circle. And then, well, to move the circle, let's actually let height equal zero. Now, for each time I want to move the circle, I'm actually going to also add a height of 50. And then we need to assign that new height to the circle itself. So let's grab the circle. I'm going to use style. So this is not made up. I'm going to use style and then top and assign it a new height and get the pixel. So in here, I just need to make sure that the position of this is absolute in order for this to work. So position absolute and essentially what we have written here. So we're getting the circle that we are manipulating its style and we're going to be adding a top. So it's just the same as me writing top. 100 pixels so I've just moved it down a little bit so that's what we're going to be doing but in our JavaScript okay so move circle let's attach this to an event listener so let's grab our target I'm going to use add event listener to essentially on click move the circle so maybe this isn't enough. Let's do 100. Why did I add event listener? OK. So now click, click, click. It's moving down. It's good, but it'll carry on doing that. OK, so we'll carry on clicking it and we'll carry on moving down. So we need a rule that says if height suddenly gets over 300 pixels, we want to get the circle and remove the event listener that we added. So let's pass through these rules again and save. So now I get to 300 
we can't click it anymore. We are over 300 pixels in height and we can't move it. So there we go. Okay. I hope you found this useful. Please do write this down. Please do make a note of it. I do hope you're coding along with me as I really do think that's the best way to learn by coding and not just watching. So I hope you enjoyed this and learnt the most you could. I'll see you in the next lesson. So next up, I want to talk to you about the query selector as we're going to be using a lot in this course. Let's do it. The document method query selector returns the first element within the document that matches the specified selector. What I mean by this in code is this. So we're going to be using query selector in order to pick out elements from our HTML. You might have seen this in a few examples already, but I really want to talk to you in depth about this. So here, for example, we have a div with a class of circle. Well, we can actually pick out this div by the div itself, or more specifically by its class. What I mean is this. So I would get the document as we need to pick it out from the HTML document and use query selector. So this is a JavaScript method. I am not making this up and I would pass through so for example, if I wanted to pick out the div, at the moment there's only one div in here, so I don't see a problem with that. I've picked out the div. So now if I console log this out, you will see a div with a class of circle. That's what we have. I've picked it out, so now I can work with it in my JavaScript file. So that is pretty cool. Let's go ahead and save it as something. We're gonna save it as a circle, okay? So that is done. However, what if I start having more and more divs in my HTML file? Well, then I wouldn't really wanna to choose to pick it out by the div element. I would wanna pick this out by the circle class. So you would think I would just pass it in through here like this, but that is wrong. If I write that, nothing will get picked out. So if I console log circle, I get null. This is because we are not searching for a HTML tag or element of circle that doesn't exist. We are searching for the class of circle. So just like in CSS, we need a dot to tell our file that we are looking for a class name of circle. And then you will see that work. So that is essentially how I would use query selector. There is also query selector all. This is for if I want to pick out more than one. So if I, for example, had not just one circle, but two, three circles. Let's just get rid of this absolute styling. two refresh our page so now you will see three circles i can pick out all of these circles with document query selector just gonna go to that or so now i essentially have a node list of three circles or three divs with a class of circle. So once again, if I just had query selector, it would pick out the first div with a class of circle. But if I want all of them, I would need query selector all to get a node list. A node list is not to be confused with an array. A node list is something different. Okay, so we have all our circles here. I can also use query selector to pick out IDs. So I'm just going to make, let's get rid of these for now. I'm going to pick out, so I'm going to make a ID of main and let's give this a red circle class. Let's just get rid of, let's get that red circle back. 
So now we know that our yellow circle is here and we know that our red circle has an ID of main. However, our JavaScript doesn't know that. I can pick out that circle by grabbing its ID like so. So you will see here I've grabbed the element with the ID of main. So just like in CSS, I would tell our JavaScript file this is an ID by using this hash right here. And then I'm storing it as circle. And if I console log out circle, well, we indeed get the div with the class of red circle and the ID of main. So I like using query selector. We can also use get element by ID, in which case we don't need the ID as we already know it's an ID. The method already tells our file that we're looking for an ID. So all I need to do is path through main. So that is me using get element ID. Once again, this is a JavaScript method and I did not make this up. There are in fact a few of these. There's get elements by class name, get element by tag name. So there are a few. However, those are the most popular three that I tend to see when I work on these kind of projects. Okay, I hope that was useful. Let's carry on. Okay, and welcome to our first external project. In this project, I'm gonna ask you to make a dropdown using JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. It is gonna be a great project as it's going to use everything that we have learned so far in order to complete the challenge. If you wanna have a go at this, please do click the YouTube card right here. Otherwise, let's carry on with the course. The choice is totally up to you. Good luck. Okay, so I've already shown you some methods and properties that work on the array JavaScript built-in object. However, I wanna show you some that work on the math built-in object too. So I'm gonna show you the most popular, I'm gonna show you the three most popular ones. Let's do it. First up is math random. The math random function essentially returns a floating point, pseudo random number in the range of zero to less than one. What I mean by this is, so if I just go ahead and console log math random, making sure to spell it correctly and invoke it or call it like this, I will essentially get any number from zero to anything less than one. So if I keep refreshing it, it will never really get to one, 0 0.8, 0 0.4. It'll just keep going forever, giving me completely random numbers. So that is it essentially in a nutshell, but how is this useful to me, you might ask? Well, I actually use this quite a lot, especially when I need to get a random element from a array or random number. I do this a lot in Tetris. So I'm gonna use the Tetris example to show you now. So I'm gonna make a array of tetraminos so I'm just gonna put in three, let's have the L tetramino. Usually I would have this as an object, but I'm just putting it as a string for now, as that's all you need. Z tetramino and I tetramino. So we have three tetraminos. Now, how do you think I would get a random tetramino from my array, completely at random? Well, I'm just gonna keep this up here for now for you. I would need to get a integer, a full integer, and pass it through into my array in order to get something back, right? So that would be the equivalent of me writing tetraminos and then passing through a zero to get back the L tetramino. So I'm just gonna console log that for you so you can see what is happening. So you'll see I get the L tetramino, pass through a one, I get the Z tetramino. If I pass through a two, I get the I tetramino. If I pass through a three, I get undefined because there's nothing there. Let's go with one. So how do you think I can use math random, which spits out essentially at the moment any number from zero to less than one, to give me a random number that I can pass through into my array? But it also has to be the correct length. Well, 
I'm just gonna get this better for now. I can actually use math random to essentially multiply by any number. So if I multiply this by 20, I will get any number that is random from zero to just under 20. So less than 20. If I keep refreshing this, that is what you will see. It will give me numbers that are anywhere from zero to just under 20, so under 20. Now, I'm gonna use this to get a random number from zero to three, but just under three. So I would do this, I could just pass through a three, like that, or I could use my tetraminos length property. So that is essentially a three. So now, if I keep refreshing, I will get a random number anywhere from zero to less than three. It will never get to three. So we're close, we're nearly getting there, but I'm gonna have to introduce another math related function and that is math floor math floor essentially rounds numbers numbers down to the nearest full integer okay so now Let's get const full const integer or maybe random integer. I would essentially let's also store this const random number and I'm just going to store the number we're getting here. So now I would need to use math floor to essentially wrap our random number. So now if I console log random integer, well, you guessed it. I'm just going to clear a few things out. So I'm just going to comma that out here. I'm actually going to console log random number for you here so you can see what is happening. I'm going to get rid of that so let's clear everything. Let's refresh. So here you will see we get the random number of 0 0.27 and we are rounding it down to the fullest integer. So we've rounded it down. The rounding down is important as we don't really want to get a 3, okay? So for example, if we got a, okay, a 2.2, if we were round this up, we would get a three. And of course, zero, one, two, three does not exist on our array. So we will get undefined. We can't round up. We need to round down in this situation. And that's why math floor works. This is opposed to using math seal. which will round up and oops, math round, which will just round to any round to nearest integer, okay? So it will choose which one it's closer to and we don't want that either. We want to round down. Okay, so we have our random integer that has been rounded down. So now instead of passing a one, well, we can just pass that random integer through here because this has a value now, it's a full value. And the random tetramino that we get is the Z tetramino. This is because it's the zero, one, one index in our array, so one. We got a random number of 1.21, we rounded it down to one, and we got the Z tetramino. I could keep refreshing this and never get an undefined because we will always get either a zero, one, or a two. So that's perfect. That has now worked. I hope you can see how useful this is. There are many, many more math uh, functions for you to use. However, I do think these are the most popular. So these and this one. 
feel free to have a look at yourself on the documentation. There's so much documentation out there on JavaScript. However, I do want to focus on these for now. So I'm going to give you a little exercise first. So I'm going to keep this notation just so you can have it. Okay. Let's pretend we are at a bar and there is a drinks menu. So drinks menu. And then let's have a vodka tonic. Let's have a white wine, a beer, and a mocktail for those who don't drink. Mocktail. So your friend essentially asks you to get him a drink for the menu. You ask him what he wants and he says, surprise me. Anything from the drinks menu, pick at random. How would you use JavaScript? Essentially pick a drinks menu at random from this list. I'm going to leave you to it. Please do use everything that you used before in order to solve this and get a random drink from the drinks menu. Don't worry if you want to go back and view what we did before. That's absolutely fine. Just focus on getting this done. And if you don't, also don't worry because we will go through the answer together. So have a go at that and I'll see you in a bit. Okay, so what I would do is I would essentially get the drinks menu itself and I would open this up because we need to pass something through and then I would use math random invoke that and multiply it by my drinks menu length and then wrap all of this in math floor. So that is essentially the solution in one line of code. Let's console log that to see what we get. And we would get a vodka tonic. We would get a beer. We would get a beer again. There's a lot of beer showing up on mocktail. So we are getting everything. We've got a white wine. That is all the items on our drink menu that we are getting at random. Okay? I'm just going to break it down for you step by step. So once again, we would, we need to get a random number. So to get this random number, we would use math random, and then we would multiply it by the number of items in our array. So I could either multiply it by one, two, three, four, or I could use the drinks menu array length property. So now if I console log random number, okay, so we're getting that random number. We just need to round it down now. So const random integer. And to use this, I would use math floor, because remember we want to round down. And then I would pass through the random number. Okay, so let's console log that to see if that has worked. Random integer. Okay, yeah, it's rounding down. We got 3.5 and we rounded it down to three. And then finally, we would get our drinks menu and pass through the random integer. So let's console log that. And great. Once again, we are getting random drinks from the menu. Let's try using math seal. So it's working, it's working. However, we get undefined. This is because we rounded it up. They got, we got 3.14, but we rounded up to four. There is no fourth item in our array, so we get undefined. We would also never get vodka tonic. Okay, so no matter how hard you tried, your friend would never get a vodka tonic. Okay, so that was fun. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, that is it. That is all I'm going to cover for the math inbuilt JavaScript objects. I think that's fine for now. I mean, this is a crash course, so I think we're ready to carry on. In this next part, we are going to go back to our website to give it a final touch by creating a responsive burger menu navbar. 
This is going to be great as we will be implementing some JavaScript functionality to our website for the first time. So what are we waiting for? Let's do it. Okay, so I'm really excited about this section because we are going back to the project that we started building in our HTML and CSS, but we're going to start applying some JavaScript. We are going to start doing this by making our navbar responsive. What I mean by responsive is that it's going to have a different view in mobile than it does to tablet and desktop. So what we are going to be making is a simple responsive nav bar that turns into a hamburger bar if it is a mobile and is the way it looks as it is now when it is tablet and desktop. Okay, so let's get to it. The first thing we need to do to build our hamburger responsive nav bar is go into our index HTML and find our nav bar that we have built out. So it's this, this section up here. It's got a logo and our unordered list that is called navbar. So in between them is where I'm actually gonna put my hamburger uh, button. So it is a button, so I need a button tag for this. And I'm just gonna give it the class of hamburger. I'm also going to give it an ID of hamburger as well. Great. Now in here, it's going to be a lesson back to our font awesome icons. So I'm going to use an icon, so an icon tag. And I already have found a hamburger uh, icon for us to use. So I'm just going to type it in here for us now and hit refresh. So there it is, it's currently in a button. It doesn't look great, so let's style it up. So I'm gonna do this right at the very bottom, even though we will be using this nav bar. So I'm just gonna cut that out. That's our current styling at the moment. I'm just gonna put that here. Okay, so let's grab our hamburger by its class. And I'm just going to get rid of the border. So I'm going to give it a border of zero and a background color because I don't like it being white at the moment. I want to make it transparent. So immediately that just looks a lot better. Let's perhaps move it down a bit so it's in line with the text. Margin top 20 pixels. It's a bit much maybe. Let's say 15 pixels. Okay, perfect. So our hamburger is there. However, we only want it to appear if it's in mobile, not when it's in tablet or desktop. So we can do that using the media query. So as a refresher, we use the media query here. I'm gonna use the same logic just so everything's consistent. So what this means is that anything that we, hold on apply in here will essentially change any element. So for example, the hamburger element or the element with the class of hamburger, it will apply this styling to anything above 500 pixels in width. Okay, so we know we don't want to see the hamburger when it's above 500 pixels. So I'm simply going to put display none. Fresh. So now you will see our hamburger disappears when we go over 500 pixels. Great. Now we want the opposite for this, right? So as soon as we see the hamburger, we want the nav bar to disappear. So I'm going to do this by actually, we need to make the nav bar disappear up here. So I'm going to get this nav bar put that in here and above this I'm going to make NAS bar display now okay so there we go under 500 pixels above 500 pixels under 500 pixels above 500 pixels great 
That is because the styling that we have for anything above 500 pixels involves the bagger deleting, bagger disappearing, and the nav bar having styling. And the opposite for when we're outside of this, so when we're in mobile form. We are designing mobile first, okay, so this is like the default, and anything above that needs specific styling, yeah. So that is mobile first design is the most popular way of designing anything now as we do view most of our sites on mobile. Okay, so now we have that done, let's actually get to implementing some JavaScript to give our button some functionality. And by functionality, I mean, I want there to be a drop down if I click on the hamburger icon. So let's do it. The first thing that we need to do, if we remember from our JavaScript lesson, is actually create a JavaScript file. So just as before, I'm going to create a directory called source, which is going to store our index.js file. So let's add a file called index.js. If you've done it correctly, you'll see a JavaScript icon show up. This is because we are using the JavaScript extension. We are telling our IDE that we want to be working with JavaScript. I'm actually also going to put my styles CSS file in here, which is going to break everything for now. So we need to actually fix that. So we need to go in here and instead of linking to our style CSS, I'm going to link to the source styles CSS. And I'm also going to have to link our index.js file. So I'm going to do this at the bottom of my file. I need to do it after any or all the HTML tags, I need to put the script tag last. So I'm just going to put the script tag like this. And as the source, I'm going to give the path to the index.js file. So because we are on the root of our project, we do go into the source file and get the index.js file. So that is now done. Once again, if you do remember from our introduction to JavaScript, so the very first lessons of our JavaScript section, I don't have to use the script tag at the bottom. I can also put it in the header. Okay, so that is an option too. However, if we do put it in the header, we need to have an event listener for this file. So I haven't done it for here, but I do do it in a few tutorials. So please go check out some of my game tutorials where I do that. So just be aware that there's two ways of linking your JavaScript file. Okay, now the first thing I want to do is actually grab our hamburger so we can work with it. So for this, I would use document. I'm going to use get element by ID because our hamburger here does have an ID. So I'm going to use that. So I'm just going to pass through the name of the ID. And of course, we need to store it as something. So let's store it as hamburger button. So there we go. We've got a hamburger button. That's great. The next thing we also need to grab is the nav uh, unordered list itself. So I'm going to go const nav and then document once again. And then let's go back here. Does it have an ID? It has a class. But I'd rather just give it an ID. We don't have to, but I think I want to show you um, that you can have classes and ID, so I'm going to do it and I'm just going to put nav list because it's an unordered list. So let's go back here, let's store nav list document, get element by ID, and then nav list. Okay, so we have those two things picked out. The next thing I want to do, well, what do you think we need to do? apart from save this file. The next thing we need to do is actually add an event listener to the button itself. So if you remember, I would get the hamburger button and use add event listener. And we're gonna be listing out for a click. So once again, I did not make this up. This is one of the options that we can pass through into an event listener. And once we click it, well, we want something to happen. We want to toggle the button. So that is a function that we have not yet written. 
So once again, what I'm saying here is I'm grabbing the hamburger element. I'm then using a JavaScript method of add event listener to listen out for any clicks, for any time we click the hamburger element itself. So just here. And if we do click it, well, I want to toggle the button. So let's actually write that toggle button function now. Let's open up our parentheses and there we go. So now we need to actually grab the nav list itself and then use a JavaScript property of class list. So I did not make this up. I'm essentially going into my style sheet. Okay. And I'm going to search for a class, which at the moment doesn't exist. I'm going to toggle. Once again, I did not make this up. This is a method that will act on the class that we find. I'm going to toggle the show class. So yeah, we have not written it. That's why we're getting a lot of red here. We need to actually write it. And I want to attach it to the nav bar. So I'm going to get the nav bar and show. And instead of having display none, I'm just going to put display flex. Okay, so now if we refresh and we click the button, there we go. We are seeing our navbar show up. It hasn't been styled yet, so don't worry, but let's just make sure that works. So nothing on desktop, nothing on tablet. We are on mobile and then it's click. So we're literally toggling the show class to be on, off, on, off, display flex, display none. Display flex, display none. Okay, now let's get to styling this a little bit more. So once again, I'm actually going to, let's make sure to get rid of the outline. So hamburger focus. Outline none. Okay, so that gets rid of that weird outline that we had before, that blue one. Now let's make sure that these display stacked. So in here, I'm just going to put display, as you know, flex direction column. There we go. And it's totally up to you how you want to style this. So I think I'm going to keep it consistent with uh, most of the things in here. So that's already looking better. And perhaps let's have the nav bar to the right instead. So let's go back in here. I'm going to move this under here. It's totally up to you how you want it, but I think that's looking good. I'm really liking how this is looking so far. You can of course really style this up however you wish. So let's perhaps outside of here, so in the default, so in the mobile view, give our list items some styling. So I'm just going to go back on color white. And there you go. They have white background colors and now padding 30 pixels. So you can really go crazy. I'm going to say that I want five pixels and 30 pixels. Okay. So like that. Bear in mind, this will style anything um, below here as well. So just keep that in mind too. Or you can simply go into the nav bar like so. And this will mean that only the list items in the element with nav bar will be styled in a certain way. So all of these list items, because they're in the unordered list with the class of nav bar, I'm going to be styled to have a background color white. So you will see these are ineffective because they are not in the navbar, even though they are list items. 
So that's a cool uh, tip for you. Let's also give them maybe a border radius. Border radius, four pixels, and a margin of zero pixels. Actually, maybe margin of five pixels. So there you go. Styling really is a lot of fun. You can really spend loads of hours on this. Let's just check it's working for here. And that styling is not applied. Ah, it has been applied. That is because we need to once again go in here. So nav bar this item and then remove the styling. Or we can just take the styling from up here that was our default so apply that and background color transparent zero pixels Padding zero. Mm, padding. Padding ten pixels. Okay. So let's try that out again. And yeah, everything is looking great. We have built our responsive navbar. Let's carry on. Next up, I want to talk to you about the JavaScript date object. The JavaScript date object represents a single moment in time in a platform independent format. Date objects contain a number that essentially represents milliseconds since the 1st of January 1970 UTC. But enough talk, I'm just going to show you how it works first because I think it's better to show it visually. So first off, I'm actually just going to use it as I would use it normally. So there we go, and console log. I'm just going to talk you through this. So what I am using here is the constructor. So I'm creating a new date object. So I did not make this up. This is a constructor and it is how we essentially get today's date, but not just today's date. I've stored it as today so I can show you we get all of this. So currently it is Wednesday. It is indeed 2 p.m. here over in London. So we are Greenwich Mean Time. That is the simplest way of showing you date. It's pretty cool. It'll work wherever you are and you can use it to get today's date. Now, there are plenty of other things that we can do. So for example, I can also get the day, const day, I can get today and use get, actually let's get the date first, so date, console log date, this will give me the date, so as in today, today is the 6th of the month, I can also get the day, so once again I would use today and get day, which will give me the day of the week. So let's go ahead and console of day. And that will give me three because it's a Wednesday. So we do get them in uh, integer values because you never know what language someone is speaking. We can also get the full year. So full year. And I would just simply get today again and full year, such as that. We need to get it, get full year. So let's console log full year. And we get the year 2021. There's so, so many we can use as well. I'm just going to show you one more, which is hours. And once again, I would use today. So what we've stored as new date and get 
hours and console log hours to get the hours. So today at the moment it is 2 p.m. So essentially what we're working off is this, okay? That's what we're using. It's absolutely great. I love using this. It is very useful for so many, so many reasons. For example, we can use it to find out how much time we have until a specific time. So like a countdown. So that is what I'm gonna show you now. Actually, one more I'm gonna show you because it is useful as well is the ISO string. So ISO string date. And I will also get today and to ISO string because this is quite a popular one to use for programmers uh, to really sort of standardize how we deal with dates. And there you go, you get it as sort of like a numeric and alphanumeric value. So that is a really useful one, a useful one to know too. I use it for when I work with APIs, for example, to give something a timestamp. Okay, so let's actually do this. So say we want to build a countdown. We want a countdown to next Christmas. Okay, so how would we do this? I'm going to actually do a countdown here. So we know that Christmas is, should we do it in this format here? So I'm just going to use it in ISO string format actually. So this is Christmas. Let's just set it to 2021. So the 12th month. And for me, it's the 24th. And let's just keep the time the same. I'm just going to put it as a string. Let's clear that. And then I also need to put this in the constructor. Okay. So now we have our Christmas. Now, if I have the console log get Christmas and just minus today or what we have stored as today in our console log we get the difference in milliseconds okay so that is the difference in milliseconds we can even use this to create a timer to count down the minutes until next Christmas so let's do this now const minutes equals so I'm just gonna get should we store this or something? Okay, const milliseconds to Xmas, Christmas, minus today, and then two minutes. Well, we'd get milliseconds to Christmas and divide the value by 60,000. It's meant to be a minus. Okay, so that is exactly how many minutes we have left. I'm just going to get rid of that so it's less confusing. Console log minutes to Christmas. And now let's make our timer. So I'm just going to use, I'm going to pick out the purple element, which I've already made as date. So I'm going to use, I'm going to do up here. Don't need all this space, so let's just condense it a little bit. I'm going to have const display equals document query selector, not all, we just need one, and find the element with the class of date, and then use display inner HTML, so the property of inner HTML to display the minutes. One thing I can do, I don't have to, is change this to a string. So I would use to string, which is a JavaScript method. Let's maybe change this to date display, date display. I'm not sure what's happening here. Very strange. Date display in a HTML string text content. Ah, we're looking for the date class. That's my fault. Okay, so let's put the minutes back in. Okay, great. 
So we have our minutes there. We let's change. We don't need to do this as a string then, but we do get a very long uh, number. So let's actually break it down. I just want it to be in minutes. So once again, let's use what we've done before. Math round this time. I'm just going to round it to the nearest minute. Let's go in here. I'm just going to make the color of the font white and font size 70 pixels. Text align center. Oops. So there we have it. That is exactly how many minutes we have until Christmas. Great. So that is why I like the date. If you check on this tomorrow, it will obviously change. If we wait a minute as well, this will go down. That's exactly why the new date is so cool. So there you go, you've seen it change. Okay, great. Uh, I think this was really useful. I hope you enjoyed it. I really like working with the date. So yeah, hope you learned a lot and I'll see you on the next lesson. Okay, so we've come to the part about the course where I want to talk to you about timers. There are three timers that I want to focus on and I'm pretty excited. They are really useful. Let's get to it. First up, we're going to talk about the set timeout. The set timeout method essentially calls a function or evaluates an expression after a specified number of milliseconds has passed. What I mean by this is this. We use the set timeout. In this syntax, we essentially pass through a function and then the amount of milliseconds that we need to pass or we want to pass in order to execute that function. So that is the syntax. Please keep that in mind. We're going to use it in order to display some text in our speech bubble after three seconds. So what do we need for this? Well, we need to know what three seconds is. So const time and three seconds is essentially 3000 milliseconds. So that is the time we need to pass. We already know what we're going to put through in here. So let's do that. So set timer. I did not make this up. Okay. And I did not make up the syntax for it. So we need to put in a function here and then the time because we stored that as a variable. We could just as well put through 3000, but we are going to put through time instead. And well, what do we want to happen? Well, we want to invoke a function. So let's write the function now, show bubble, show text. Let's open up our curly braces. And this is the function that we want to invoke. So I'm just going to put it through there. So at the moment, it doesn't really do much. Let's just check this is working though. Console log all good. Save. And let's wait three seconds. To clear it again. So just change that. Save. One, two, three. Refresh. One, two, three. All good. Okay, so that seems to be working. Let's actually get our text showing up. So for this, once again, I need to grab, so I'm gonna grab the bubble. So what I would need to do is document, so I'm not making this up, use query selector to search for the class, so dot for class of bubble, and let's save this as speech bubble. So that is essentially our speech bubble now. Now in the function, I essentially want to get the speech bubble and in the inner HTML, I want to put some text. So let's put the text. Hey, dude. And save. And there we go. We are indeed getting the message, hey dude, I'm just going to style that out perhaps a little bit so it looks a little bit better. Let's give it some padding, 20 pixels. 
pints per hundred. Okay, so there we go. We are getting Hey Dude show up after one, two, three seconds. Let's refresh that. One, two, three. Hey Dude. Brilliant. So that is how we would use set timeout to essentially make something happen after three seconds. We could also make another. I'm just going to do something else. So let's make the text show up after three seconds and after 10 seconds let's make the whole thing disappear so i'm just going to use function delete text so i'm just going to do it in the same way that we did it before set timeout so we pass through a function so i'm going to pass through delete text and the time that we want this to disappear after. So I could just put 10,000 milliseconds. So is that 10,000 10, milliseconds? So that is 10 seconds. So that is another way of writing that, just passing through the number itself. And in here, just put speech bubble in a HTML. And I'm just going to leave it as blank. So now, one, two, three, hey dude, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then that disappears. Okay, so that is pretty cool. Another way you might see this written is actually instead of the function, so I've taken out the function here and written it like so. I have seen it written like this as well. So I'm just going to comment this out for now. I could essentially get this set timeout. Let's open up our parentheses. So we need to pass through a function here, and then it's passed through 10,000 seconds again, 10,000 milliseconds, sorry. And instead of just passing through the function like this, I could literally write the function. So a function, invoke the function, open up a couple of curly braces, and then put in what we want to happen. So that is the same as me writing that i just written it in one line. It is totally up to you as to how you want to do it. I prefer this. I think it's more readable, but of course this is an option too. So let's check it out. One, two, three. Hey dude, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And there it goes. Okay, so that is all I really want to show you on set timeout. I just want to maybe show you one more uh, example with an exercise that you can do yourself. So hopefully you made a note of that. If you haven't, pause here. I want you to use a set timeout to get rid of the whole bubble after five seconds. Have a think about how you would do this. If you don't know or just want to see me show you the answer, that's fine. I'm going to pause here for those of you who want to have a go at doing this anyway. So I'll see you in a bit. So have a go at doing this yourself. Build out the HTML and CSS you need for it to work. You can simply just build out your own. We are just testing if the JavaScript that we wrote works. Okay. So the way I would do this is, once again, let's get our set timeout. We know that we want to pass through a function after five seconds, so 5,000 milliseconds. But what is the function? Right, well, I would get a function and let's call it delete bubble. And then let's open up our curly braces. And then this time, well, I would still need to go in so I'm still going to go in to our document and use query selector to find the div or is it a div? Yeah, div with a class of bubble. So I'm just going to get that and let's store it as bubble. What's the bubble? Okay, so delete bubble. Well, I would get the bubble. And then I would actually use style 
display and pass through none. Okay, so that's how we'll do it. And then let's actually put this in here. Click save. One, two, three, four, five. And ta-da! The bubble has now gone. We still have this little speech thing, so we could have actually maybe given this a class. And let's just say speech bubble. Save that. I'm going here, but speech bubble instead. And once again, one, two, three, four, five. And the whole thing has now gone. Okay, so I hope you now feel comfortable using set timeout because I want to introduce another timer for you next. Next up, I want to talk to you about the set interval and how it's different to set timeout. The set interval essentially calls a function or evaluates an expression at specified intervals. It will continue calling the function until the interval is cleared or the window is closed. So what this means is essentially unlike set timeout, which will invoke something after X amount of milliseconds, this will keep calling the function, okay? It will keep calling the function, say, every three seconds if we tell it to. It will keep doing it and doing it and doing it until we tell it to stop or we close a window down. So I'm going to show you this with an example. Set interval. So let's open up our parentheses again. Similarly, it takes a function and then the milliseconds that we need milliseconds that we want to pass until we can invoke the function, but we keep doing it over and over and over again. So I'm going to show you this now, milliseconds. So let's keep that there. I'm just going to comment that out so you can keep seeing it. Let's say, for example, that I want to get some text in here again, but I want it to keep flashing at us. So I want it to say alert. So const text equals alert. And then let's get an emoticon. So I'm just going to use that for the text. Now, let's say that we want it to keep going every two seconds. So const time equal to 1000 milliseconds. So there we have our two things that we need in order to get this working. Let's write a function called show alert. Open up our curly braces and then let's grab this again. So we need to grab the bubble. Up here, I'm going to say const bubble equals document query selector. So we need to find the bubble. So we're looking for the class of bubble. Now in the bubble, and this time I actually want to append child. So I'm appending. So in here, here's my bubble. I'm putting something in here. Okay, so I'm appending something inside. Uh, before we do this, actually, let's just check everything's working. So I'm just going to console log working. And then let's get our set interval. And then we need to pass through the function. So show alert and the time. So 2000 milliseconds and save. And you will see here in the console log, two, two, one, two. So each time after two seconds, we're getting another working getting printed, okay? And this will carry on doing that, okay? It will keep going and going and going until we tell it to stop. So we know that is working. Now, for each two seconds, I actually want to put a div inside here. So I'm going to create a div. Const text display. And I'm going to use create 
element. So another JavaScript method, create element. And I'm going to create a div. And with that text display, I want to give it the inner HTML of the text. So that's a lot. So I've created a div. We need document here, document. So we need to make sure the document is before the create element. So there's a lot of new things working with here. This is an advanced example that I want to show you. So create element, I did not make up. Document, I did not make up. Div, I did not make up. We want to create a div that we are storing as a text display. And then is, and then in this div, we want to put the inner HTML of alert. And then we want to get the bubble and use append child. Again, I did not make this up. This is a JavaScript method to put in the text display after we have given it the text. So just going to refresh that. And there we go. Two seconds. Alert, 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 alert. It will essentially keep on going and keep on going until we tell it to stop. We are appending. We are essentially putting in. So each time I'm putting in a div here again and again and again and again. That is essentially what I have written. Okay. But in code. And this will keep happening over and over again. So I hope you've enjoyed this example. Let's finish off with a little exercise. I'll make it a lot easier. I think it's good to start off with a complicated example and then start off easy. So using set interval, I simply want you to print out in the console log your name. So how would you do this? I'm just going to clear this so it stops running. Well, you would get these set intervals, so you do not make this up. Send interval is essentially a function that we can use. And then we pass through a function. Okay, so a function and the time that we want to invoke it. So say we want to print our name in the console log. I'm going to call this function print name. Let's go console log. And then I'm just going to print Anya. So now I can pass through this function print name and then let's invoke it every five milliseconds. So that is five seconds in milliseconds. Let's refresh and see if that has worked. Let's go our console log here. There we go. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. Five. So it's going three now. One, two, three, four, five. And we'll keep doing this until we clear it. So that is how you set interval. Next up, I'm going to show you how to clear this interval using another JavaScript method. Okay, so in this section, we're going to focus on clear interval. We're going to use this to clear a set interval that we have running. So let's do it. So here I have the set interval that we were working with before. I'm going to introduce another interval called clear interval. Using clear interval will stop the time running in my example up here. So I would essentially stop this from running by assigning this to a variable or an ID. I'm going to call it. I'm going to call it a const timer ID. OK, so if I console log timer ID, Well, we would simply get just a simple number, okay? It's just an ID for us to work with, like so. We can now use this ID that JavaScript has given us to clear the time interval. So at the moment, you can see we're up to four. If I essentially then get this time ID and put it in clear interval, well, we stop this whole thing from running. OK, so that's how that would work. But let's see it in a more real life example. OK, so in this example, I want to essentially move my bubble down. And I want this to happen every one second. I want you to move it down to around here. OK. And once it gets to here, 
I want it to stop. So I want you to have a go at doing this yourself. One thing that I will help you with, however, as I do think it's important, as in this exercise, you're going to be manipulating the style using JavaScript, is that I'm actually going to give this speech bubble div, so this whole thing here that holds these two together, a position absolute. This is a tip. We need the position of the speech bubble to be absolute in order to give it a... Uh, a top, left, right, or bottom pixel in the CSS. So for example, if I was to do this 50 pixels, then it would move up 50 pixels, but without the position absolute, nothing will happen. We need position absolute, not relative. For this occasion, we want absolute for this to work. So now I'm gonna move it around wherever I want, okay? But that is its default. Okay, so we're gonna be using this syntax. We're gonna be using set interval to move the whole speech bubble down to around here. We want this to happen every one second. And once it gets here, I want to stop. So that is your exercise. Please feel free to have a pause here and think about it. If you don't really wanna pause, you just wanna see the solution, that is what I'm gonna do in a minute. So I'm going to let you have a go at it anyway, and I'll see you in a bit. Okay, so the way I would do this is like this. I would, of course, get the set interval. And we need to pass through a function and the millisecond. So we already know we want this to happen every one second. So I've gone ahead and put a thousand milliseconds and let's write a function called move bubble. Okay, so we know that's gonna be the function. I'm just gonna put it in here. Now in our function, what do we want to happen? Well, as long as the height, let's say, okay, so let's get a height here. Let height, I'm gonna start off with zero. And then I'm going to actually pick out this so I can use it. So document query selector. Once again, I'm not making this up. These are a JavaScript method that will allow us to look in here and pick out the div with the class of speech bubble so we can use it in our JavaScript. So class dot for class. And let's store this as something so we can use it in here. I'm going to call it a speech bubble. So now, if I got the speech bubble and use style, so by using style, I'm essentially saying I want to get the style of the speech bubble. I want to get this. I want to give it a top and let's say 100 pixels. So I need to, this needs to be on a string actually. So there you go. See, I can move it around now from my JavaScript. So I'm also going to use the height to do this. So instead of 100 here, I'm just going to put height plus 100 pixels. So at the moment it's zero, it's up there. Cool. Let's maybe put it back where it was, like 100. Now, I want to increase this height every one second. So I would do this by essentially getting the height and using the assignment operator to add... I don't know, 50 pixels to it each time. And then each time that happens, I want to assign it to the speech bubble. So I'm assigning the new height to it. Oh, and it's already going. See, there you go. Woo. However, it's not stopping. So let's fix that. If height deeply equals, say, I don't know, 300, then we want to clear the interval. And we clear the interval by typing through or by passing through an ID. So we need to put this on an ID, let timer ID equal, so that we can stop this set interval. So I will then get this and pass that through. So now, it would stop there. Okay, I'm just going to console log it to see what is happening. 
So console log height, 150, 200, 250, 300. And because height deeply equals 300, we clear the time ID and this has all stopped. I could all make, make, also make this, you know, when height is bigger than 300, if you're not sure if it's going to be a specific amount, that will essentially work too. So when the height is bigger than 300, that will stop. Okay, obviously it stopped in a different location because we managed to get to 350. You can do bigger than or equal than, and that will be the same response so it will stop in the same place great so that is a more complicated a more real world example of how do you set interval it is one that i use in my games i use it in doodle jump and flappy bird so if you want to check those out please do now would be the perfect time to do so okay that's it for timing events i will see you in the next lesson we have got to that stage in the course where I'm going to talk to you about classes in JavaScript. This part is a bit more advanced, so I'm really excited that you got to this part. There's a lot of learning to do, so let's get to it. In JavaScript and in many other programming languages, classes are the template for creating objects. I actually like to think of classes as special functions. Okay, so I know that doesn't mean a lot to you now, but just as you can define function expressions and function declarations, the class syntax actually has two components, class expressions and class declarations. As a beginner, this is a lot, so I'm going to break it down for you now. So one way to define a class is using the class declaration. To declare a class, you simply need to put the class keyword with the name of the class after it. So I'm going to put, for example, rectangle. Okay. And then we need to get a constructor because this is how we're going to construct our rectangle. We're going to have a height and a width. Okay. So this is the syntax we're going to use. We're going to introduce the this word. This height equals height and this width equals width. So you don't know yet, but we've essentially made a sort of template. Whatever we pass through into the class. So for example, if I want to make a new rectangle, as rectangles come in many widths and many heights, I would simply use new rectangle and pass through a height. So let's put 300 and a width of 100. So let's have a look at this. We are making a new rectangle. And essentially, thanks to this, I know that this is the height and this is the width of the rectangle. Because we're getting this 300 that's passing through, it's going into our constructor, and then it's going here, and we are assigning it to this height. So this whole classes height, and the same for width. So we're getting this value going do -do -do, width. This is now assigned to the rectangle width, the rectangle's width, okay? So console, let's store this as something, const new rectangle. So if I console log new rectangle, I get, ta-da! So I get a new rectangle based on what we wrote this, based on this template, I have a new rectangle. So now if I go rectangle height, I get 300. And if I go rectangle width, I get 100. So it's a template. In fact, I think the easiest way for us to really get to grips with this is to just do it over and over again. So one example where I use this is Pac-Man. I essentially make a class and I call it a ghost class because I use it in order to make my four ghosts. So here we have our ghost and then I use a constructor and in it I pass through a name 
a speed of the ghost because each of my ghosts travel at different speeds in my game and then a color of the ghost as well and then a starting point of where I want each ghost to start at the very beginning of my game and for this so I know I have a name so this name equals name because whatever I pass into the constructor and then need to assign to this ghost's name okay this speed equals speed this color equals color and this starting point equals starting point okay so if I just console log the class of ghost nothing is gonna happen I just get essentially what we have written so very boring now say I want blinky const blinky or actually maybe say const no okay fine let's go blinky and then I create a new ghost so I'm using my class using the constructor so I need to pass through these things Blinky is going to have a name of Blinky and then a color of blue. I think he's blue. Can't really remember. Blue. He's also, oh wait, we missed speed. So it's important to keep these in the right order. Otherwise, different things will be assigned to different things and it will be wrong. He moves at a speed of 300 milliseconds. And then it's starting point on a random board it's going to be position four in an array okay so now const blinky inky once again i would have to get a new ghost and pass through inky so we use the name we can also call this a class name as that's what i used it for in my game so then class name class name so that we can use it to essentially assign class names in the game and whatever inky was that would be the color of the square where it's in and then let's give him a speed of 250 milliseconds so he travels at 250 milliseconds uh, which is faster than blinky and then gave him a color of actually this one's blue isn't it and then he'll start position 10 and the same for the other two. So Blinky, Inky, Pinky, and Clyde. So Pinky, Clyde. Let's just make these up. Well, we know that is pink. We know that is orange. So this one is red. Let's just say 20 and position 15. Okay, so we've stored our ghosts, we've created all these ghosts, it's great, we use a template to do this. So now if I console log, if I want to find out what is Blinky's speed, I get 300, because that is indeed Blinky's speed. If I want to find out Clyde's starting point, I get 15. And that is indeed correct. So that is how I used classes in my Pac-Man game. It was super useful. If you do want to take a moment to try our project with all you learned so far, now is the perfect time. After learning classes, you are all set to go and try learn Pac-Man. So I really suggest you do Pac-Man at this moment in time. I hope you enjoy it. Or if you'd rather just carry on learning, please carry on watching this tutorial. See you in the next lesson. Well done, everyone. You have just completed your lesson on classes. As promised, I've provided you with an external project, and that is my Pac-Man game. In this game of Pac-Man, you will learn how to use classes by building out ghosts and using each ghost's properties in order to move them at different speeds, start them off at different positions, asking class names, and much more. If you would like to try this project, please click the YouTube card right here. Otherwise, let's carry on.
The choice is totally up to you. You can save this project and come back to it if you wish as well. Okay, so in this next section, we're going to focus on keys or keyboard events. What I mean by this is we're going to link up the keys on our keyboard in order to move things in our browser. So let's do it. So I think the best way to show you this section is just by doing. So let's get straight to it. Here we have our body in our CSS file. I also just have a simple index HTML file with nothing much in it apart from our body and then our index.js file. Let's just make sure to save all of these. So the first thing I'm gonna do is actually just make a circle in here because it's the circle that we're gonna move when we press a key on our keyboard. So I'm just gonna give it a width of 100 pixels, height of 100 pixels, border radius, 50 pixels, and background color. Let's go blue violet. Now let's actually put it in. So I'm gonna just put it in here above the script tag as a div with the class of circle. So class circle, and there we go. Now, the first thing I wanna do is actually pick out the element so that we can communicate with it. So let's go ahead and do that now. Const circle equals document. Query, hope you are used to using these by now. Query selector, I want to pick out the class of circle. Now, I am going to write a function that essentially, if I press the arrow to the left, I'm going to move my circle a little bit to the left, let's say 50 pixels to the left, by grabbing it and manipulating its style from the JavaScript file. If I press the arrow right, it's going to go right. If I press the arrow up, it's going to go up. And if I press the arrow down, well, you guessed it, it's going to go down. So I'm going to write a function for this. I'm going to call the function control. Now through it, I need to pass an E for event. Okay, so I can either pass through the word event or E. That is totally up to us. And then if event key deeply equals, and then let's say, arrow left. I'm just going to console log this out for now. Pressed left to see if it works and save. Now, of course, we need to attach this to an event listener because we need to actually listen out to things happening. So for this, I'm going to use document add event listener. So I'm going to listen out to the whole document this time. So I'm not attaching it to the circle. I'm not attaching it to the body. I'm listening out to the whole document to listen out for any time there is a key pressed up. So once again, I am not making this up. Key up is uh, something that we need to pass through into the event listener. I could also have key down. That will just mean that we're going to listen out for a key down instead of when we lift our key up off a key on our keyboard. And I'm going to pass through control. So I'm literally passing through this function here. So we're going to listen out to any time we've pressed a key down. So now, if I press the arrow left, you will see press left. This is the syntax for doing it. I will need to pass through an event. So I've written a function. I've passed through an event. I can even put E for short, that is totally up to us. And if the key that I pressed deeply equals arrow left, well, we know that we have pressed the left arrow on our keyboard, okay? So that is essentially how you would listen out for keys being pressed on your entire web page. Okay, so we've got our arrow left. Let's do Let's listen out for an arrow right console log pressed right else if the key deeply equals arrow up 
also log pressed up else if arrow down oops, e key deeply equals arrow down console log arrow pressed down okay so let's try it out let's make that deeply equals hit refresh and just try pressing the arrows to see if you get each one. So up, down, left, and right. Perfect. Now, I do want to mention one thing, and that is uh, the E key code. So this is one way of writing it. I could also be very specific and have different keys. So I can have the A key. So let's refresh that. And if I press the A key this time, well, then I would get the press left. So I can do anything I want really. Um, just make sure to get the spelling right on these. Before this, before the E key, there was something called E key code in which you would have to actually get the key code for the keys on your keyboard. This would involve researching what key has which code so for example, I would have to research that the left arrow on my keyboard has the key of the integer value 37 and that the key for right would be 39. So that's the key code. And then the up arrow, well, that would have the key code of 38 key code. And then the arrow down would have the 40 integer key code. So once again, if I was to try this out on my keyboard, let's get our console log up. You will see everything works exactly the same. However, this approach is uh, nearing depreciation. So we are moving on with this. You might see it in a lot of exercises. I know I've used it in the past for some of my projects. So just be aware that this um, is now being replaced by E key and then the string of arrow left, okay? So it's just something for you to know. I'm just gonna switch these back to the way they were. So E key deeply equals arrow right, and E key, not key code, deeply equals arrow up. And the last one, E key deeply equals arrow down. So let's just show that again to see if that works. Console, press right, press up, press left, press down. Perfect. One thing you can also do is make this a switch case. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about switch cases now. So here we've got the whole function written as an if statement. However, I'm just gonna comment that out for now because we're gonna talk about the switch. The switch statement evaluates an expression matching the expression's value to a case clause and executes statements associated with that case. What I mean by this is this. So we've just written our uh, control function with an if statement. However, I can also use a switch statement, which might be a little bit neater for this example, and we can definitely use it. So a switch case would look like this. I would use the word switch to let our JavaScript know that we are going to be writing a switch case. I will then pass through the common denominator of all these if statements. So that is the E key. And because the E key equals something each time, we are ready to do a switch case for this. So if the E key deeply equals, let's write a case of 
arrow left. But then we want a console. Pressed left and break out of this. Okay, we don't want anything else to happen. Now let's do the same for case arrow right. So this is just the same. I'm literally rewriting all of this with a switch case. It's the same. We are getting our E key and we are checking if it equals arrow left. And if it doesn't, we are moving on to the next case. So arrow right. And then we want a console log pressed right. And again, then break out of this. Next up, we have the arrow up. And if it is an arrow up, or if it deeply equals the arrow up, you want to have pressed up and break out of the switch case. And finally, in case arrow down, we want a console log. Arrow press down, break out of the switch case. And finally, we need a default. So as you will see, it's expecting a default case. So let's go ahead and do that as a default. I'm just going to say console dog. Key not recognized. Okay, so let's try that now. Let's get our console log up, refresh. Let's press the left key, right key, up key, down key. Now let's press a random key and key not recognized. So great, we have now written our if statement with a switch case, which I think looks a lot neater. Okay, so I'm just going to get rid of this for now. If you want to make a note of that, please do. Otherwise, let's carry on. So we have our console log saying the right thing. That's great. However, we're still not moving the circle anywhere. So let's go ahead and do that now. Well, I would grab the circle. And first off, let's actually give our circle a position of absolute. Okay, this is so we can know where it is on our screen at all times. So that is its default position. I'm also going to just comment this out for now so we know what the actual default position is of our circle and it's right there. So now if I gave it a left 50 pixels, I would move the circle right by essentially giving it some left spacing right here. I can also do top 50 pixels. And the same will happen. So let's get rid of that for now. And let's get to doing that in our JavaScript. So I would grab the circle. And once again, I'm going to need like a Y and an X axis. So I'm going to say let X axis equal. And then let's just do a camera case. S X axis equal zero. And if circle is pressed left, so I'm pressing the left button, I need to give it some right padding. But because we're here, maybe let's start off with the circle right. So I'd grab the circle, use style. And then to go right, so I'm pressing the right button, I will need to add left spacing to it. And that would be the x-axis plus pixels because I need to pass through the x-axis. Before doing that, I want to get the x-axis, use the assignment operator to add 50 to it. So let's check that out. Let's click our right button. And there we go. We are now adding 50 to the x-axis each time we press the right button. So let's console log what that looks like. Console log 
x-axis. Refresh that. This can be quite temperamental. 50, 100, 150, 200, and so on, and so on, and so on. So that is looking good. Now let's do the left our left so once again i would get the axis and this time i'm going to use the minus equals operator to take away 50 pixels and once again assign whatever x-axis is to the left of our circle okay so refresh left click right click right click right Click left, click left. So we're just manipulating the x-axis by adding 50 or taking 50 away from it and then assigning it to the left of our circle. Okay, that's all we are doing. Let's do the same for arrow up and arrow down now. So for this, we need a y-axis, let y-axis equal zero. And then y axis. If we're going up, well, we need to manipulate the top. So let's start with arrow down. Y axis plus equals 50. And I'm going to get the circle and use the style to add a top. X axis plus pixels. I'm adding to the top of mine. So if I press down, I want to add 50 to the top of my circle. And here, let's just check that out to see if that's worked. Down, down, down. And now here, I would minus 50 to keep taking away from the y axis. And get the circle and use style top again to assign the new y axis plus the string pixel. So now we should be able to move anywhere. Oops, y-axis, circle, style, top, y-axis. Ah, it's strange. Let's just copy that. I don't know what's happened there. Fresh, go left, down, go up, and there we go. Okay, so we can now move anywhere using our arrows. And if we press another key, well, we get key not recognized. Okay, brilliant. I hope that was useful for you. Let me try to get that whole function in for you. There we go. If you want to make note of that, that is how I would move around a element on a screen. Don't forget to add the event listener. And of course, store the values for X and Y. Okay, if you want to make a note of that too, once again, the position absolute is what is enabling us to give a position to the circle each time. Now that I think we have that down, time for a little pop challenge. I'm going to ask you to, so I'm going to keep this here. Hopefully you still have everything that we learned because let's go back into here. I'm going to change this to be the color yellow and let's change this to be blue i don't like that color let's change it to another color here we go light sea green so in this challenge i want you to make our little friend here so let's give it some eyes i'm going to give it an eye container display flex and then an eye which is just going to be basically a black circle so let's do that now 20 pixels right 20 pixels border radius and pixels and then let's go into here so here's a circle. I'm going to make another div, which is going to have the class of I container, and in it a div of 
with one eye and another eye. Background color black. Play flex, flex, direction. container okay and then let's actually give these some margin margin left margin top So we have a little face, however, it doesn't have a mouth. Using what we learned here, so I'm just going to get rid of this, all of it. How would you make our little guy here smile if we pressed the arrow up and be sad if we press the arrow down? So this is a little challenge for you. Once again, if you need to take down the style, that is it. I'm just gonna, I've just commented out for now, but that is the whole thing here. Pause here to take that down. And our index HTML file just contains the following content. And don't forget to get your folder structure right with the source folder containing the index.js and style sheet. Okay, so yes. Using what we've just learned, so everything about switch cases and keys, I want you to make our little guy here smile if we press the arrow up and be sad if we press the arrow down. I'm going to give you a while to do this, so please have a go yourself. Feel free to rewind and look at the previous lesson or do some research on the internet. That is totally up to you. Have a go yourself. Don't worry if you don't get it because I'm going to go through the answer with you together in a bit. See you soon. Okay, so the first thing that I would do is actually style the face itself. So let's go ahead and make a mouth. For this, I would get a width of, what's our width of our circle? 100 pixels. So let's go 70 pixels. Height, 35 pixels. Background color, I'm just going to go yellow. I'll show you why because we're going to have a border. So, border top left radius, I'm going to have as 80 pixels, and I'll show you why it will all make sense in a bit. Border, just copy this, border top. Right radius, 80 pixels, and the border itself is going to be 10 pixels, solid, and black in color. And so if I save that now, let's actually give a mouth here. So I, I, and under the I container, I'm just going to put my mouth. So div with a class mouth okay so there we go it's it's very big I'm just gonna get rid of the border bottom though border bottom equals zero pixels it is a very large mouth let's let's make it smaller okay so I think maybe we need 50 height 25 I make this 60 make that 60 Okay, so that's looking a lot better. This is, of course, a sad mouth. So let's go back here and put sad mouth. And let's also give it a margin left, 
of 15 pixels. Okay. I mean, this is looking quite good. It's quite a big mouth still. Maybe we can do something about that. Should we move it up, margin, top, minus five pixels? Okay, so that's good enough for me. Sad mouth. We made a sad mouth. Now let's make a happy mouth. So I'm literally just going to copy this. Happy mouth. Keep that the same, but this time we want the bottom left and the bottom right and border top we want to disappear so that should be the same but reversed let's check that is the case happy mouth perfect sad mouth happy mouth so let's keep it sad first now let's get to writing a function just like we did before that will control what we press so function control and i'm going to pass with an event just like we did before i'm also going to use the switch case so i'm going to switch out the e key and open up our curly braces at the case well this time we're just going to have arrow up and a console log pressed up to make sure it's working and break out of this. Case arrow down. Just gonna have, oops, not curly. Console log pressed down. And once again, break out of this and have a default console log key not recognized. Great. So now let's hook it up to our event listener. So we're going to grab a whole document, use add event listener to listen out for a key down on. And then if we do press a key down on our keyboard, we want to invoke the control function. So there we go. Shall we check it out? Press up to refresh it. Press up, press down. Make sure you actually click on here, otherwise it might not work. Up, down, up, down. Everything seems to be working fine. So let's get to writing some code. So we would need to grab the mouth element. So document this query selector and let's grab I'm actually going to give this an ID. So ID mouth. So document, well, we could use query selector. We just need to tell this to look for an ID of mouth. Const mouth equals. Okay, so now we would grab the mouth and I would use class list add so I'm going to add the style of happy mouth. So once again, I did not make this up. Class list and add. I did not make up. I'm going to add the happy mouth class. I don't need that because we already know. We've already told the JavaScript. It's a class we want to add. And I want to first off remove any other class that is there. So class list remove sad mouth. So I'm going to remove the sad mouth and add the happy mouth. To fresh, click on our browser and press up, and there we go. We've done it. And let's do the same for sad. So once again, I'm grabbing the mouth. I'm using class list to remove anything. So remove the happy mouth because we don't want the happy mouth there. And once again, I'm using class list add to add the sad mouth. Let's do it. Fresh. Happy, sad, happy, sad, happy, sad. Brilliant. Okay, so thanks so much for doing this challenge with me. Hopefully you've got something similar. This is of course not the only solution. There's so many ways to solve it. This is just one way that I've chosen. If you chose to use key code, or if you chose to use an if statement, or perhaps you chose to do it differently than adding and removing a class list, that is absolutely fine too. Please do share it with me on Twitter. I'd love to see your solutions. And let's carry.
Okay, next up, I'm going to talk to you about sort. The sort method sorts the element of an array in place and returns a sorted array. So that's what we're going to be using it for. Sort literally sorts arrays. The default sort order is going to be ascending. So let's check it out. It is ascending based on the UFT16 code unit values. What I mean by this is that it's going to sort it alphabetically. So I'm just going to create a const for us. Let's have const, I don't know, planets. And then I'm just going to put a few in, Mars, Jupiter, and it's going to capital letters because, you know, they are planets, they are important. Mars, Jupiter, Uranus, Earth. So this is going to be super easy. I would literally get the planets and use sort. Sort on them, like so. So now if I console log, you will see my arrays come back to me in alphabetical order. So that is pretty cool. We can also use sort on numbers. So it works on strings and it also works on numbers. Let's do it with some ages. So let's get some ages up. I'm going to go const ages equal, and then let's have some random ages. So 32, 45, 21, 13, 78, 99. And there we have it. I have now sorted my array of numbers. So that's it for sort. Let's carry it on. Okay, now that we have done the sort JavaScript method, I think it's the perfect time to talk a little bit about algorithms. If you're interested to learn a little bit more about algorithms and computer science, I have the perfect YouTube playlist for you. Please go ahead and click on the card right here to view some of these videos. Otherwise, let's carry on. In this next section, we're going to look at the includes JavaScript method. The includes JavaScript method determines whether an array includes a certain value amongst its entries, returning true or false as appropriate. So again, I'm just going to use an array for this. So I'm going to make an array of books. And in it, I'm going to have a book called Alf, a book called Five of Pi, and a book called Power of Now. So we have three books in our array. I can use the includes JavaScript method to find out if something is included in an array. So I would simply do it like this. I would get the array itself. And if, so this, I'm not making this up. This is a JavaScript method. Includes is a JavaScript method. And if that array includes the book I'm looking for, so let's put through alf, well, this will have a return of a true or a false. So if I console log books includes alf, I will get a true. If I search for perhaps the book sapiens, I will get a false. So what I would really do is store this as a variable. I'm going to have the const is in books and then save this statement like so. So now I would simply use this and I can use that variable wherever I want in my code. So at the moment is in books is false. However, if it was alf is in books would be true. So that is how we would use includes. I just want to take a little bit of time to talk to you about contain because contains is totally different to includes in the way that we can't use it on arrays. We use contains. So even though it looks like includes, it is used for completely different purposes. I'm going to show you how now. So contains if I want to find out if 
a node exists on a specific node, I would use contain. What I mean is if I want to find out if the body has a child that has an element with the class of circle, I can find that out. So as a beginner, it could be quite easy to get the two confused, but I'm going to show you how they are different now. So I'm going to actually grab the body. So I need to grab the body. I'm going to go document query selector and select the body. So I'm literally selecting the element of body and storing it as body and const circle. Once again, I'm going into my document and I'm going to find the element with the class, so dot for class of circle. Now I can use includes to find out, to get the body, find out if the body contains circle. And I would get a true. This is because we know that is true. Okay? So that is one way that I would use contains. The body does indeed contain an element with a class of circle. If I was to get rid of this class, let's replace it with, I don't know, square. We would get a false. And let's put that back. And there you go. So that is how you would use includes, the first one. And this is how you would use contains. I hope that makes sense. I just thought it was very useful for us to clear this up now, just in case you see both and try using them interchangeably. That will, that will not work. In this next section, I'm going to show you how to create elements from our JavaScript directly. Let's do it. The create element method, when attached to a document, creates the HTML element specified by tag name. What I mean by this is I can actually create elements in our JavaScript just like we would if we created a div like this by writing it out in our HTML. So I'm going to do this now. I am literally going to recreate writing a div. Okay. So to see it in our browser, I'm actually going to have to give a div some styling. So I'm just going to go simple with 100 pixels, height, 100 pixels, background color, blue. Okay. So to do this, I would actually have to grab our document and use the JavaScript method of create elements. So I'm not making this up. I'm going to create a div and put it in a string. Now, so we've created a div, however, we can't see it yet. I'm gonna go ahead and store this as a square. So our JavaScript now thinks that the div we created is a square. And I'm gonna grab the body. So const body equals document query selector. And I'm gonna look for the body tag in our HTML file. If I console log out square, well, you will see exactly that, a div that we created. So we've created a div, we stored it as a square. We now want to put it into our body. So to do this, I would use body append child. So once again, this is not something I'm making up. Append child is a JavaScript method. And I would put through the square. And there we go. You will now see our square in the browser. That is pretty cool. Okay, one more thing that I'm going to do is actually create an image this time. I'm going to do this so we can move on to the next section swiftly. So once again, you will see there is nothing here. I've literally added a div that I've styled to be a blue square into our body. Okay, and I've done this all with JavaScript. The next thing I want to do, so I'm actually going to, actually, let's keep that for now. Let's create something else. So this time I want to create an image tag. So once again, I will get the document and use create element to create an image tag. 
let's store this as const image a console log image well you will indeed get an image tag a closing an opening and a closing image tag Now, let's go ahead and put that in our body. So once again, I would get the body, which we've already got, and use append child to put the image in there. Now, if I console log our body, because obviously the image doesn't have any styling yet, well, the body itself will have an image tag and a div tag. Great. So that is how we use create element. I've teed this up perfectly because the next thing I want to show you is something called set attribute and get attribute. So I'm just going to keep this here. I'm going to keep, I'm going to take rid of that console log. I'm going to keep all these together and those two together. So we've appended a square and we've appended an image. And this is so we can see what's going on in our body. The next thing I want to show you is something called set attribute. Just make sure we're spelling it correctly. So the set attribute method actually sets a value of an attribute to a specified element. If that attribute already exists, the value is updated. Okay, so that is what we're going to do. We're going to set a attribute to our image. I'm going to show you how to do that now. So the first thing I want to do is actually get an image. So I'm going to create a folder called images. I'm going to put that into my source folder and into my images. I'm just going to drag and drop an image I have. So I'm going to find, search for the headshot of myself and I'm just going to drag it into the images folder. So now if I grab the image itself, and you set attribute, I need to pass through two things. I need to pass through the key and the value. So I would do this by writing the source and the path. So I'm gonna go into the images folder and grab the headshot ng. Okay, now I would actually have to put the source directory before this. This is because our JavaScript file gets sent to our index.html file, which is in the root of our project. So we do need to put that source folder in there too. That is how we would get the images showing up in our browser. So that is how I use set attribute. I can set any sort of attribute I want. If I console log, actually we can use the body too. So if I click into the body, you will see I have indeed created a div up here. I've also created an image tag and I've also given it the attributes. I've set these attributes. I've set this source and this source images headshot through JavaScript. So that is pretty cool. That is how you can use set attribute and essentially how you can make out the entirety of your HTML elements using JavaScript. You can also use something called get attribute. Okay, so if I want to get const uh, image, I can essentially get the image and use get attribute and search for the source. Oh, we've already declared that. So const image path. And now if I console log image path, I will literally get the value here. So get attribute will search for an attribute. So it's going to search for this and get that for us. Okay. So if I, for example, did this image set attribute, and this time I did data ID and I set an ID of four, and I used image get attribute, so const get ID or just image ID, not get image ID. Get the image, use get attribute. 
And this time I'm going to get the data ID of the image and then console log image ID. I will get the number four. Okay, so hopefully that was useful. I think that was the perfect time to start with a project. Let's do it. Well done everyone for making it to this point in the bootcamp. In this section, we are gonna build out a full project. I will be showing you how to build a simple memory game in which you have to win by matching all the cards on the board. Building this game will help us practice everything we have learned so far in regards to event listeners, operators, if statements, storing values and variables, as well as a few new things too. I will also be showing you how to use a code editor program such as VS Code or Atom in order to store your projects on your personal device, just as you would as a professional developer. This section will take roughly one hour. I hope you do enjoy it. Please do share your finished projects with me when you have finished them on Twitter, on YouTube, on Instagram. I would absolutely love to see. Okay, so it's come to that part of our course in which we're going to take everything that we have learned so far in order to create our very first project that includes JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. So what are we waiting for? Let's get going. In this section, I'm not going to use the ID I've been using so far. This is because I want to show you how to use uh, code editors such as Atom or VS Code in order to actually store project as a professional software developer would on GitHub. So to do this, I need to talk to you about those code editors first. So just like the code editor that we've been using that's been hosted on the internet, we can have our own code editor downloaded onto our laptop. This makes our lives a lot easier when dealing with projects and saving them onto our computer. I'm going to show you which code editors I prefer to use. So Atom.io is one of them. You can choose to use Atom.io simply by downloading it here, or you can use VS Code. As I am using a Mac, I would recommend downloading VS Code for Macs. So go ahead, please choose one. It's absolutely up to you which one you choose. I'm going to choose to download VS Code. So simply click the download button and that download should start in your browser. Once it has finished, I've actually already gone ahead and downloaded this for myself, but you would simply open up the extension and follow the download process until you have it on your computer. So I'm going to go ahead and double click that and the VS Code editor should start up for me. Just going to get rid of that here and get rid of that here. So now I have VS Code on my computer. This is not hosted online. This is on my personal laptop and it's where I'm going to be making my project for this section. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually just make this a little bit bigger for us so we can see what is happening. Now I'm going to click this button right here. So I'm going to open a folder and I've already made a folder where I saw most of my projects. This is personal projects. And in here, I'm just going to create a new folder and I'm going to call it memory game, just like that and click save. So now we have a folder called memory game where we're going to store all our files. Let's click open. And there we go. This is step one. So we're going to be storing all our files in here, just like we did before. We need to set up this project so we can start building in it. So I would start off by just creating an index.html file and then a source directory and in it my styles CSS and my app or index.js. We can call it whatever we want. The extension should be JS for JavaScript, CSS for cascading style sheets, and the index.html. So that is the folder structure that we have been working with and one that I'm going to use for this lesson. 
Once again, we will need to get the boiler code for the index HTML setup as the first step. So to do this, I'm just going to get the doc type. And then I'm just going to use the HTML tag. I'm going to set the language as English. And this is just some boilerplate code for our HTML file. Then include a head. Use a meta tag, char set, utf8. So just like we did when we set up in the very first lesson, is the same boilerplate code. The title. Let's put memory game. And then that's our head done for now. And then we need a body. So that is all we need for the boilerplate code. The next thing I want to do is actually link my style sheet. So I'm going to link, making a closing tag and have style sheet href styles css, but it's actually in the source folder. So let's go ahead and get that. And then finally, I'm going to link my script tag as well. So I'm just going to do that here, script tag. And the source is going to be, I'm going to go into the source folder and get the index.js file. So I can put that at the bottom of my body or I'm going to use the DOM content loader. So I'm actually going to choose it that way. I'm going to put it in my header to save all these files. And then in my index.js file, let's actually make this a bit smaller too. I'm going to use the event listener to check if all of our HTML has loaded. So I'm going to go and use document add event listener DOM content loaded make sure to spell it correctly otherwise you will get all sorts of errors and then just an arrow function because this is a function we're passing through okay the event we are listening out for and the function that we want to invoke if we hear it so that is how event listeners work if you remember okay so that is looking good it's going to make it a little bit bigger for us, just in case anyone can't really see. Okay, so now it's time to start writing our JavaScript. But first off, I'm just going to make a grid here. So the only thing we really want in here, so let's get rid of that because we can't have it in two places. I'm just going to put a div with the class of grid. And that is where all the magic is going to happen, okay? I'm also going to have a score, so let's put an h3 tag. That will say the score. And I'm going to use something called a span tag. I don't think we've used it before, but the span tag will essentially allow me to cut into this h3 tag. And in it, I'm going to put the score. So ID score or result. Let's just put result. Okay. So there we go. We have a div with a class of grid and a score. Now, if I open this on the browser, we would only see the word score in here. So perhaps let's actually style up the grid. So I'm going to grab the class of grid. So once again, dot for class. And I'm just going to give the grid a width of 400 pixels and a height of 300 pixels. Let's also give it a border maybe. Border solid black one pixel. Just so we can see it. And 
that is it. So now to view this in my browser, I would simply go to the index.html file and copy the path, not the relative path, but the whole path. And I would simply paste that into my URL. And there we go, just like before. And then we can inspect the page by right clicking here. So we can see our console log. Brilliant. This is looking good. Let's get to writing some JavaScript. So let's go back to our visual code editor and go into the index.js file. Now, the first thing I want to do is actually create an array of all the cards in our memory game. So I'm just going to get some card options. What kind of card should we have? Let's make a card array first. So cards, we'll just call it cards. We don't need to call it cards array. And open up our array. Now, I want to have some objects. So here's my first card object. And each object is going to have a name. So this card is going to be fries. And it's going to have an image of some fries. So for this, I've already decided that I want images in here because all the cards are going to have images or 12 cards. So feel free to take mine if you wish. Just go to my GitHub repository and find the memory game. Go into the images. You can just download all of these. So I'm just going to, so if you click it here, you can download the first one. So this is going to be my blank image. Save as image blank. Let's save it in downloads. Save. Let's get the cheeseburger. Download. Save image as cheeseburger in downloads as a PNG image. Great. That's good. Fries. Save image. As fries PNG and downloads, fine. We have a few more to go. Save image as hot dog. So that's four so far. We have five, six, seven, eight. Ice cream. Save. Milkshake. Save image. Pizza, the image. So I've already gone ahead and made the image the exact sizing that we want, so we don't need to do any CSS trickery. And then just a plain old white image. So that is going to be like a blank card white image. Okay, so we've got all the images that we need downloaded for our game. Now back in VS Code, just like before in my source folder, I'm going to make an images. folder and in here I want to put all the images okay so I'm literally going to go to my downloads file and get all these images and just put them in to here like so so that was pretty easy let's go ahead and put the first image in so I would go at the moment we are at index.js file so it is in the same folder as the images. So I would go into the images and grab the fries PNG like so. So we've created our first card. Let's go ahead and do the same for the others. So name, let's call this one cheese burger. Image, images. So the cheeseburger, so the object with the name cheeseburger is going to have the cheeseburger PNG. What's next? We're going to do the ice cream. And that image is, of course, going to be, we're going to go into our images folder and grab the ice cream PNG.
name. Pizza. Make sure that is a string. We're just keeping everything extremely consistent. This is an array of objects that we are building. So images, pizza.png. Name, milkshake, image. Go into the images folder and just grab the milkshake. And then just a few more, we've got a milkshake. We have a hot dog as well. So name, hot dog, image, into the images folder, we grab the hot dog. Okay, so we have our six cards. Now, because I want to essentially mix and match the cards, so we need to have two cheeseburgers, two ice creams, two pizzas. So we need to essentially get everything and put it in our array again. So... Before we do this, I just want to explain one thing. Even though we are in the JavaScript file at the moment, so the way to get the images would be, in fact, to go to the images and get the following uh, URLs, I would actually need to act as if I was in the index.html file, okay? This is for when we build stuff on the internet. Just make sure, so I'm just going to add that using command D. I'm going to command d and select all the images i'm just going to put source and images at the beginning okay so that is important you always have to act as if you are in the index html file so there we go now once you have done that i want you to essentially grab all six of these objects and put them in again great okay so now if we console log cards and go to our and go to our browser let's get rid of these now you will see 12 cards that all have an image path and have all have a name now we need to mix them up before we start putting them in our grid so let's do that we can do this with a JavaScript function that we have learned already along with math random. So how do you think we would sort this cards array? Okay. What do you think we would do to get this cards array and sort it randomly? Well, I would use sort and this is a bit of a cool trick. I would open up our function and then I would use 0 0.5 minus math random. How this works is that math random, essentially, if you remember, returns a random number between 0 and 1 or just under 1. So if that random number happens to give you a number less than 0 0.5, then you get a negative number. And if it's over, then you get a positive number. And we are sorting things absolutely at random. We're sorting the whole array at random. Okay? If that doesn't make sense, please take the moment out to have a think about that, research it. It is a sort of just math problem. It's not really a programming problem. So I'm not going to focus too much on it. Have a go at researching it if you don't understand. But it is a cool trick. Definitely make a note of it. If you ever need to sort an array randomly, this is your guy. Okay. So now if I console log cards, I'm just going to take this away and put it here. Go back to our browser and refresh. Let's see. You will see that indeed these are now randomly sorted because we didn't start with ice cream, did we? So you will see that fries was first and we have randomly sorted our array. Let's carry on. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna do is actually put these randomly sorted cards into our grid. So let's do it. Well, as you know, we would use query selector for this. So I would use document query selector to essentially search for a class of grid. And let's store this as a grid. So there we go.
Now I'm going to use JavaScript to essentially create our board. So I'm going to use a function for this. I'm going to write function create board. And in it, we are wonderfully going to use everything that we learned so far about creating elements, appending elements, setting attributes, and so on and so on. So I'm just going to put that back to where it was. I'm also going to use a loop. So I'm just going to use for let i equals zero. Now, as long as i is smaller than the card array length, I want to increment i by one. Okay, so this is obviously quite far back now, I feel. We learned about for loops quite a while ago, but that is your syntax for a for loop. Now, I need to create an image. So for each time, so we've got 12 items in our cards array, okay? Now, for each time, so 12 times, I want to create a element. So I'm going to grab our document and use create element. And I'm going to create an image. Make sure to put that as a string. And let's save this as const card. So a singular card. That is a singular card. Now let's get our card and use set attribute as we learnt in our lessons to set it a source. And that source is going to be, if we think about this, each card is going to essentially have a blank version of itself. So I'm just going to create a blank version of everything. So we're going to go into the source folder, into the images and grab the blank PNG. So that one there. And then I also want to give each card a data ID. So once again, I'm going to use set attribute. And along with source, I'm going to set it a data ID. So again, that's something that we learned in our HTML section. And the data ID of each card is going to be I. So the first card is going to have an ID of zero. The second is one, two, three, four, because we are looping over. So we're going to give each card its own individual data ID, starting from zero and ending at 11. The next thing I want to do is actually grab our grid and append the card. So let's talk through this again. Our function now is going to actually create a card, give each card the attribute of the source and the image path. It's also going to give it a data ID, and then we're going to put the card into our grid. So let's go ahead and invoke that. So create board, click save, fresh our board. And there we go. We now have 12 blank cards because that is the image that we use for blank. And if I now inspect, so let's go in here, our grid, you will see exactly what we have done. We have created, let's make this a bit smaller actually. We have created an image tag. We've given it using set attribute, a source and the path to the image itself. And we've given each one a data ID. That is pretty cool in itself. I think everything that we have learned so far is really coming together. So I'm really glad to see it uh, looking like this. Let's carry on. The next thing I actually want to do is actually add an event listener to each one of these cards too to listen out for if we click it. So before we add the card to the grid, I'm just going to grab the card one more time and use add event listener. So once again, we did not make this up. The add event listener to pass through a click, which we also did not make up. We're going to be listening out for a click on that specific card. And if that card is clicked, we want to write a function or let's call the function flip card. So let's get to writing that function. Function flip card. Oops, let's make sure to keep that at the bottom. And there we go. So again, just keep that up there. Okay, so what do we want to happen 
when we flip a card? Well, I want to get whatever card we flips data ID. So let's do this. I'm going to use this because we are talking about whatever card that we are currently working with. That is how we use the this keyword. I don't think we've done enough on this keywords, but just know that whatever card we have flipped, whatever card we have here, we're talking about that card. So this get attribute. So we're going to get the attribute this time. And the attribute we want to get is the data ID. So we want to get this thing right here of whatever card we clicked. And let's store this as something. So let's store it as let card ID, because that's what it is. It's an ID. Now, once we have that ID, what do we do with it? We need to store it somewhere. So I'm going to make an array here. I'm going to call it let cards chosen and just leave it as an empty array for now because there's nothing in it. We haven't chosen any cards to be checked against each other. So there we go. Let cards chosen. I'm then going to get that cards chosen array and push so again this is something that we learned we're going to push into that array the cards name so we do this by getting the cards array and passing through the card id okay so perhaps it's best to console log something for now so at the moment when we click a card we are getting that cards id and storing it as card id we're then going to use that card. So say we click the card with ID 3. We then pass that 3 into our cards array. Okay. So I'm going to console log cards card ID. So at the moment, this is all I really want to happen. Let's save. Console. Let's click on a card. So I've clicked the 0, 1, 2, 3 card with ID or data ID 3. And I'm being returned the third card in whatever our random array is at the moment. So our third card is a milkshake. If I refresh this and I click again, it'll be fries. Okay, so we're getting an object back. However, we just want to store the name we've decided. Okay, I just want to store the name in my card chosen array. So I would do that by grabbing the name. Okay. So now in our card chosen array, I'm actually going to console log cards chosen. Refresh. So that's my array. I'm going to click on a card. I click on a card again, click on a card again. Uh, we need to actually put this console log in a function. So after we flip the card, let's console log the cards chosen array. Fresh. Click on a card. So we clicked on the hot dog. We put hot dog in the cards chosen array. We clicked here. So we clicked on a cheeseburger. And we have also put cheeseburger in our chosen cards array. If I keep doing it, I'm just going to keep adding to the chosen cards array. However, we don't want this. We only want to get two items in the cards chosen array and compare the two. And if those two don't match, well, we want to clear the cards chosen array and start again. So I can do so like this. So we are indeed getting the cards chosen and pushing through the name. Let's get rid of this console log here. I'm going to get rid of that for now too. I'm actually also going to do the same for the card ID. So cards chosen IDs. And push. Well, I can actually just grab the card ID itself. So there we go. And let's make an array. Let cards chosen IDs equal. So we're storing the names in one and we're storing the IDs in one separately. Okay. 
And of course, if we click the card, we want that card to flip over before we move on. So once again, I'm going to do this set attribute. And to whatever card we click, I'm going to set the attribute from. So we're going to overwrite, because at the moment, its attribute is set to this. And we're going to overwrite it. Okay, we're going to overwrite it by going into our array and grabbing the image. So once again, I'm going to get my cards. I'm going to pass through the card ID and get the image. Great. Let's check it out. Refresh. Click. And there we go. Click. Click. Click, 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 click. Pretty cool. So at the moment, I actually want them to uh, refer back if two haven't been selected. So I can do this with an if statement. If cards chosen, or you can do it by ID, but essentially if either of those length dvd equals two i'm going to put a set timeout so we learned about set timeouts a set timeout essentially invokes a function after a certain amount of time has passed so after a certain amount of time has passed if there are two cards chosen in our array i want to check if those two cards match and if they match take them off the board and if they don't match, flip them back over. But I'm going to do that all in one function. So I'm going to write a function called check for match. And after we do get to, I'm actually going to wait 500 seconds because I don't want it to be instant. I want it to be like after a while, I want them to be checked for a match. And if they do match, take them off the board. And if they don't, flip them back over. So I'm actually going to move this create board to the end my file and write a function check for match okay let's get a checking for some matches in this check for match function a lot's going to be going on okay we need to make sure that people can't double click on the same image for one otherwise what will happen is, well, if we console log here, cards chosen IDs, cards, cards chosen IDs. So if I click here, I get the ID of three, but there's nothing stopping me from pressing that over and over again, which obviously doesn't work because then we could check, we could essentially double click something and we would get a match. So we need to prevent that from happening. We need to do that in our check for match function. So if chosen or card chosen IDs and the first item deeply equals or equals, it doesn't really matter, cards chosen IDs and the second item well, let's just get an alert that says you have clicked the same image. And let's flip both of them back to be blank. So cards, actually let's, we have to grab all the cards again. So I don't know why this formatting is happening, but I don't like it. Um, const cards equals I'm gonna grab all the cards from our display query selector all I'm gonna grab all the images and sort them as cards we've already declared cards once so to make things less confusing I'm actually gonna call this a cards or card array so now let's find everywhere else I use cards okay well this should be card array oops card array card array what can we card card array
card array, card array. Okay, great. Just to make things less confusing, because I need to re grab all those images now. And if the cards chose an ID, and the second card chose an ID, so the two IDs that are currently in my array are the same, you have clicked the same image, I need to flip the card back. So I'm actually going to store this as something to const option one ID. Just so we don't have to keep writing it out, I'm just gonna make our code a bit neater. Option two ID. Cut that. And now I can just check if option one ID equals option two ID. Well, then we go into our cards, we get option one ID, and we set attribute to be source and we're going to set it back to blank so i'm going to go into our source folder get the images and get the blank png and once again let's do it for the second one so option two id as well okay let's check this out fresh click, click, you have clicked the same image, okay? And it flips back. Fantastic. Let's carry on. So we've accounted for that. Now let's get to actually checking if we have a match. So if that else if, Now we need to check if the names match because each of our cards has an ID from 1 to 12. However, each of the cards has two names in our array each. So we've finished dealing with the IDs. We've checked if we've clicked the same image. Now let's use the names of the cards to check for matches. Okay, so we're using IDs to identify if the image is an individual card. And now we're checking for matches using the names. So let's go into our cards chosen this time. So I can easily do the same as we did above. Cards chosen equal or deeply equal cards chosen like that. So once again, if you would prefer, it's totally up to you. You can store them just like we did up here, or you can do that. I'm going to do it like that because I don't think we're going to be using this anywhere else. So if the first card in our chosen cards array is the same as the second card in our chosen cards array. I'm going to alert you have found a match. Okay, it's pretty cool. And what else do we need to happen? Well, let's just check if this works first. So I can actually cheat and find out. I know that the uh, let's find out where the cards are randomly. So we don't need to console of this. I want the sorted array. Actually, maybe that's right. Let's check it out again. Yeah, okay, so that's the randomly sorted array. We just need to put our piece of code after the sort. So I know that, for example, ice cream two and three are going to be ice cream. So zero, one, two, three. These two should be the same. I'm going to click this one, I'm going to click that one. You have found a match. Great. So you will see here the IDs are being stored at two and three. That's fine. And if we were to console log out the card chosen array, you would see ice cream and ice cream. Okay. So we have done that. What else do we need to do? Well, if there is a match, we also need to remove the cards or Essentially, I'm just going to replace it with a white PNG square instead. So just like we did above, so using IDs, I would set the image to be the 
whites P and G. So let's go and check again. Fresh. Let's find out which ones match. The last two. So once again, one, two. We found a match. Okay. And they disappear. However, we can still click them, which is not great. We need to use a JavaScript method that we learnt, and that is remove event listener. So let's do that now. I'm going to grab the cards option one again and use dot remove event listener to essentially listen out for clicks. And the function flip card and not let that happen. Okay, I don't want flip card function happening if we click on either card. And finally, I'm going to create another array called cards one. We're going to use push to push these two cards in there. So anything that's in the cards chosen array is going to be pushed into the cards when chosen. And we actually need to remove them out of our cards chosen array. And we also need to remove the cards out of the cards chosen IDs, right? Because then we want to start over. So I can simply do this in a very, very simple way by getting the cards chosen and just leaving it blank and getting the card chosen IDs and leaving it blank too. So let's check that out. Fresh, see which ones match. Okay, well, seven and eight, but let's just go ahead and click. So ID seven's been stored, ID six has been stored. There's no match. ID five's been stored. You can see it's already started again. There was no match, so we've started a new array, and now we're checking for a new match. Cool. Once again, one, two, not match. One, two, not match. Great, I love the fact that the array is being cleared and we can start again to look for new two matching. Let's refresh and let's see, let's actually see what happens if we click two matching ones. So, seven and 11, so we know that one. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Matching, you found a match, um, boom. Cards one is not defined, ah. We did not push it into the cards one array because we did not declare it. So let's do that up here. Let cards one and again an empty array. Cool. So now if I, I'm going to console log out here actually. Console log cards one. Console log cards chosen. Fresh, check for matching, three and four, zero, one, two, three, four. You have found a match. Cheeseburger, cheeseburger. And now our chosen array is empty and we have passed cheeseburger and cheeseburger to the cards one. So it is in fact an array within an array because cards one has an array here. So you can see one match and I've stored it as an array. Okay, so by the end of this, we should have six arrays in our array. Let's carry on. So we've already done what happens if you click on the same card. You've done what happens when you find a match. The one last thing to do now is what happens if you don't find a match? So for this, I would simply put both of these back to looking blank. And I'm just gonna have an alert saying, sorry, try again. And then once again, we would clear the cards chosen we would clear the cards chosen IDs and start a game. Okay, this is looking good. Now, the one thing I need to do is actually uh, show if we win or lose. So 
So for this, I'm going to do that in my results. I'm going to grab the const result display document and query selector. So I'm going to look for, I can't remember what I called it, result. It's an ID of result. So I'm going to look for an ID of result. And I've saved it as result display. So here, now I want to use text content or in an HTML, it's up to you, to display however many arrays are in my cards one array, okay? Because I think you should get one point if you get one set matching. So that makes sense, cards one length. And if cards one length deeply equals the card array length divided by two, or well, I could have just wrote a six, that is up to you, but I've chosen to do this. Result display text content congratulations you have won amazing so let's check it out not a match okay flip back not a match okay it's a match Great, so we've removed those. We have one in our array. Let's cheat because we can. It's a match. And you will see we get two because we have two items or two one card pairs in our array. Now we know this is a hot dog. The other hot dog is in six. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. It's a match. We get a score of three. And we now have three winning arrays in our array. cheeseburger and seven is a cheeseburger it's a match we've gone to four fries and we know that fries are in eight it's a match and then duh, duh, duh. it's a match and congratulations you have won and you can see here we have all six pairs so six arrays in our cards one array great just fix that. Okay, so that is our first project done. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've really seen how we have used everything that we have learned so far to make this game. You will now have this game saved on your local computer. And if you want to put it on GitHub, so in other case, store it somewhere, you know, uh, GitHub is a great example and place for developers storing things. And it is very useful if you want to showcase your projects to potential employers. I'm going to show you how to do that at the very end. So congratulations, make sure you save all your files. You now have your project in your own desktop or in your own uh, working environment so that you can have it saved and work with it whenever you want. Now, let's carry on with a little bit more learning before we get to the GitHub stage. Okay, well done everyone. I hope your learning is going well so far. Based on where we are in our coding journey, I thought I would introduce two games for you to choose from. Tetris or Candy Crush. These two games have been chosen specifically for the level of learning we are at at the moment, so the choice is totally up to you. You can either choose to complete one project now, complete both projects, or save them for later and carry on with this course. The choice is totally up to you. So if you would like to have a go at building Tetris, please click on this YouTube card right here. So we will be doing a lot of array work in this video, as well as learning how to listen out for keystrokes and using a lot of for each and some JavaScript methods. Or you can try Candy Crush by clicking this card right here. 
In Candy Crush, we will be learning how to drag and drop elements, as well as practice our array work and event listener work, as well as many, many more things that we have learned so far. Okay, let's carry on. In this section, I'm gonna to talk to you about HTTP, or Hypertext Transfer Protocol. To do this, let's have a look at a normal standard website you see on the internet. Most internet web pages are generated by web of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript sent to you via the internet. The internet is made up of a bunch of resources hosted on different servers. The term resource corresponds to any entity on the web, including HTML files, style sheets, images, and so on. To access the content on the internet, your browser must ask these servers for the resources that it needs and display these resources to you. This protocol of requests and responses enables you to view the page as it is. Let's have a closer look at this protocol. So to recap what we just said, HTTP or Hypertext Transfer Protocol is used to structure requests and responses over the internet. HTTP requires data to be transferred from one point to another over the network. This transfer of resources happens by using Transmission Control Protocol, or in short, TCP. In viewing a web page, TCP manages the channels between your browser and the server. So once again, to recap, TCP is used to manage many types of internet connections in which one computer or device wants to send something to another. And HTTP is the command language that the devices on both sides of the connection must follow in order to communicate. When you type an address such as www.google.com into your computer, you are commanding it to open a TCP channel to that site's uniform resource locator, or in short, URL. A URL is unique to your site and is sort of like an address to it. In this situation, your computer, so your computer which is making the request, is called the client. The URL you are requesting is the address that belongs to the server. Okay, so we've got a client and a server. You're on the computer and the URL, which is where your website is, is on a server. Once the TCP connection is established, the client sends an HTTP get request to the server to retrieve the web page it should display. So here we have a get request or a visualization of a get request. The client is requesting the server gives him the necessary resources for the website. Then after the server has sent the response, so here we see the server sending the response to us. We say, we've got it, thank you. After the server has sent the response, it closes the TCP connection. If you open the website in your browser again, or if your browser automatically requests something from the server, a new connection is opened, which follows the same process we just did. Get requests are one kind of HTTP method a client can call. We also have post requests, put requests. So here we have a visualization of how the request would work. With post requests, you're simply sending something to the server and with put requests the same. We also have a delete request. We will be going into all four of these in more detail in the next section. Now, Let's go back to our Google example. Suppose you want to check out something, you want to search for something on Google. So you type in the URL into your browser. After you type that URL into your browser, what is happening behind the hood is your browser will extract the HTTP part and recognize that it is the name of the network protocol to use. Then it takes the domain name from the URL. In this case, it's google.com and ask the internet domain name server to return an internet protocol or IP address. So at this point, the client knows the destination's IP address. It then opens a connection to the server at the address using the HTTP protocol as specified. 
it will initiate a GET request to the server, which contains the IP address of the host and optionally a data payload. The GET request contains the following text that you see on the screen. This identifies a type of request, the path on www.google.com and the protocol. The protocol here is HTTP forward slash 1.1. The protocol is a revision of the first HTTP, which is now called HTTP forward slash 1.0. In HTTP forward slash 1.0, every resource request requires a separate connection to the server. HTTP forward slash 1.1, like we have on the screen, uses one connection more than once. So that additional content, like images or style sheets, is retrieved even after the page has been retrieved. As a result, requests using HTTP forward slash 1.1 have less delay than those using HTTP forward slash 1.0. The second line of the request contains the address of the server, which is www.google.com. There also may be additional lines as well, depending on what data your browser chooses to send. If the server is able to look at the path requested, so if the server is able to get you to google.com, the server might respond with the header HTTP forward slash 1.1 200 OK, followed by the content type. So let's break this down. The first line of the header is the confirmation that the server understands the protocol that the client wants to communicate with. We then get a HTTP status code, so the 200, signifying that the resource was found on the server. On the bottom line, so the content type, the bottom line shows the type of content that it will be sending to the client. If the server, however, is not able to locate the path requested, so it can't find the path to google.com, it will respond with the following header. 404 not found. In this case, the server identifies that it understands the HTTP protocol, but the 404 not found status code signifies that the specific piece of content requested was not found. There is many and many status codes that are available, so I'm just going to show you some now. Here we have a website called HTTP Status Dogs, Hyper Transfer Protocol Response Status Codes and Dogs. So here we'll see all the status codes you can get, along with funny dog images, just to sort of make sure that you understand what each of them means. So for example, here we have the 200, it says, okay, let's find the 404. 404 not found, we have 403 forbidden, we have so many, 500's another popular one, so if you go to 500, internal server error, there is so many and it's quite a cute website if you want to have a go at familiarizing yourself with these status codes. So there we go, 404, 422, 400, all of these status codes are essentially ones that you might see in your daily life as a developer. And that's it. So that was a quick uh, crash course on HTTP and around HTTP status codes. So ones like 404. Next up, I'm going to take you through some get requests, post requests, put requests and a delete request. So let's do it. So next up, I want us to have a go at using Fetch, which provides a JavaScript interface for accessing and manipulating parts of the HTTP pipeline, such as requests and responses. Let's have a look at what I mean now. So here we have Fetch. We use Fetch to fetch a JSON file across the network and print it out to the console. What I mean is this. Okay, so here is an API. This RESTful API is essentially going to give us access to a JSON full of objects. These objects are going to be countries along with a lot more information with each of the objects. So like the name, the full name, the code, and so on. I'm going to choose an API endpoint. I'm going to select all because I want all the information, all the information that is possible. So I'm just going to select this and I'm just going to put it literally in my browser. So with the help of JSON view, 
So this is a Chrome extension that makes everything a lot more readable. If you haven't downloaded it, please do download it now. It essentially transforms everything to look like this, so in a lot more of a readable way, as opposed to what it looks like, like that. Okay, so now it looks like this. And we can read everything. So here we have our first object, which is Afghanistan, the country Afghanistan. We get the alpha codes for it. We get the capital. We get the region, subregions, population. Literally so many things, time zones, borders, languages, translations, and a flag. So let's click the flag. So essentially, yes, a lot, a lot of information gets given. We also have different types of things as well, but essentially it's just a breakdown of what we just saw if you need something specifically. I just want everything. So now we can actually get all that data and use it in our project. So let's go ahead and do that now. To do this, I would need fetch. So I'm just going to break this down. I'm just going to post that in here and talk to you about the syntax. So already you will see that in my console, let's make this bigger, in our console log, I'm getting all 250 objects. Let's click on the first one. And it's Afghanistan. So literally the thing we are looking at, even the flag is there. We've got all that information and we can use it in our project. Great. So the simplest use of fetch takes one argument. So the API endpoint, the path to the resource you want to fetch and returns a promise containing the response or the response object. This is just an HTT response, not the actual JSON. To extract the JSON body content from the response, we use this, so the JSON method. We then, of course, get all that data and we console log it so we can see it in our browser. So that's it. It's pretty simple. That's essentially what you need to use. You can use this on any API that you want or RESTful API. As long as you get the path correct, then that should work perfectly. This, of course, is the simplest form, and it is simply to get data. So to get data. I'm simply getting it. I am taking the file and the JSON file, and I'm getting all that information so I can work with it. You can even go as far as calling this a get request. It's, it's the same. It essentially does the same thing. Okay, so that is an API that we have chosen. I'm going to actually show you another API too, just to show you that you can literally put anything in here as long as it's the right format. I also like to use Punk API. So Punk API is essentially an API full of beers. So if I take this and put this in here, you will get literally a list of all the beers by brew dog. There's loads, there's even ingredients. Okay, it has hops, food pairings, which is quite a fun one because you make projects based on the food pairings, which I have done in the past. So it's also a great API. Let's go ahead and use it in our project. So I'm just going to get rid of this and post beers instead. So now, let's just try that again, beers. Post move some things around I'll just refresh the page do that I will get a bunch of beer objects which is pretty awesome one last one to show you and that's my own API that I've built so if I just go to here you will see that I have made my own API which is all about burgers so this is an open source project. If you want to go contribute to this, I'll show you how to do this later once we've done a bit more learning. So I would simply copy that link and put it in here in order to get my 28 burgers. So there's my first one. You'll see it has an array of ingredients, an array of addresses, which is an object. So that is my first object and so on and so on so this is great we have made our first get request to three different apis let's carry on so next up i want to show you what to actually do with the data once we've got it 
So once again, we have my bagger API. I'm actually going to comment this out. I'm still going to keep it there, however, and let's get rid of this. I now I'm going to write a function to get data. I'm then going to use the syntax here. So I'm going to fetch the data, but only if we want it to. So currently I'm not getting it. I'm just getting the data. I'm fetching it and then storing it. So response, and then I'm getting the response JSON and then the data. And I don't just want to console log the data. I mean, that is something that I want to do. So I'm going to put it there. However, I want to do a few more things as well. Once we get the data, and only once we get the data, because we need to make sure that promise is resolved, okay, so we need to make sure the data is there, and only once it's there, we want to get a name. So I need to get the burger name, and to get the burger name, I'm actually going to go into the data, so actually let's get the data now, I'm just going to call it, so we're getting our data, so we're going into our data, and let's go into the first object, the first object and get the name property. So this hopefully is coming together everything that we've learned so far. So we should have the name and I'm just going to console log out the name so we can see it. And indeed we have the tribute burger. Let's check if that's right. So the first object name tribute burger. Amazing. So that is how we would get data so we can work with it in projects in one simple example. I can also loop over this to get all the names. There's so much we can do. I have so many great projects on this. So I'm going to leave you with a project now. I hope you enjoy it. Have fun. project in which we're going to learn how to build a random burger generator. What I mean by this is that we are going to be using a burger API in order to randomly generate a burger name if we click this button right here. Okay, so as a reminder, this is the burger API that we were using. It is one I made myself. I provided you the link and you can go ahead and see all the different burgers that different people from all over the world have added to this open source project. We have an ID, we have a name for a burger, we have the restaurant where you can find it, you have the website, a description, an array of ingredients, an array of addresses, so this one has one address, it is an object, and so on and so on for each one. So there's another one, there's another one, we have a Krabby Patty, we have the Good Burger, literally so, so many burgers. So I'm going to show you how to do this. To create a random burger generator, we are going to have to get, so we're going to have to have a get request to get all the burgers. And we can do this with fetch, as we learned previously. So let's go ahead and do that now. Once again, the syntax for fetch is this. So I'm just going to copy paste it. We are fetching. So I'm just going to fetch this URL. Not doing much with it. I'm simply getting all the information that we saw in our browser. So each of the objects so we can work with it. So if I make this a little bit bigger. We have, once again, the name, the restaurant of where we can find the burger, the website, the description, the ingredients as an array, and addresses, which is an array of objects. This one only has one object. Okay, so we've got that information now, but how do we actually use this for our UI? Well, so we get the response and then we get the data. Only once we have the data, then we can use what we have. So I'm just gonna simply get the name. So I'm gonna get the name. 
So I need to go into the data. So this is our data. I need to go into it and get the first object. So zero. I'm just going to get the first one for now so we can see what we are doing and get the name. So if I console log name, well, we will indeed see the trivia burger. So to start things off, let's just work with that. I'm just going to store it up here. So I'm going to get the element up here. So let's do that here. Const beer display equals and then document. Let's use query selector to find the name. So the div with the class of name, the so class, we need a dot. So once we have that, let's actually get our beer display and with inner HTML, assign it the name. So there we go. We have a tribute burger. Just going to style this up a little bit, maybe give it some padding. Let's say 30 pixels. The height. Okay, so that is looking good. Um, let's make the width 370. Okay. Okay, well, I'm happy for that. That's that's fine for now. Actually, maybe let's make it 30 and then zero pixels on the side and change that back to 400. It's up to you. I'm just being a bit pedantic. Okay, so we have a burger. However, it's not random. It's not really a random burger. Well, we know how to make things random. But for this, we need to actually do something to our button. So let's go ahead and grab the button, store it as button, and use document query selector. And I'm actually looking for a div with the class of button, not the button itself. As you can see here, it's a class of button. And then I'm actually going to write a function that says get data and put all of this in my function, okay? So that at the moment nothing happens, but only if I click the button, then we get a burger and the button. So we need to grab the button and use an event listener. So we're really using everything that we have learned so far. And in it, I pass through a click and the function of get data because as a reminder the add event listener works on a target we pass through an event and the function that we want to invoke if the event is triggered so now if i click the button well i get a burger however it's still not random so let's do that up here well to get a random number so const random number we know that we need to use math random and let's multiply it by the data length. So by however many bugs we have in our data, because it is an array. So we can use the length property on it. So now we're getting a random number. Cost random. We need to make sure this is an integer. So we can pass it back through to our array. And I will do this using math floor and passing through our random number. Okay, so we've got a random integer, great. And what do we do with it? Well, let's pass it through here. So now, if I click here, let's refresh that, we are getting a random burger each time. This is fantastic. I'm really pleased with how this has worked. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. I'm really pleased with how everything came together. So we're using everything we've learned about this. We've learned about fetching. We've learned about getting random numbers. And we learned about getting in a HTML. And we've learned about event listeners. So this was a really good project. I'm really happy that we can use it in order to build a random burger generator. Okay, let's carry on. For those of you who want to make a note of this, please feel free. Here's the style sheet. All I have is a body, a name, 
and a button with some styling for the button. And of course, the index HTML file, which simply has a name and a button, and they're all in a div as well to make them styled out like this. So that is it. Cool. Also, don't forget about your folder structure. That will be important if you want to pick out the JavaScript and the style sheet. So if something is not working, it might be due to that. Are we ready to move on? Let's do it. Next up, I'm going to show you how to make a post request. What I mean by post request is this. So just like we were able to get data, we are able to post data to an API. So for example, here, let's have a look at my burger API again. I can essentially send data to here in order to add another burger object. Okay, so because this is a very low security one, I shouldn't have any errors. So let's do it. In order to make a post request, we need the following syntax. So here we go. Let's talk through this a little bit first. This is just the basic syntax for making a post request to a URL. So first off, we start with the same fetch and we open up our parentheses and pass through a URL. So this time we are not just passing through a URL like we did last time. We are passing through two things, the URL and this object right here. Okay, so that is essentially the same syntax. We're just passing through a chunky object with our URL too. So two arguments. And then once again, we are catching the response and then the data. I've also made a little success message here to know that our data has been successful. So we'll get the data along with the success message. Or if there has been an error, we can catch the error and we will be able to see that in our console log. So I'll show you both of these. I also have the method of post. So I am telling our fetch API that I want to post this data. I don't want to get it. I want to post it to the URL, the URL that we're going to specify here. And I've just put in some headers as well. So this is just the syntax. We are essentially just passing through the content type as a header and the content type is application JSON. Okay. So we're just passing through this header along with the method of post. Then for the body, so once again, we are not only passing through the URL as an argument, we're passing through this object, which has a method of post, a header and a body. And the body is whatever we tell it to be. So this is just like a template. I just have a username example. So if we post this to a URL, we're essentially posting this data, this object that has user and example. Okay. I think the best way to do this is show you by doing. So I'm going to use my burger API again. So here we have the burger API. Here you will see the last object, which is the Barbie burger. It's got ID 28. I'm essentially going to copy this object as I want to copy the format used for this API. So I've copied the entire thing. Now, instead of this template data object, I'm just going to pass that through and paste it. Now, I'm just going to format that a little bit so it looks a bit nicer. I'll leave that up here so you can see how that looks. The description's a bit long, but don't worry about it. That is our data object, the entire thing. Now, let's create a new burger. So I'm just going to go data ID 29. Let's call it... Arby's Burger Restaurant Arby's Web Address Arby's.com Description A Delicious Burger from Heaven Ingredients have a bun let's have cheese let's have a beef patty let's 
have some lettuce, tomato, tomato, and mayo is fine. And address, well, let's make this up. ID zero, great, 24, Barbie Lane, Barbie Town. There we go. And then RB Land. Okay, so that is our fake burger. That is essentially our data object that we want to post to the URL here. So because we want to post to the burger API, now we need to make sure that we actually get the correct address. So copy that. And I'm simply going to put it here. Okay, so hold on, I'm just going to cut this out. So you've already seen we've posted it. I actually wanted to post, okay, fine, let's just put that in. I wanted to do that on the press of a button, but as you can see here, we've already posted it. So there we go. You will see we get a success message. So that is our success message along with the data that we posted. So here we go. That is what we posted is essentially exactly what we wrote in our example data object. So if I get the ingredients out, it's the new ones and the address that we made up. And there we go. We have posted our burger. But this is not where we finish. I just want to make sure that everything worked correctly. So now let's go back to that URL. If I refresh the page and go to the bottom, you will see the Arby's burger. Immediately, we have made a post request and it was successful. Okay, and that is it. We have made a post request. It has worked perfectly. Everything is fine. We have now covered how to get data, but also how to post data. So we have really made some progress. This is looking great. I just have two more to show you before we carry on. So next up, I want to talk to you about a put request. A put request essentially allows you to edit a object. Okay, that is an explanation in a very basic way. We can use it to update any resource that we have. It is considered to be one of the most common HTTP methods for retrieving and sending data to a server. So once again, let's get the syntax up. So there we go. We don't have any data yet. I'm going to make the method as put this time. Once again, we have the fetch API and we need to pass through a URL and an object that will contain the method, the header and the body of what we want to alter. So let's go ahead and do this. So once again, we need the data as an object. Don't forget, this is just the normal syntax. I'm actually going to put it in a function this time. So function edit data. OK, just so we can invoke it whenever we want. So method put headers body. We are getting the data, so data up here. And we are passing it through to the body. And then we get a success message or an error message if it has failed. Okay, so the data. Well, the first thing that I need to do is decide what object I want to edit. So let's do that now. Let's go back into my burger API or my fake burger API. And then let's say I want to edit the third item. So I would need the third burger. So I would simply put a forward slash three. And now I could view the good burger as a standalone object. So this is the URL I need if I wanted to edit the good burger. Let's go back to our project. I'm going to put it in here. Make sure it's a string, otherwise this will not work. And with the put method, I essentially need to take 
So I'm going to take the burger as it is exactly, copy it, and then paste this, format it, and now I can edit it. So let's just change, I don't know, let's say that this number is incorrect and put one, two, three. So now we've changed that data. We want to override the data that we have. And we can do this by essentially making a put request to the specific route to that burger. So if we're ready, I'm going to just call the function, click save and success. You will see that now in the addresses, I have changed the number from 000 to one two three let's just have a look here for good measure refresh and indeed the number has changed to one two three amazing let's carry on okay i'm going to delete this for now so we've done put requests we've done get requests we've done post requests I have one more to show you, and that is the delete request. And you guessed it, it can delete a whole object. So let's do that now. Let's say I want to delete the very last bugger from our fake API. So I would go in here, let's have a look at it again, scroll all the way down. Well, it's the Arby's burger. It's the burger with ID 29. So to do this, I would simply use fetch and then the URL. So the URL that we had last time as a string. And I would need to pass through the ID. So the ID 29, as that was the burger, the Arby's burger. And then I would simply just pass through the method of delete. Now this is in its very simplified form. Let's see if that has worked. So now refresh, go scroll down. And that has indeed worked. We have deleted the 29th burger. Now we don't really see anything because I didn't tell it to console log anything. If I wanted to see uh, what was returned, I would once again have to have a response uh, and so on and so on. But I didn't, I didn't do this for now. I just wanted to show you the delete method in its basic form. If I wanted to, however, I could have attached this as before in which we would get a success message. So let's try to delete another burger, 28. Okay, so that shows as a success. We don't get a result back because there's nothing to give back. We've just deleted something, so it's an empty object. But if we have a look here and refresh, burger 28 is now gone. So that is great. We essentially don't need all of this. We could just have console log success or console log error. We probably do need the error message. So there we go. Okay, so I'm just gonna get rid of that now and keep it in its most basic form. That is it. We have covered the top four most popular HTTP requests. I hope you've enjoyed this. I really enjoyed uh, showing you these. They're really fun. And once you get to grips with them, the world is your oyster in terms of working with APIs. So I'm glad I can show you. I do have a few projects for you on my channel. So I'm going to hook you up with a few if you choose to look at them now. If not, then please do carry on. I have a lot more to teach you. For those of you who are interested in how I made my RESTful API imitation in a super simple way, I have just the video for you. In this video, I show you how to make your own API in just a few simple steps. It is a bit more on the advanced side, but if you would like to have a look or are just curious, please do look at this YouTube card right here, so up there. Otherwise, please save it for another time and let's carry on. 
Okay, in this section, I'm going to show you how to put your project, so the game of memory game that we built on our local code editor, onto GitHub, so it can be viewed by others online. Let's do it. GitHub is a subsidiary of Microsoft which provides hosting for software developers and version control using Git. It offers the distributed version control and source code management functionality of Git plus its own features. Don't worry if that doesn't mean anything for now. I'm going to show you some functionality of GitHub as we go on. So first off, you need to know this is a free service and is essentially is just a way for you to showcase your projects. So go ahead and sign up. Once you have signed up, you should see a dashboard that looks like this. So this is my own personal GitHub page. You will see all my repositories as well as all my contributions in the last year. A contribution is simply me making a Git commit. Once again, don't worry if that doesn't mean anything to you. It's just a word that you should get used to hearing and that you will learn along the way. So now let's say I want to add my memory game to my repositories right here. So I would simply click repositories new and then right here I'm going to create a new repository so I'm going to call this memory game I already have one memory game in here so let's call it 2021 description simple game made in javascript html and css now I'm going to choose to make this repository public so that anyone can see it. But if you'd rather keep it private, please click the private button right there. And next, I'm going to initialize this repository with a readme file. This is essentially where you can write a description of your project so that others can see it. I'm going to show you what I mean. Okay, so by creating this, we are creating a main branch. This is the default name of the branch. I'm going to click Create Repository. OK, so we've created our repository. At the moment, our repository only has one file, and that is the readme file that we clicked to initialize, along with this template text that we gave it. So to edit this readme, I can simply click here and type away. If you want to know some formatting tricks, I suggest looking at markup for readmes. So for example, this is a H1 tag, if you will. If I want to make a smaller one, I am a smaller title and so on. And I'm just going to commit this to the main branch. So commit. So I've now committed that and you will see my file has now changed. I have that I am a smaller title that I wrote. Okay, so this is great, but how do we actually get to adding our memory game in here? Well, I'm gonna show you a super simple way of doing it that doesn't involve the terminal, and that would simply involve me clicking on the repo itself or repository and adding files. So I'm gonna to choose to upload files, and now I'm just gonna drag my files in here. So let's go to where we saved our memory game on our personal computers. For me, it would be in my personal projects and I saved it right here. So I would click into the folder and copy all of this. So the index.html file as well as the source file that has my index.js and style CSS file. I'm going to copy all of that and simply just drop it like so you will now see all my files being added so the index html file the style sheet all the images that are in the images folder and the index.js file for the javascript once again i'm going to commit these changes i can choose to change the name of this commit or i could just leave it as it is once again this will be committing directly to the main branch of our project commit and there we go we have now saved our project 
on to the internet for others to view our code. This is great. It's now publicly shared. Anyone can find it. Anyone can simply click in here to view our JavaScript. And this is essentially how you would submit code to potential employers or just share with your friends. Once again, this is a public repository. If you'd like to keep it private, so if you just like to share your code with one person or two people, you could easily do that too. Before sharing your code, I would suggest to really build out this readme. I think readmes are super important. Otherwise, someone's just going to get your folder and not really know how to open it. For example, you might want to say like download the file. So code, download it and then open it by opening the index.html file. All this information is super important. No one can, you know, no one's a mind reader. You need to really lay down the rules as to how you want your project to be opened. So for example, if I show you some of mine, let's go to my repository. I'm gonna show you a more complicated project I did which involves a lot of information as to how to start the app, okay? So there we go. That is how I would suggest writing a readme. Let's go back to our repository now. So once again, memory game 2021. Now, if I just wanted to share this with one or two people, I would have to change these settings on this. So I'd go to settings, I would scroll all the way down. I would change visibility to make private. So I would just have to type this out again. I'm gonna put in my password and This repository has now been changed to be private. I would then share this project with people so I can manage access and I can invite a collaborator. To do this, I can use the GitHub username or email. So that is another option too. If you just want to share your code with one other person or two other people, for example, if it is for an interview, this is the way that I would do it. Okay. So that's really it for this section. Uh, that was just a basic understanding of GitHub so you can get your games online. There is a lot more learning to do and I'm gonna leave you on some tips as to where you should go from here. Okay, so we are coming to the end of our course. In this course, we have built an understanding of HTML, CSS and JavaScript thanks to the lessons, exercises and projects along the way. However, you might be wondering, what's next? Well, I have a few suggestions for you. So where to go from here? The first thing I would suggest is getting more familiar with GitHub. Even though I did show you how to store your own project on GitHub, GitHub has a lot of other functionalities that you should be aware of. So that would be your best bet as to where to go next. Some features on GitHub include creating a profile, building out your network, and just storing more projects. I have a few tutorials on GitHub, that is how to make branches, how to make pull requests. Don't worry if all these words don't mean a lot at the moment. This is what your research into GitHub will help you with. Leading on to that, I'm going to talk about Terminal. Learning the terminal is the next piece of advice that I would give you as a next step. The terminal in layman terms will allow you to control projects and files and folders on your computer from a command line interface, as well as allow you to pull in packages, talk to GitHub and a lot more. Next up, I would suggest looking into libraries and frameworks. One of these is React. React is something that I like to work with every day as a developer in my professional setting. Learning React was a personal choice for me. If you'd rather look into mobile development, please do have a look at React Native 
or you can check out completely other libraries and frameworks such as Vue or Angular. There are so many on the internet. React just happens to be my personal choice. And next, I would suggest looking at Node.js. Once again, in a nutshell and in layman terms, Node.js will essentially allow you to build out backends, allow you to download packages and a lot of other really cool things in order to really build out your projects. I have a couple of Node.js videos on my channel, so please do check them out. Lastly, going back to our contact form section, I'm going to have a video coming out especially on this, so please do like and follow my channel if you want to learn how to do this. It will involve a library and scripting, so a little bit more advanced stuff than what we have learned today, but I hope you're excited to learn. And that is it. We are now finished our YouTube coding bootcamp. Congratulations if you have finished. I hope you now feel you have a good grasp on the fundamental of JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. You should also have a few good projects to put in your portfolio, as well as a clear direction of where you should go next, keep practicing and gaining more software developer skills. As mentioned, if there is an area that did not make a lot of sense, by all means, please go back and do that section again. That is exactly what the timestamps are there for in the description of my video. Once again, thank you so much for coding along with me. Please do like and subscribe to my channel. It really would mean a lot. I love creating more content and I'd love to create more content for you guys. So that would really help me out. Okay, thanks so much again, and I'll see you hopefully on my channel soon.